Eleven. Within a week, false summer had collapsed, and autumn returned with a vengeance. There were no more afternoons sitting in the garden for Lan, but Paul found plenty of things to occupy his time. A storm in the night blew most of the leaves away, and Paul began to look forward to the day when he could move Lavin to the Collegium. His own walks to and from healers were bleak and uncomfortable. Meanwhile, he tested Lan on a variety of subjects to figure out what classes he needed to take. One area surprised him. The boy knew the maps of Valdemar as thoroughly as any full herald, and how to dead reckon by the stars or sun equally well. All in all, Lavin Chitward was no farther behind or ahead than any other trainee his age. On a cold, gray, windy day, Paul helped his young trainee move into his room at Harold's Collegium. A carter had brought a box of Lan's personal gear the day before, a luxury many of the trainees never had. Lan was inclined to tire more quickly than he thought he should, largely because he attempted more than he was ready for, but the healers were confident that he was ready for the active regime of classes and training. A stack of new uniforms and other basic necessities waited for him in his new room, and Paul had walked him over to the Collegium the previous day. He and Paul met at the door to the gardens, and the two of them bent to the wind and plodded cheerfully enough to his new home. A ground-floor room had just fallen vacant, and Paul had quickly claimed it for Lan before anyone else did. The window opened onto a sheltered nook of the garden, so if it became necessary at any time, Kalira could even be temporarily housed there, right within reach. The view was somewhat restricted, but he didn't think that Lan would mind. In fact, Kalira watched them with great interest through the window as Paul introduced Lan to his new quarters, with the still-packed box in the middle of the room. It was very much an average room, depersonalized by the removal of the belongings of the previous occupant, who was now on her first circuit in company with an older, experienced mentor. A small but adequate fireplace in the center of the right wall held a cheerful, clean-burning fire of seasoned oak, protected behind a metal fire screen. The furnishings were entirely utilitarian, bed, desk, chair, bookcase, and wardrobe. The bed was tucked in beneath the window with a pile of trainee greys and linen piled atop it, the wardrobe and desk arranged on the left wall. The bookcase, which had done double duty for the previous trainee as a nightstand, was still next to the bed. Lan's class books were already in it and a candlestick atop it. There was one oil lamp on the mantel and a second on the desk. The walls themselves were whitewashed plaster, freshly whitewashed for the new tenant. White canvas curtains covered the window, and when pulled back, hid the shutters that could be closed against the worst storms, although in this sheltered corner it wasn't likely that Lan would ever use them. The youngster looked around and smiled slowly. I like this place, Harold Paul, Lan said. I like it better than my room in my parents' house. This one has a view. All I saw from my old room was the wall of the next house. Better than that, it's a view with trees in it. Good, I'm pleased to hear it, Paul replied. After learning just how well-to-do Lan's parents were, he'd been a bit apprehensive about the boy's reaction to what was a very small and unexceptional room. Some of the high-born trainees reacted poorly to being assigned to live in something that was the size of a closet by their normal standards. On the other hand, the largest houses in the well-off merchant's quarter were not likely to come vacant, which left a newly wealthy merchant the option of either taking a relatively smaller house in the fashionable district or building a bigger one in an unfashionable district where no one of any note would ever see it. His parents must have opted for the former. Your schedule is on the desk there, and a map of the Collegium. Paul nodded toward the small stack of notes resting on the surface. I've already given you the tour, so you know where everything is, and you'll start in your classes tomorrow. Don't hesitate to ask anyone you might meet for directions or help, and if you need me, you know where to find me. He wanted to encourage independence in the youngster, and the best way to do that was to leave him to his own devices before he developed any dependencies. He'll be fine, Saturan said. He's got my daughter, after all. 
Thank you, Harold Paul, Lan said, and offered another of his slow, careful smiles. He opened the door himself and waited politely for the herald to take himself out, a good sign that the trainee was ready to stand on his own feet, which was a very good thing since Paul had a class to teach. No matter what disaster transpired, no matter who descended on the collegium, the classes went on. When Paul closed the door behind him, Lan turned his attention back to organizing his new room, although with Kalira right outside it already felt more like home than the place he had inhabited since arriving in Haven. The one thing that he didn't have to put up with was his mother's hand at decoration. She wanted reds and yellows, relentlessly cheerful colors that irritated him rather than raising his spirits. He wasn't particularly neat by nature, but he didn't want to start things off with a bad impression, so he quickly stowed away all the clothing in the wardrobe, the towels on the wardrobe's shelf, and made the bed with the linens he found folded there. Virtually everything was spotless, but showed somewhere, and that was oddly comforting, suggesting that no one was treated with any more deference than anyone else here. Once the things on the bed were put away, he reflected, looking at the clothing hanging in his wardrobe that he was going to have a little difficulty getting used to wearing something other than faded black. At least it wasn't as grindingly cheerful as the things his mother tried to make him wear. And as a color, gray wasn't that bad, though he still couldn't get his mind wrapped around the notion of himself in pure white. The uniforms were comfortable, and the boots, so he'd discovered, were the one things that were made exactly to the measure of every trainee. Ill-fitting footwear was worse than none at all in the active life of Harold or Trainee, and boots were never handed down. He had one pair on his feet now and two more in various stages of construction in the cobbler's workshop. That left the still unpacked crate in the center of the room, which, by the weight, had been stuffed with far more than the few things he had requested. At least it won't be clothing, Kalira pointed out mischievously. No matter what they've sent you, even your mother won't dare send bardic or healer colors to a heraldic trainee. He untied the latch, reflecting that the sturdy wooden crate itself would be useful for storage, and threw the top back on its hinges. Huh, he said in surprise, examining the wealth of blankets and a down comforter that graced the top few layers. They were all brand new and thank the gods in reasonable muted earth colors, mostly shades of gray and gray-brown. But he hadn't been brought up in a cloth merchant's household without recognizing that these bedclothes were made of the very finest of materials. The comforter was stuffed with pure goose down and protected with a soft cover of wool plush. The blankets were woven of shira wool, patterned in wide stripes and checks. He wondered what had prompted such generosity, not that he was going to object. With a bed placed right underneath a window, the more warm coverings he had, the better. Still, he doubted that his parents indulged even themselves in such luxury. Such things were for the highborn and the astronomically wealthy. Granted, there was a great deal of profit figured into the prices of such luxuries, but that didn't make them cheap, even for a cloth merchant. Maybe they're trying to make up for not listening to me, he muttered to himself. A guilt offering? That's certainly possible, Calera agreed. In fact, I think that's probably the answer. They were not very apt at apologizing the other day. This may be their apology. At least it came in a useful form. He removed the bed coverings in heavy armloads and laid them on his plain, rough-woven linen coverlet, then tackled the next layer. Cushions, this time, three of them that fluffed up fat and soft and as luxurious as the blankets. Then a lighter bedspread of rami and linen, also new, probably for summer. Then at last the books and personal keepsakes he had asked for. After distributing these objects on desk, window ledge, and wardrobe top, he turned back to the box again. The one final layer proved to be rugs and small tapestries, geometric designs rather than pictures, something he recognized as weavings from the southwestern border. At first he laughed at the idea of putting things up on his walls, 
Wasn't that just like his mother to want to press things up for him? Wait now, look around a bit, Kalira cautioned. It looks like the inside of the room at Haler's. Are you sure you want all that white wall around you when it's nothing but snow outside? He considered that for a moment and reluctantly agreed that she was right. With the help of a hammer and a few nails, the tapestry did a lot to soften the hard whiteness of the walls, and the two rugs fit nicely by the side of the bed and in front of the hearth. When he was finally done, he broke into a surprised smile and a quiet laugh. Now this was more like it. Somehow, despite almost all of this being a gilt gift and brand new, it was closer to his real room in Alderscroft than he'd ever expected. His old room had been much like this, without any sign of his mother's meddling hand. The real difference was that there the bed coverings and things had been old and worn, commonplace, or scavenged from the attic, and the walls hadn't needed anything, since they were already hung with the old tapestries that had been there for generations. Makes me wish that I was human so I could curl up by your fire, Kalira chuckled. That's quite a cozy little nest you've built for yourself. Just then the bell for luncheon sounded, and he started a little at the sound. This wasn't a small handbell. It came from a bell tower on the roof and could be heard all over the collegia and palace and their grounds. And on that most opportune note, I'm going to go have a gallop and a bite. Shall I see you at the field after lunch? Kalira's casual tone did a great deal to offset the nervous lurch of his gut at the idea of lunch in a room full of strangers. After all, he didn't have very good memories of his last similar experience. Hesitantly, he left his room and stepped out into the hall. A steady stream of people ranging in age from around ten to at least eighteen, and about equally divided between males and females, were all heading in the direction of the dining room that Paul had shown him. They chattered away at the tops of their lungs quite cheerfully, a welcome contrast to the nervous demeanor of the students of his school. Hey, la, are you lavin? Someone called from behind him. He turned to see a boy his own age emerging from the room next to his. There could not be anyone more unlike his friend Owen. He was covered in freckles, with bright green eyes, hair of a carrot red, and a huge gap-toothed grin. His sturdy frame marked him as country-bred, and Lan felt an instant kinship with him. Lan nodded, and the boy clapped him on the back. Good to have you. I'm Tuck. I'm from a little village up north. You won't have heard of it. Lan felt an unaccustomed urge to smile as they joined the rest of the greys streaming towards their meal. Try me, he suggested archly. Briarly Crossing, Tuck began. Between Lower Devon and Endicott, just off the Nodding Hill Road, he interrupted and had the pleasure of seeing Tuck's jaw drop. I won't ask you how you know that, it'd spoil the fun. Want to sit with me and my mates? the boy asked, full of admiration. And would you mind sussing out where they come from if I ask? I can try, he said modestly, secretly pleased not only by Tuck's reaction, but by his invitation. They entered a room which was physically nearly identical to the merchant's school dining hall. But oh, what a difference in the contents of the room. The first thing that struck Lan was the noise, the babble of dozens and dozens of people freely chattering, well mixed with laughter. The second was the monochromatic austerity, a sea of gray interrupted here and there with small groups of white. Tuck led him over to a table with benches lining both sides, already crowded with other students. Shove over, then, he laughed good-naturedly, tapping two of his friends on their shoulders. This is Lavin. He's going to be eating with us. He's just arrived. With giggling and a little elbowing, the others made room for both of them, and one of them passed down plates, mugs, and eating utensils to the rest from stacks on the end of the table. A basket of bread followed by a dish of butter went up and down the table. A student came by and left pitchers of water and cider. A second followed with a huge bowl of stew. Both got shared out in an egalitarian, if somewhat random, fashion, while eating and talking went on simultaneously. 
A student came round at intervals with more bread and stew, offering more helpings to those who were still hungry. During a gap in the chatter, Tuck called out to a girl on the other side of the table. Hey, Philia, tell Lavin your village. He won't have heard of it, the thin, dark-haired girl protested. Tuck grinned. Just tell him. Forbay, she said with a shrug. On Lake Evendom, a little south of the midpoint, at the end of the Hollyton Road, he said instantly. Philia's mouth formed a little O of surprise, and everyone at the table clamored to see him perform. By the time the baked apples and cream came around, he had attracted the attention of the occupants of the tables on either side. He was greatly enjoying himself when the bell rang, sounding clearly over the chatter, warning them all that it was time for classes again. The rest of the trainees hurried off to their classes, except for the ones whose task it was to clear up after the rest. Although it was not strictly his job today, he decided to help, his spirits buoyed by his first encounter with his fellow trainees. Thanks, said one of the older girls, one of the ones who was probably about eighteen, as he handed her a stack of plates. She piled them into the hatch of the contrivance that took them down into the kitchen. You were with that scamp Tuck, weren't you? What were all of you chattering about over there? Tuck found out that I've got a pretty good chance of recognizing where a person's home is, he said honestly and modestly. It looks like a conjuring trick, I suppose, but it's only because I've got most of the trade routes memorized, at least in Valdemar proper. You do? That's better than we can do at your age, the girl said with surprise. Are you that youngling from a merchant family that was in the fire in Haven? He nodded and she tilted her head to one side. I wondered what it was they could be studying in that school of theirs. Trade routes, hmm? And accounting, and currency conversions, and... Enough, she laughed, holding up her hands in surrender. Obviously, there's a lot more to being a merchant than I thought. Forgive me for my uncharitable assumptions. He laughed and went back for another stack of plates. When the dishes were cleared away, he nipped back to his room for his cloak. It was far too cold to venture out without it today. This was going to be his final day of freedom from classes, and he intended to make the most of it. Out the door he went, wrapping his cloak closely around himself, heading across the gardens to the fence that separated Companion's Field from the rest of the palace grounds. Kalira waited there, the river between her and the largest portion of the field. It's about time, she teased. You're spending too much time with other women. I'm going to get jealous. If you think you'd be of any use cleaning up after a meal, you're welcome to join me, he retorted. The only thing I can think of is to use your tail to dry dishes. Oh, what a vile idea. I'll meet you in the stables instead. She trotted into the long building that housed the companions in bad weather and cold nights. He sped up to enter the door on his own side. She had already found a stable hand, or he had found her. The two were standing side by side, waiting for him next to a stall with her name over it, and her tack hung and draped on its sides. Training ride or pleasure? The stable boy asked, reaching for one of the bitless bridles that companions used. Pleasure ride, Lan replied, wondering why he had asked. Ah. Uh, Actually, it's my first ride with her. The stable boy turned back to look questioningly at him. You didn't arrive here with her then? Done any riding at all before this? A lot, actually. Lan wondered why all the questions. I used to have my own hunter. Ah, then, that'll be good. The stable boy grinned and took down not a saddle, but a light pad with a belly band hardly more than a couple of layers of cloth cut in the shape of a small saddle. He threw this up over Kalira's back and pulled the girth tight. Do you need a leg up, or can you hop up yourself? Is that a bareback pad? He asked Kalira, not wanting to ask the stable boy. It is, and you'll like this, she replied. He'd heard of bareback pads, but he'd never seen one used either by the most excellent of riders or the most exquisitely trained horses or both the pads were a more secure form of bareback riding than doing so with only a blanket as the wild shinain were said to do
There was just enough material between the rider and the horse to avoid chafing the skin of either. I think he wanted to say that he could mount without help, but a sardonic glance from Kalira made him change his mind. I think I'd better get a leg up, he admitted sheepishly. The stable boy cupped his hands and braced himself to take Lan's weight without comment. Lan put his left foot in the hand and tried to put as little of his weight on it for the shortest time he could manage, quickly swinging his right leg over Kalira's back and settling onto the pad. Them reins is mostly to give you something to grab to and balance with, the boy reminded him with a wave. Have a good ride. Kalira walked out of the stable sedately enough, but once out in the open she broke into a brisk canter. Lan found himself moving with her rhythm within a few paces, and was swept up in the most incredible surge of joy he had ever experienced in his life. She trumpeted a neigh and moved into a full gallop. The wind caught Lan's cloak and blew it out behind him, but he was too exhilarated to be cold. They pounded across one of the bridges, Kalira's hooves making a sound like bells on the hard surface, then out into the wooded expanse of Companion's Field itself. She took him on a whirlwind ride around the perimeter, up the river to the wall surrounding the entire complex, then along the wall marking the perimeter. Lan had never gone so fast in his entire life, and Kalira's pace was so smooth he would never have believed she was galloping. The wall curved in and out, not following any sort of straight line. Trees interrupted by meadows flew by. They rode up and down gentle hills and twice leaped a meandering stream. Lan had always understood that Companion's Field was big, but it was enormous. Without warning, they were at the river again, downstream from where they had left it. Now Kalira slowed down to a trot. Even her trot was smooth and easy to sit. They trotted along the river for a bit, then Kalira cut away from the stream and walked into the thick trees. How long can you run like that? He asked her, amazed that she was not even sweating. Candle marks, she told him matter-of-factly. A day and a night, more if I have to, but I need a good feed and a long rest after. He blinked. He had never owned or ridden a horse that could keep up a gallop for one candle mark, let alone for a day and a night. But we aren't horses, she reminded him gently. We only look like horses. I think I'm beginning to understand that. They moved deeper into the trees. A thick blanket of leaves rustled and crackled under her hooves. He thought he caught a glimpse of something ahead. Was it a building? It used to be, she answered his unvoiced thoughts. I'm taking you to see the bell tower and the chapel ruins in the grove. The grove, he shivered, both in anticipation and with the kind of thrill he got when he was in a place where ghosts were said to walk. Surely if there was any place in the grounds that was haunted, it would be here. Harolds and companions have better things to do than to sit around spooking youngsters when we don't need our bodies anymore. Kalira laughed at him. Why drift about like a bit of mist when you have a much nicer place to go? Well, what about people who aren't heralds or companions? He asked. Haven't there been enough people who have died here to make the place haunted? Not, I think, while we have anything to say about it. This is our place, you know. This was a new mind voice, a very masculine one, and Lan saw another companion waiting to greet them beside the ruins of an old chapel. This was a stallion, no larger than any of the others, but somehow he gave an impression of being larger and more imposing. He was beautifully turned out, every strand of mane and tail braided, his coat brushed until it shone with the silver gleam of moonlight, hooves polished to the patina of old silver. This is Roland, Kalira told him, with a nod of respect to the stallion. He's the king's own companion. He wanted to see you for himself. Yes, and with your permission. I should like to examine you as well, young trainee.
Roland told him gravely, with a slow swish of his braided tail. I mean no disrespect to you or to Kalira, but I wish to be able to assure my chosen, and thus every herald in the circle, that your power, though dangerous, is under control. He sighed a little bitterly. Even if the control isn't mine. That is hardly your fault, the stallion replied instantly. Your gift was forced to ripeness in order to defend itself and you. In a better world, you would have felt it slowly, slowly stir. In four or five moons, as you began to feel that something odd was happening to you, Kalira would have come for you, and you would have had your gift come upon you here, and after Paul had identified what it was. Roland sighed dustily, and Kalira echoed him, her flanks heaving under Lan's legs. It is not a better world, and we must deal with things as they are. May I? Belatedly, Lan realized that Roland was waiting for his answer. He could say no, but why should he? Actually, he felt rather better about the companion rummaging around in his head than some strange herald. And at least Roland had asked permission first. Go ahead, he replied. He didn't know what to expect. What happened was the oddest sensation of having someone actually in his head with him, taking control of what he was thinking. He was whisked along at blinding speed through his own thoughts and memories. He didn't even have time to identify what they were before being flown through the next. It happened so quickly that before he had quite grasped what was happening, it was over. He shook his head dizzily. Clutching Kalira's mane, the world trying to spin with him as the center. My apologies, Roland said, as his head steadied and the grove stopped rotating. Some effects are unavoidable. Thank you. You have allowed me to confirm Kalira's judgment and choice. That can only be good for all of us. I hope so, he sighed. I really hope so. Unexpectedly, Roland took a pace forward and briefly touched Lan's leg with his nose. It is hard having to prove yourself over and over, I know, the companion said sympathetically. Please remember, when this happens so often you are sick of it, you will never have to prove yourself to us. Come to the grove or the stables and you will be surrounded by no one but friends. Lan looked down into Roland's eyes, a much deeper sapphire than Kalira's sky blue, and was moved for a moment almost to tears by the companion's extraordinary promise. Thank you, he said softly aloud. I will. He hadn't noticed another person had entered the grove until a severe-looking raven-haired man actually walked up and placed his hand on Roland's shoulder. Let's hope Roland never has to make good on that promise, the herald said, his lips slowly curving into a smile. If I have my way about it, he never will. He held out his hand to Lan, who accepted it. The herald's grip was firm without being intimidating. I'm Jedin, and I'm pleased to meet you in person, Lavin. It broke on Lan at that moment that the man who was shaking his hand was the king's own herald, the third most important person in the entire kingdom. No wonder he looked as if that severe expression was habitual. I, the, the honor is mine, sir, he stammered out. Jedin's smile widened. Not that much of an honor, I assure you. Plenty of people will tell you that they'd much prefer to see rather less of me than more. Did you realize that along with one rare gift, you have a second? Lan shook his head, unable to think of anything that would pass for a gift. You have the ability to inspire companions, to not only trust you, but to leap to your defense without ever actually meeting you themselves. Jedin raised one eyebrow. 
I wish I knew why. But there you have it. Kalira looked innocent, Roland enigmatic. Lan could only shrug helplessly. I don't know, sir, he said as honestly as he could. It doesn't make any sense to me. Hmm. There was a look in Jedin's eyes that made Lan want to squirm, a look that suggested that even though Lan didn't know any reason why the companions should offer their friendship and defense, Jedin could think of one or two. Well, you'll have some learning to do before we find out anyway, Jedin said after a pause. And we too have some exercising to do, if we aren't to get fat and ugly. He slapped Roland on the shoulder, and the companion neighed laughter. Too late, Roland taunted, as Jedin put both hands on Roland's back and vaulted into place without having to use anything to help him. You're already ugly. Without waiting to hear Jedin's reply, the companion cantered off under the trees. Were we supposed to hear that? Lan asked aloud, a little aghast. We aren't horses, but we aren't some sort of heavenly creatures either, my love. Kalira told him, moving out of the grove in a slightly different direction. We're a lot like our heralds. It seemed that every passing candle mark brought another surprise or revelation, a breaking of one assumption, the bending of another. He wondered if he'd ever get used to it, or would things settle down as he began to learn what life as a herald would really be like, past the tales and the blaze of silver and white uniforms, the dazzle of companions. You aren't the only case of bad timing right now. Kalira went on as they came out of the trees and within sight of the stables. Just the more serious of the two. Lada is in fall and had to go after her chosen with less than two moons to go. Poor things. Lada is probably going to drop tonight, and Renlet hasn't been here more than a fortnight. They're both going to have a bad night, I think. The stable has fireplaces, but it's drafty, and Lada's a bit on the small side. They'll be up all night at the least. Is Lada's chosen going to wait out the night with her? he asked, all sympathy, for he had once taken full watch on one of his ponies. Oh, yes, how could she not? That's a good point. He remembered how he'd felt about it, nervous, anxious, excited, and afraid, and that had just been a pony. He couldn't imagine how wrought up he'd be if it was Kalira who was going to drop a foal. He'd be worse than any anxious father in a joke. Well, you won't have to worry about that with me. I never saw a stallion worth going through that for, Kalira said lightly, easing the sudden surge of anxiety the thought provoked. Now, if you were a stallion, I might consider it but not for anyone else in the heart. He blushed, pleased and embarrassed, but not sure why. Not even Roland, he ventured. Not even Roland, she replied firmly. He felt absurdly pleased by that, though he had no idea why he should be, and he held that feeling close inside to keep him warm as he walked through the chilling wind back to the Collegium. Twelve. Lan passed an old account book back to his teacher, who waved it at the class and addressed them all. Now, presented with this set of accounts and the story I've told you, what sort of judgment would you make? All of the clues you need are there. This was Harold Artero's class, one called Field Investigations. Other than the ability to read and write, this class had no special requirements, but it was one that every trainee had to take. Here, students were presented with stories and sometimes evidence connected with cases that other heralds had dealt with while on their circuits and asked for their own conclusions. As often as not, a herald on circuit would spend a great deal of his or her time being investigator, jury, and judge. Even if a local judge had already made a decision, any case could be appealed to a herald. The easy cases were those whose intricacies could be solved by application of the famous truth spell to one or more of the plaintiffs or defendants. This class did not concern those. 
This class was about cases where evidence had to speak for itself, because either some of the witnesses were dead or fled, or it was something where there were no witnesses at all. Mostly the cases were trivial enough, a dispute over a boundary or ownership of land or property. Sometimes, though, a life could hang in the balance. And sometimes it wasn't life but honor, which some would hold more precious than their lives. This time the question concerned a curious case. A merchant had died, and his grown son had accused his stepmother of appropriating money that, according to the accounts, should have been there in his cash boxes. The truth spell had revealed that the stepmother was not guilty of helping herself to the money stowed in the cash boxes, but where had the money gone? Suspicion was rife in the village by the time the herald arrived. Although people had refrained from making actual accusations, all the tension had poisoned relationships throughout the area. The trainees knew all of this and that a solution to the puzzle had been found. Their teacher had given them a great deal of background and the last bit of physical evidence. The account books. The account books were passed from hand to hand, and each of the four students had a chance to examine them carefully. Lan had noted something awry, and he wondered if any of the others had. I checked the edition, and he hadn't made any mistakes there, said Tuck, scratching his head. That was the first thing that I thought of, that he'd just been bad at arithmetic. Anyone else? Artero was physically very like an older version of Tyron, which had rather put Lan off at first, but his personality could not possibly have been more different. Artero never sneered, never was anything other than intense and earnest. When he was excited about what he was teaching, his eyes positively glowed. Lavin, you took a long time over those pages. Did you see anything in them to give you a clue? Lan hesitated a moment, then reminded himself that the case was long over and presumably had been solved correctly. Nothing he said would make any trouble for anyone now. The addition was right. It was the numbers that were wrong, he said at last. No one dealing in small items like spices ever makes a bargain that ends in round numbers like that. And I think that some of those debits might have been too low, but I don't know enough about foodstuffs to tell for sure. The merchant in question had trafficked in spices and dried or preserved fruits. Not exactly Land's area of expertise. But he did recall vividly going with his mother to the market as a small child and her spirited bargaining over every clipped copper coin. Were the numbers altered in any way? ventured another trainee, a girl named Mona. Could someone besides the widow have taken the money? Or did someone alter the books to make trouble for the widow? No, to all three questions, and I have a set of altered books to show you some of the common ways in which documents can be changed, and how you can tell, but we'll get to that in a moment. Artero smiled at Lan encouragingly. Now I'll draw on our newest students' experiences with merchants and traders, and ask Lavin if he can think of a possible scenario that would suit the evidence. Lan thought very hard, and something else popped up in his memory. The widow, who had been as sharp as she was pretty, was a merchant herself, crafting jewelry in silver and gems, and as such had been meticulous in making certain that she was not wedding into a failing business. It had taken her elderly suitor a long time to persuade her that her own earnings would not be used to support his trade. In fact, the match was as much a business transaction as a marriage, as was often the case among tradesmen and merchants. Surely she would have checked the books before signing the marriage contract. On the other hand, much to the son's anger, the spice merchant had been totally besotted with his much younger bride. He had been courting her for three years and had brought her to the marriage after many gifts, assiduous attention, and many sincere love letters. They hadn't been married more than a couple of months when the old man died. The son had even accused the widow of murdering his father for the inheritance until it transpired that the old man's will made him the heir to the lion's share of the ready cash and his wife the heir to the house and goods. Neither house nor goods would have been of any use at all to the son. The dead man probably had two sets of books, 
this one on paper, and one either hidden or in his head, Lan said at last. The books we looked at were created to make his business look a lot more prosperous than it really was, so the girl he was courting would marry him. So the money wasn't missing. It was never there in the first place. The other trainees looked at him with surprise and some skepticism, but Arturo slowly nodded, his smile broadening. And why didn't our widow notice this in the first place? he asked. Because she's a jeweler. They always deal in round numbers, and the finished piece is always worth a whole lot more than the components. Now that he knew he was right, Lan was a great deal more certain of his answers. It's like a piece of tapestry. The colored thread is worth next to nothing compared to the finished piece. What you're paying for is the talent and ability of the artist who made it. A speculation occurred to him, and he went ahead and voiced it. She worked by herself, so her income was pretty irregular, I bet. Nothing until she finished a commission, then a lump sum. She would have been wanting a husband with a steady income, and she wouldn't have known what to look out for in his books, because they were nothing like hers. I bet all she did was check out the edition to make sure he wasn't a shoddy accountant. Arturo slowly stood up and bowed to Lan, who flushed with momentary pride. Very, very good, Lavin. That is exactly what happened. It took the herald in question a lot more time to ferret the answers out, but that is what finally came to light when he backtracked the suppliers and compared their accounts with the old man's. So the widow was exonerated, and the son had to go home disappointed in his inheritance, but at least certain that he was not cheated out of it. There was even a relatively happy ending. The village settled down, and everyone made up their differences. He turned to the other members of the class. Now you see why I say it is as important to know about the lives of those who come to us for a judgment as it is to know the bare facts of the case. He pulled a ledger out of his bookcase and laid it open in front of them with a smile. Now, here is an artificial set of account pages that have been altered. We've got a sample of every sort of alteration we've ever seen in here. I'll show you where and how they were altered. Lan leaned over the pages with as much eagerness as the rest. He had always known that figures and handwriting could be changed or forged, but he had never seen any examples. And some were truly ingenious. Arturo made it clear that they would be spending a great deal of time on these examples, and Lan was not at all averse to that. There was enough there to occupy him for the next couple of moons, not just the fortnight that Arturo promised. For the first time, classes were teaching him something interesting. Not all his classes, of course, and he wasn't doing any better than average in most of them, but at least they weren't an ordeal any more. When he had problems, if the herald in charge of the class didn't help him, one of the other trainees would, often volunteering to help him before he asked for it. He hadn't understood that until Tuck explained it to him. They weren't in competition for the best place and the teacher's accolades. They were supposed to cooperate. They got better marks for cooperating. In fact, in some classes, no one moved up until they could all move up together. We've got to work together. There just aren't enough of us to take care of all the problems, Tuck had said earnestly. You can't hold back something that another Harold needs to know just to make yourself look good. That only makes all the Harolds look bad. People have to know that one Harold is going to be able to do just as good a job as another, or they won't trust us. This was one of those classes in which all the participants moved up as a group, and Lan loved it. He learned such fascinating things in it, not only from Harold Artero, but from the other trainees. When the class was over, Tuck intercepted him on the way to the kitchen. He was one of the servers at lunch, and servers got to eat early. Are you spending midwinter with your family? Tuck asked. Or were you going to be here? Lan already knew the answer to that question, and he had mixed feelings about it. On the one hand, he really hadn't been looking forward to spending the holiday with his family. The times that they had come to visit had been very awkward and uncomfortable. None of them had known how to treat him. It almost seemed as if they were afraid of him at times. 
On the other hand, when the message had come that they were going to be hosting so many relatives that they wanted him only to come for midwinter feast so they could put his granny up in his old room, he'd been rather unhappy about it. He didn't much relish the idea of languishing around the empty collegium for a fortnight with nothing to do and no company. Mother said they've got a mob of relations coming, and so I said I'd stay here and just go into town for the feast, he said, but he could not manage to stifle a little sigh. But Tuck's reaction was a surprise. Fantastic, he enthused. You can come home with me. My folks asked if you would, and they have a farm outside the city. You can stay with us, and Calera can take you in for the family feast in style. Fancy tack, bridal bells, and all. He faltered for a moment at the blank look on Lan's face. If you want, that is. That would be terrific, Lan replied, shaking off his surprise and gratifying his friend with his own enthusiasm for the plan. Tuck's parents had come in to see their son twice as often as his own, and he'd been invited along for a dinner at one of the taverns a time or two. He liked them, and apparently, they liked him as well. It's a done deal, then. Tuck slapped Lan on the back and sent him on his way. I'll send a note to tell them you're coming. The midwinter holiday was only a few days away, and now that he had something to look forward to, Lan was a good deal happier about that than he had been. He hurried off to the kitchen with a smile on his face. He was smiling a lot more these days than he had since he had arrived in Haven. The trainees took many of the chores of the collegium in turn, depending on the abilities of the trainee in question. All of them had to learn things like camp cooking, mending, and leather work. Out on circuit, they might be away from a resupply station for weeks and they weren't permitted to take hospitality from anyone on their circuit except the occasional healer's house or temple. But there was also no point in forcing their fellow trainees to live with poorly sewn uniforms or indifferent food either. Those who were no good at mending or cooking therefore got the cleaning chores and other things, like waiting on tables. Lan was actually rather good at waiting on tables. Unlike some, he'd gotten his full growth already, so he wasn't suffering from adolescent clumsiness. He erred on the side of caution, preferring to make more trips with less food rather than load himself down and risk disaster. As a consequence, he generally got the chore two meals out of every three, and the only one that was a burden was breakfast. Having to get up, get ready, get his room tidied, and get down to the kitchen a full hour before everyone else was pretty horrid. On the other hand, since servers did eat first, he and the others did get their pick of the piping hot bread, the occasional pastries, and other breakfast dishes on offer that morning. So that part wasn't at all horrid. The luncheon fare at the merchant's school had never varied. Rather stringy beef cooked until it fell apart in an attempt to tenderize it, bread and butter, mashed turnips, gravy, peas, and small ale. No two luncheons were the same here at the Collegium, and Lan sniffed experimentally as he neared the kitchen. Fried fish. Lan loved the way the Collegium cook made it, battered and fried in a cauldron of hot oil. Lake Evendim style, they called it, and there were usually other things fried up in the same oil to go with it. Squares of dough fried until they puffed up like pillows that were sugared or eaten with honey. Balls of a different sort of batter, spiced and savory, strips of vegetables battered like the fish. He'd never had any of those things before he arrived here, and he was already addicted. It was a good thing that Cook didn't have a fry day often, or he would have wound up as fat as one of those dough pillows in no time. He arrived at the kitchen just in time to get a plateful of his favorites, leavened with a bowl of stewed greens to keep from overdoing it on the fried stuff. He sat down with the rest of the helpers and servers at the crowded kitchen table and gave himself over to enjoyment. On a fry day, the helpers had to take turns eating, since the fried foods didn't keep well and tended to turn tough and nasty when cold. Although everything else could be and was prepared in advance, the actual frying had to be done fresh, with the platters being filled and carried off immediately. The aroma wafted through the collegium, and most people were as enthusiastic about the rare treat as Lan, so the dining hall filled quickly.
Lan was one of the first of the servers to be finished, so as soon as he washed off his sugar-sticky fingers at the pump, he got a platter, waited for someone to fill it, and hurried it out to the hungry trainees. Platter after hot platter went out and came back empty. Once or twice, Lan paused long enough to fill up a forgotten corner with another sugared pillow, and then dove back into the fray. Everyone seemed to eat twice as much on these occasions. It might have been Lan's imagination, but he didn't think so. He wasn't the only person who was addicted to Cook's special fry-ups. At last, when the greediest of the lot was stuffed full and contentedly trailing out of the dining hall, the servers got to collapse, fortify themselves with the leftover bits of dough and batter fried up and eaten with a sharp sauce or honey according to taste, wash their hands, and hustle off to a class or to a free period, leaving the kitchen to those who were assigned to clean up. Lan had a free period. Study was impossible after being so stuffed, so he usually went for a walk out to the training field and the sal instead. Since his next class was with the weapons master, he had to walk off his lethargy. The last thing he wanted to do was give the weapons master an excuse to make him an example. Not that the weapons master was cruel or sadistic. On the contrary, he was an incredibly kind man. And he would tell you, sincerely and sometimes with genuine distress, that in order to save your life at some later date, he had to make it miserable now. No one ever doubted him. If they had, the number of full heralds who returned to thank him in person after their first circuits, bubbling over with gratitude for the weapons master's gentle, implacable drive to perfection, would have convinced even the most skeptical. Nothing was or ever could be good enough for weapons master Odo. An oddly proportioned fellow, muscular in the legs and shoulders, back and arms, but so narrow at the waist and hips that he looked like a caricature of a man. Odo had been in the guard before being chosen, and he had been the weapons master there, too, so he was often found teaching certain of the guard some of the specialized skills he had acquired over the years, including mastery of particular techniques and odd weapons. Snow lay about ankle-deep on the ground, but the paths were pounded hard and sanded for good footing. Snow wouldn't stop Harold Odo from having his pupils work outside. If anyone objected, he would point out patiently that when they were on their circuits, attackers wouldn't wait politely until they were under the shelter of a roof before assaulting them. His logic was impeccable, and most new trainees didn't bother trying to change his training plan for the day after the first few fruitless protests. Out early? Kalira asked when he reached the training field. He squinted against the glare of the sun on snow and looked around. She was nowhere to be seen, but a white companion in the distance wasn't exactly visible against the snow. The sky didn't hold a cloud that was bigger than his hand today and the packed snow reflected as much light as the sky held. Trees were inky sketches against the blue, still and stark. There wasn't a breath of breeze, and his own breath puffed out in frosty puffs to vanish in the still air. I need to walk off my greed, he told her with a chuckle. I don't want Odo to get any more advantages than he's already got. I'll come keep you company. Off in the distance, a flock of crows rose from one of the trees in Companion's Field, calling derision as they flapped away toward the palace. After a moment of walking, with the hard-packed snow creaking under each step, he heard the distant sound of hooves on snow, and turned to wave at her. She came on at a trot, tail flagged, ears up, she looked wonderful with the sun shining on her satin coat, just like an image in an illuminated manuscript. Every movement was achingly graceful, smooth as a trained dancer. Not even Roland was as lovely as she was, with the blaze of the sun full on her and her mane and tail streaming behind banners of whitest silk. Why, thank you for the compliments. That was quite poetic, dearest. You're very welcome, gorgeous, he replied in high good humor. He tucked his hands under his armpits to warm them. He didn't want to touch her with cold hands. 
Oh my, keep saying sweet things like that, and I'll make sure to stick around you. She had reached him by then and nuzzled his cheek, blowing her sweet breath into his hair. Her breath was warm, a soft caress against his cheek, and he reached up to caress her velvety nose. Now, am I correct in thinking our plans for midwinter have been changed, thanks to Took? He reached farther up with his gloved hands and scratched the places behind her ears she could never get at. She sighed and rested her chin on his shoulder, closing her eyes in bliss. Tuck's parents invited me to stay with them on their farm. We can go in for the midwinter night feast. It's close enough to Haven, Tuck says. Well, I suppose it would have to be, as often as they come visit him. Delightful. Dasserie and I get along splendidly. We'll have a fine time, too, just us girls together being spoiled by Tuck's sibs. I think I can tolerate my mane and tail braided and fussed with three or four times a day. There was no doubt that Kalira was as happy with this plan as Lan was. Since Tuck spent back and forth to the farm several times, his parents will know how to house us. Which, sadly, is more than I can say for my parents, he grumbled. They haven't even asked about you. I don't think they're even expecting you to come with me, assuming they've thought about it at all. Come to think of it, they've never said anything about you. Anyone would think that you were just a horse. Well, that's not a problem, Kalira told him, tossing her head with merry disregard for what Lan's parents thought. We'll come here first and have them load me up with my formal gear. While we're at it, make sure you ask for a formal trainee uniform as well for the occasion. Take care of it sometime today. There isn't much call for them, but you can have one any time you ask for one if you give the housekeeper enough time to have one altered to fit you. When we're both looking just slightly less than royal, we can go to your parents' house and make an impressive entrance. Then I'll come back here. When you're just about ready to leave, call me. I'll hear you, no worries. We'll make an impressive exit as well. I think my arrival all by myself should set some tongues wagging. I should think. What a wonderful plan. It should make some eyes pop, too, when they see how beautiful you are. You're flattering me again, she teased. Do keep it up. How can it be flattery when it's true? How he loved being with her. Everything seemed so much brighter and sharper when she was at his side. Colors were richer and nothing could ruin his mood. Didn't people often call their spouses their better half? Surely she was just that, his better half. I must say that I'm very grateful to young Tuck, she told him as she walked alongside him. Make sure to tell him for me, will you? I believe that this will be one of the better midwinter holidays I've ever had. Just about then, the first members of his weapons class came trailing toward them over the snow. Looks like we're about to hear the bell for the class change, he observed, and Mock groaned. I wish you had hands instead of hooves. When Odo gets through with us, I'm going to want a massage so badly. Try a hot soak instead, she said playfully, blew into his hair and frisked off, cantering back toward Companion's Field as the bell for class change rang in the distance. He watched her go, floating fluidly across the snow as if she had wings just like the wind rider. Harold Odo emerged from the sal and smiled to see Lan already waiting there. Walking off the fry up, lad, he asked genially. Probably a good idea. Given how much we all seem to eat on Fridays, start your warm-up exercises anyway. Walking won't stretch out everything. Lan obeyed, towing the line cut into the hard-packed snow and beginning the arm and upper torso stretches. The training field was just a rectangle in the snow, surrounded by a token fence that anyone could step over. When the snow melted, it would go back to its former shape of a rectangle of sand enclosed by timber holding the sand in, with the fence atop the timbers. Before long, he was sweating enough that he didn't need his cloak anymore and tossed it aside over one of the fence rails behind him.
One by one, as the rest of the class of ten arrived, they ranged alongside him and started the same exercises, eventually discarding their own cloaks as well. Odo walked up and down their line and eyed them, correcting a stretch that wasn't quite right, chiding for not extending a stretch far enough. When he judged that they were all sufficiently ready, he passed out the wooden swords and shields, paired them up, distributed the pairs evenly across the extent of the training field, and bade them go through their exercises. Lan's opponent was an older boy who was just a little bit shorter than he, trainee Jerkin. This was all very elementary stuff. Each sword stroke meant a particular counter, and they took it turn and turn about, attack and parry. Odo wanted the moves to become second nature and completely instinctive. For now, until those moves were drummed into their blood and bone, they made their strokes to the rhythm of his clapped hands, speeding up as he increased the pace of his clapping. All the time, he strode among the five pairs of students, watching and correcting. Faster and faster the pace went. Lan was sweating furiously now. This was the fastest that Odo had ever taken them, and he felt the strain in every muscle. Relax. Don't fight yourself by thinking. Don't think. Just listen and do. Let go, love. Let it all go and just become part of the sword and the shield. Don't think. How is he going to know what counter to use? What in the world did she mean? Your body already knows. Trust me. Don't try. Just be. Experience and become part of the experience. Don't think and don't try. If he didn't trust Kalira so much. But he did. He did. She had never put him wrong yet. Between swings, he told his muscles to loosen. He stopped trying to anticipate the next move. After all, they were working patterns, not actually fighting. Instead of thinking, he felt, getting into the way his muscles strained, the hollow thock of the wooden practice blade on the shield, the vibrations in his hands and arms as each stroke hit. He stopped worrying about when Harold Odo was going to increase the pace. He began to feel as if he was in a waking dream. His arms and legs stopped hurting, and his body accomplished the moves all by itself. Was this what Harold Odo meant? All right, Odo clapped his hands, breaking Lan's trance. The student pairs broke apart and dropped their weapons to their sides with groans and sighs of relief. Lan's arms and legs went back to hurting, and he panted with the rest of them, sweat dripping off his nose and landing on the snow where it promptly froze. Go back to stretches and cool down, trainees, Odo ordered with some satisfaction. Then take five laps around the training field at an easy jog. Don't race, then come on inside and get a small drink. Lan put his mock weapons aside with the rest and jigged and shook out his cramps. His hands were the worst. It was always hard to get his fingers to let go of the hilt of his wooden sword. He wasn't the first to start running around the edge of the field, but he wasn't the last either. When everyone had finished running, Harold Odo brought them into the sal and passed out cups of lightly salted cider. It had an odd taste, but they all craved the salt and drank down their brew without complaint. There in the sal, he had them practice hand-to-hand -hand moves, looking into a mirror so they could see their own faults. Kicks, punches, blocks, and counters, over and over. Lan stared at his own reflection fiercely, alert for mistakes. He liked this better than the sword practice. There was something very satisfying about it, knowing that using this knowledge he could probably get away from any bullies in the future. This building, called the Sal, was one large open space with an office and storage partitioned off at one end. This was where all the practice weapons were kept and where Odo spent most of his day. It had a wooden floor, sanded smooth but not polished, wooden walls, and a mirror all along one side. Lan didn't want to think about how much that much mirrored glass had cost. Several families could have eaten well for years, surely. But it was worth the expense. Trainees could see their mistakes with their own eyes and correct them immediately, or at least know to ask for help in getting positioned. 
There were no windows on the walls. Instead, south-facing clear-story windows near the peak of the roof let in generous amounts of light. No danger of getting the sun in your face in here, though Odo would, no doubt, introduce them to the joy of fighting when sun-dazzled in due course. There was no fireplace in here, so it was pretty chilly, but better than outside. A certain amount of heat radiated from the one wall where the chimney from the fireplace in the office made a break in the expanse of wood paneling. When they had practiced long enough, Odo had them cool down a second time, then worked with them individually. When it was Lan's turn, Odo showed him a new move, the way to break someone's hold on his wrist, and had him practice it until he got it right. Now, combine that with what you know, the herald said, and grabbed for him. Much to his own shock, Lan evaded the rush, broke Odo's grip, tumbled the weapons master to the floor, and spun out of reach. Now what do you do, boy? Odo called from the floor. I run like fury, Lan replied, making good his words and fleeing to the opposite end of the sal, much to the amusement of the rest of his mates. Odo got up off the floor and dusted himself off. Don't laugh, trainees. He's right. As long as you have an escape, take it. Run. Never stand and fight unless there's no other choice. What if you're carrying a vital message? What if it's bandits that ambushed you and you have to get to the guard? You're not in the business of being heroes. You're in the business of being heralds. And that means staying alive to do your duty. He walked over to Lan and clapped him on the shoulder. Lavin has a right of it incapacitate your enemy and run like fury. He winked broadly. Of course, if I had been in his place, I'd have broken a few things to make certain my enemy stayed where I put him for a while, but you aren't up to that yet. When you are skilled enough to hold back your full force, then we'll practice those moves on each other. Lan took his place with the others as Odo called another trainee out for a session. He hadn't expected to like weapons training. He was a passable shot with a bow, but he'd expected that the bigger, older boys would be all over him. But there were no bigger boys in this class. There were several who were older, but none bigger. It wasn't all heraldic trainees, either. Three of the boys were in bardic trainee rust, and three were in the pale green of healer trainees. The trainees of all the collegia took the basic weapons courses. Bards were out in the wild parts of the world alone at least as often as heralds, and not everyone believed in bardic immunity. Healers weren't molested very often, but they might find themselves forced to defend a sick or injured patient. Some of the trainees from the other two collegia stuck with it through the entire weapons curriculum, too. Not every bard or healer found skill with sword and bow incompatible with his or her other training. When Odo was finished with the last of his students, he had them all get up and run around the sal for another few laps, then allowed them to cool down and stretch themselves out one final time. They gathered up their cloaks just as the class change bell rang outside. Off with you, he said, flapping his hands at them, looking as if he were shooting geese. Same time tomorrow and try not to overeat. Lan trudged out into the snow with the rest of them, then, like the rest of them, broke into a trot, drawn by the prospect of a hot bath to ease their aches and bruises before the final two classes of the day. If they hurried, it could just be managed. It was planned into their schedule. I'm beginning to think that they think of everything. It occurred to him with a sense of wonder. Well, I should certainly hope so. We've had enough practice at it by now. He laughed and picked up his pace. The hot water was going to feel very, very good. Thirteen. Shivering with cold but smiling nonetheless, Tuck and Lan waved goodbye to the last of their friends at the door of the Collegium. As soon as the last flick of Sharkhan's tail vanished past the gate, they rushed back inside, chafing their half-frozen hands. The Collegium wasn't empty yet, but it would be soon, probably within the next day or two. Those whose parents or relatives were close to Haven were generally the last to leave. 
Those who had far to go were often granted a few days' extra leave time for travel. Tuck and Lan were going to be gone themselves within a candle mark. Lan had already packed up his clothing and personal gear last night. All that remained in the wardrobe were a couple of clean outfits for when he got back and the resplendent formal greys. Although he had never considered himself to be particularly interested in clothing, he opened the wardrobe to admire the formal greys one more time. When he'd asked housekeeper Tori for a set of formals, he hadn't expected anything near that nice. The only way they differed from formal whites was in the color, which, unlike the everyday trainee grays, was a deeper color, very nearly his favorite charcoal gray. This, so the housekeeper told him, was to make it very clear on formal occasions who the trainees were. This was meant to keep them from getting involved in situations that they were not yet ready for. In an emergency, the paler color used in the everyday greys might be mistaken for white. The housekeeper, on learning what he wanted the uniform for, had even brought him to the sewing room for several fittings. The collegium seamstresses tailored it carefully to him, and it fitted impeccably, to the point that his mother would probably be impressed by the figure he cut. It was not new, though it looked it. Some other trainee had needed it, and it had passed through the hands of two or three other trainees before it came to Lan. Each had worn it once or twice, so for all intents and purposes, it was as good as the day it had first been made. The housekeeper had a dozen sets of formal greys packed away in an aromatic chest to keep off the moths, and when he was finished with this set, she'd let out the alterations, clean it, and put it back in the chest for the next trainee near his size who needed it. Lan closed the wardrobe on the splendid silver-trimmed greys, then picked up his packs and wrapped himself up in his cloak. He slung the packs over his shoulder and met Tuck at his door, and the two of them headed for the stables. The companions themselves arranged for these staged departures. They were quite a bit more organized than their chosen. About the time that a trainee had picked up his packs, his companion would present himself at the entrance to his stall. That was a signal to the stable hands to tack up that particular companion, and if everyone got the timing right, the companion would meet his chosen at the entrance to the stable all ready to go. Under ordinary circumstances, a trainee was responsible for doing his own saddling, but during the crush of holiday departures, it was deemed wiser to have as few people crowding the stables as possible. The first rush was always among those who were getting extra leave for their travels, so sometimes those in that lot had to wait or take the option to saddle up their companions themselves. By this time, though, the trainees were leaving in a slow trickle, so Lan was gratified to see Kalira and Tuck's mare, Dasseri, waiting for them, all tacked up in their travel gear. Let's go, Kalira called, doing a little dance in place. I can't wait to see something besides companions failed for a change. Lan laughed and threw his packs across her rump, fastening them to the back of her saddle. In no time at all, he and Tuck were in the saddle and out of the gate with a cheerful wave to the gate guard. As Kalira had predicted, the guards had gotten weary of watching him several weeks ago, and there was no longer anyone shadowing his movements. Now the guards no longer noted him as anything other than another trainee. The guard stationed at the gate in the special uniform of palace duty gave him nothing more than the same wave he had given to Tuck. Outside the walls, they found themselves in the oldest section of Haven, where the houses of some of the highborn with the longest lineage stood. These impressive manses were positively ancient, built in an archaic and very ornate style covered with carvings, stone lacework, and peculiar little statues in niches, dark with age and weather. The gardens here were not as extensive as those on the other side of the palace grounds, but their age was easily read in the size of the trees and the thickness of the hedges surrounding the gardens. Lan could only imagine what those gardens looked like. Nothing at all like the bare patch behind his parents' house, surely. It was quiet here, with a real sense of age. Oddly enough, although the palace predated these mansions by centuries, these places seemed older. He surveyed them with a sense of cynicism. 
Perhaps it was because they were ossified, preserved like flies in amber in a casing of unchanging tradition and petrified pride. The palace was always alive with change. It looked to Lan as if no one dared so much as move a rock in the garden of one of these places. I love coming through here, Tuck said, his eyes shining with enthusiasm as he admired the buildings, the height of which was only rivaled by the ancient trees in the gardens. These places are so solid, you know. You can feel the history and all the lives and events that have passed through their rooms. It's wonderful. Lan looked over at him in surprise. I would have said stifling myself. I should think that anyone who lived here would be as boring and dusty and moth-eaten as an old stuffed bird, and just about as flexible. Tuck shook his head. No, 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 it's not stifling at all. Well, you know Daria, don't you? And if you know her, I know that you like her. Lan nodded slowly. He did indeed know trainee Daria, a tall brunette with a slow smile. She was in the year group just before his. Nothing she ever did or said drew attention to herself. She was quiet, vaguely pretty, but not outstanding in any way but one. And that one was simply amazing. She was the most competent person he'd ever met. She never put a foot wrong. When something was needed, she was the first person there with the required object in her hand. When she didn't know the answer to a question or problem, she invariably knew who did. And although self-effacing, she was so quietly friendly and cheerful that, as Tuck had said, everyone who knew her liked her. Well, she grew up right over there, he pointed to a particularly matronly manner. Her blood's near as blue as the king's, and she's not petrified. I have to admit you're right there, Lan replied. Huh. Daria's going to take me to see the place one of these days come spring and let me rummage through the family papers, Tuck went on, fired with enthusiasm. You know, some of these older great houses had their own chroniclers. They've got records going back centuries, some right back to the founding, and antiques and artifacts stored up that are nearly as old. Just think about it. Stuff like that just brings how the people lived right to life when you look at it and handle it, read their letters, see how they lived. You sound like the Herald Chronicler yourself, Lan teased, only half joking. I'd like to do that, Tuck replied, not joking at all. I'd like that a lot. But I've got a long way to go before I'm ready for that, and a lot of circuit riding. My only gift is strong mind speech, so it's not like I have anything special to teach when it's time to retire from field duty. Lan blinked, a little surprised by this unexpected depth to his friend. To tell the truth, I don't know what I want to do. What I really wanted to be was in the guard. But when my parents put their feet down on that idea, I kind of gave up. Then I thought that I'd like to be a caravan master, but I guess that's out of the question now. Riding circuit on the border, that's what you want, Tuck said firmly. You work with the guard a lot and you help local villages organize militia if there's a local problem. You make sure that if there's a noble estate near enough to help, that the lord or whatever is doing his duty to help protect his people. Plus, there's all the usual circuit riding stuff. And eating my own food. Bleh. Lan teased as both companions wickered their own form of laughter. Then you'd better learn to cook better, Tuck retorted. If you don't want to ride, Circuit, there's always working with the guard directly. Then you'd get army rations. Hmm. Lan considered that notion as they left the last of the great houses behind, crossed through a gate beneath an ancient wall, and entered a section of newer estates with more extensive grounds. I hadn't thought of that. If you've got a gift that makes you really useful to the guard, that's probably what you'll be doing after you do your internship circuit, Tuck told him with an emphatic nod. And if it's really, really useful to the guard, you may do your internship with one of the guard heralds on the border itself. Really? This was the first Lan had ever heard of such a thing, and he smiled slowly. If he could do that... It would not only be his childhood dream come true, it would be better. I'd like that. I'd like that a lot. I wouldn't, but it takes all kinds, eh? 
Tuck grinned broadly. Me? I'd be happy if they'd let me teach history here. Maybe run messenger or courier in an emergency and apprentice to the Herald Chronicler. All right, apprentice. What can you tell me about all of these places? Lan waved his arms at the walls surrounding the road, over which much newer buildings looked down at them haughtily. Not much history here, and these places are more like to change hands than the great houses, Tuck said in a dismissive tone. Newer nobles, kingdom guildmasters and the very wealthy. I wish they'd pay more attention to their own history, actually, but they seem determined to leave it all behind them once they build or buy in this quarter. It's like they want to become someone entirely different and turn their backs on where they came from. But they aren't the same people anymore, Lan objected. Tuck gazed at him with an unusually solemn expression. Oh? And would you say that you aren't the same person you were before you were chosen? You can't just forget all that and discard it. It made you what you are now. Erase it, try to forget it, and what do you get? Nothing but pretense. And that's just phony and more pretentious than just enjoying what you've made of yourself, I think. I guess I can see that, sort of. I mean, I don't always get along with my folks, but they don't pretend that they sprang out of nowhere, or that they've got some sort of fake blue blood in their background. Lan considered that. What would that do to a person's head? Could you remake yourself in another image? And if you did, what would you have? Wouldn't it just be a false image? And if these people discard what they were, what does that make them? Tuck persisted. If they try to convince themselves that their own past has no relevance anymore. This was the most philosophic that Tuck had ever been, and it aroused an equally thoughtful mood in Lan. Not much, Lan thought aloud. Kind of hollow. No substance, no debt to the past. My point exactly, Tuck said with satisfaction. And maybe that's why so many of their children turn out badly. Too much of trying to give their children what they didn't have, and not enough giving their children what they did have that made them so successful and prosperous. And maybe that explains Tyron and his bullies, Lan thought, with a twist of his gut. You're unaccountably wise today, Tuck, he said lightly, changing the subject a trifle. I hardly know you. Tuck laughed. That's cause most people don't pull my history string and find out what's attached to it. Pure passion, I'm afraid. It's the one subject that I can go on about for days at a time. Blame yourself. You could have started me on bad puns or limericks instead, but no. That, Lan replied with mock solemnity, as they passed the last of the mansions and turned down a street lined with shops would have been worse, or should I say, verse. Tuck pulled off his cap and hit him on the shoulder with it, as Lan ducked and laughed. A few of the folk walking along the side of the street heard their laughter, turned their heads, and smiled to see two trainees in such high spirits. The farther they went from the palace, the more crowded the streets became. At first, all of the traffic was on foot, but before long they were sharing the pavement with ox carts, pack-laden donkeys, and a few horsemen. Their pace was leisurely, but was never so slow that either of them felt impatient, and both companions gazed in every direction with great interest. Lan rather enjoyed looking around. This was yet another part of the city he hadn't yet had a chance to see. In this weather there were few open stalls, but the shops seemed to be doing a brisk business. The stalls that were there tended toward hot food and drink. Handfuls of roasted chestnuts, hot tea and cider, mulled ale, hot pies. The only aromas on the cold air were savory, stewing meat, the spices of mulled ale, the hearty scent of hot chestnuts— the sweet intoxication of pastry. Pie vendors also walked the street with trays of pies. One of them approached the boys and Lan bought a pair of apple pies to share with Tuck. A small child ran up with a gift of a carrot for each companion. They munched the spicy treats as they continued on out of the city. The streets were very narrow here and quite noisy. 
Besides people talking at the top of their lungs, oxen lowing, donkeys braying, hooves clicking on the pavement, and wheels clattering, there were the sounds of commerce. Butchers wielded cleavers or made sausage with much clanking of gears. Tinkers mended pans. Blacksmiths shooed animals or beat out utensils. Knives were sharpened. Wood hewn furniture built. From the taverns, singing and laughter drifted out every time a door opened. From cook shops, a hundred different dinner dishes added their aroma to the breeze, and a hundred cooks and all their helpers added to the clamor. Lan loved it. This was his home village writ large. He adored the bustle, the fact that there were things to be seen no matter where you looked. He could have spent an entire day just watching the people at all their myriad activities. Gradually, the bustle ebbed. The buildings were spaced farther apart. The traffic eased. There were still plenty of people around, but they didn't have to shout to be heard. Children shrieked and played. There wasn't much snow around since most of it had been trampled hard or swept away by now, so they bobbed along, bundled up like so many balls of clothing ready for the laundry in clumsy, complicated games of tag. Then, suddenly, a final wall loomed up in front of Lan and Tuck, this one attended by a pair of guardsmen in the lighter blue and silver of the regular troops. It was taller than any of the buildings around it, a real defensive structure, with watchtowers at intervals and more guards patrolling atop it. The trainees passed beneath it and were out into the country. This was not one of the more heavily trafficked roads into Haven, so there weren't any of the big wagons that brought in farm produce or carried away goods. Instead, there were a few small carts on the road and one or two riders, and the two of them. A wide meadow, snow-covered and dotted with sheep and milk cows, stretched on either side of the road all the way up to the wall. It was kept cleared to prevent anyone from approaching without warning. This was common land, and anyone who wished to could tether a cow or a sheep or run a flock of geese out here. Many folk clubbed together to put their animals under a common shepherd, cowherd, or goose girl. There were no geese out here now, a sign that the midwinter feast was near. They were being fattened on grain in pens in preparation for their appearance on many a table. Want a gallop? Tuck asked, now that they were out in the open. For answer, Kalira launched herself like an arrow from a bow. Tuck's dasery followed her with great enthusiasm. Lan bent low over Kalira's neck, laughing as Tuck caught up with them. This wasn't a race. Instead, they were matching their paces so perfectly that they could probably have traded mounts in mid-gallop. Full heralds with more practice could do just that, and before he and Tuck finished their riding lessons, so would they. The companions slowed to a fast walk as they reached the end of the common land and reached the first farms. Neither of the companions were even breathing heavily, and Tuck and Lan were laughing with sheer exhilaration. Now that is something we'll be able to do as much as we like, Tuck promised. That and Ma don't mind, as long as we don't scare the stock. We'll just stay out of the milch cow pastures, Lan promised. I've been a country boy too, you know, and I don't think it's particularly amusing to stampede the cattle. But how's the hunting? He waited, hopefully, for the answer. Good bird hunting, especially pheasant, Tuck replied, smiling at the gleam in Lan's eye. We don't bother the foxes unless they go after the yard fowl. If you really want to go after something big, we can organize a deer or a boar hunt. But we're careful about how many we take from the home woods. I'd like that. But I'll be satisfied with rabbit and birds, Lan replied truthfully. We'll only have a fortnight, after all and I don't want to intrude on your time with your family. Oh, don't worry, you won't, Tuck chuckled. And I'd better warn you about Mary, my little sister. She's just discovered boys, and she falls in love every time she meets a new one. You're not bad-looking, and you're going to be a Harold, so she'll probably start making calf eyes at you the minute you cross the threshold. I'll try not to hurt her feelings, Lan promised. And I'll try not to tease you about it too much, Kalira chimed in. 
We can always stay out of her way most of the day, and Ma won't let her make too big a loon of herself in the evenings, Tuck chuckled. The farms they passed looked virtually identical. Thatch-roofed, snow-covered buildings with big stone barns, hedges dividing the fields with wooden stiles built for humans and dogs to cross, cattle and sheep pawing through the snow to get at the grass or feeding from bales of hay left out for them. In the farmyards, chickens and ducks jostled each other for grain and vegetable peelings, while pigs grunted hopefully in their sties attached to the barns. Some farms boasted a pond full of geese and ducks as well. The figures of the farm folk, made small by the distance, made their way among the buildings at their chores. I'll help with the chores, Lan said, suddenly moved to offer by the recollection of how many chores a farm family usually had. I don't mind, and that will make sure you get some time to have some fun too. That'll make things easier, thanks. Tuck said gratefully, without any awkwardness over the offer. I usually get wood chopping and water carrying when I'm home. We don't have a pump in the kitchen, so we fill a cistern above it. There's no well under the house, so we're kind of stuck. That's a lot of water. Well, it'll be half a lot of water, Lan laughed, which ought to be some comfort to you. They reached Tuck's home just at sunset with scarlet light streaming across the white snow and the entire sky on fire. Tuck's home looked very like every other farm they'd passed. The home was a trifle larger, perhaps, but otherwise it was the same. Stone building, stone barn, thatched roofs, chicken coop with its own thatched roof, dove cot, pig sty, and cows coming in from the field to be milked. This was primarily a dairy farm, close as it was to Haven. The income came from milk, cream, butter, cheese, and eggs, and the vegetables and animals they raised mostly went to their own table. As a consequence, the barn was enormous. The cattle were a pampered lot, cosseted and petted. Each had her own stall with her name over it. Each was cared for tenderly. Tuck's family didn't even slaughter their own cattle for beef. Weaned bull calves were sent elsewhere, and the cows who could no longer give milk were allowed to play nursemaid to the newly weaned female calves until they were old enough to join the milch herd. Not that they didn't eat beef. They traded for it. They also raised a few sheep as well as pigs for meat, but no one was allowed to make a pet of them. All this Lan knew from Tuck's stories of his family, and it all made very good sense to him. As they turned off the road and took the path leading to the farm, someone came out of the house and spotted them. Waving wildly until they waved back, the figure jumped up and down, then turned back and ran into the house. A moment later, more figures poured out of the house, until there were a good dozen waving at them and shouting greetings. Tuck and Dasari launched into a gallop. Lan and Kalira continued at a more sedate pace. When Tuck reached his family, he spilled out of the saddle and into their arms for a hearty exchange of embraces and backslapping. Lan grinned, although he couldn't even imagine his own family indulging in such antics. By the time he and Kalira reached the group, most of the greeting was over. He dismounted with a bit more dignity and took the hand that Tuck's mother extended to him. I can't begin to thank you for this hospitality, Mistress Chester, he began when the rosy-cheeked woman waved his thanks aside and clasped his hand in both of hers. Call me Ma, youngling, she insisted, or Ma Chester if you'd rather. No formal nonsense among friends in holiday, I always say. Ma Chester's ginger-colored hair and sparkling green eyes were the duplicate of her son's, and although her figure was ample enough, she was by no means the roly-poly dumpling that farm wives were portrayed as in city stories. She worked hard, and she was as sturdy and well-muscled as any of her sons. Well, you still have my thanks, Marchester, he replied, grinning, and I promised Tuck I'd share his chores with him, so don't you try and sneak him off to do them alone. A promise is a promise, so I shan't, she agreed, smiling broadly. Pa Chester's a milking, so you'll see him soon's you take the ladies to the barn, and about half the rest of the brood but I'll make you known to the flock.
she introduced him to her four youngest children, who stared at him merrily from blue or green eyes. One boy and three girls they were, with the youngest being the boy. Sheila, Trini, Cassie, and Jan. The rest of the mob were servants or hired workers, whom she introduced just the same as her children. The hired workers took the morning chores, allowing the master and his children to sleep a little past dawn. In return, the master and his children took all the evening chores, permitting the hired hands to have their dinner and go home to their own families early. With the introductions over for the moment, the crowd returned to dinner, and Lan and Tuck led their companions into the barn. A dusky light filled the barn, carefully shielded oil lamps placed in wrought iron cages fastened to the great beams that supported the hayloft gave off a diffused illumination. The cattle were all in their stalls, some munching placidly in their hay, the last few being milked. A sweet odor of hay and milk filled the barn, and the swish-swish of milk spurting into pails was the only sound besides the munching of hay and the occasional hoof-stamp or snort. I took, called Pa Chester from the back of the barn. Yet here then, and hello to ye too, young Lavin. Hela, Master Chester, Lan called. Glad I am to be here. I've given your lady my thanks, but you must take them as well. Ah, tis not. We're glad for your company, youngling, Pa Chester replied. And you'll be calling me Pa, same as Took, and you please? Yes, sir, Lan replied, stifling a chuckle. He followed Tuck, who led Dasari to the rear of the barn, and there were two stalls, open box stalls with ample mangers filled with hay and oats, hock deep in sweet, fresh straw, and buckets filled with fresh water. The stalls had no doors, so that Dasari and Kalira could come and go as they pleased, exactly as in the stalls in the companion's stable at the Collegium. Greatly pleased, though not surprised, Lan unsaddled Kalira and gave her a good rubdown, covering her with her special fitted blanket. Saddle and saddle blanket went over the sides of the stall, bitless bridle was hung on a peg at the front, and then he picked up his packs and left Kalira to her meal. He emerged just in time to be introduced to the rest of Tuck's family. These were three boys and two girls, Mary, who, as Tuck had prophesied, immediately began to make eyes at him, her sister, Ajala, and Tuck's brothers, Hal, Stain, and Guy. Pa Chester, he already knew, a hearty, blue-eyed, straw-haired farmer, plain as a post and cheerful as a sparrow. The boys were like him. Tuck clearly took after his mother. Mary was blonde as well, Ajala a true strawberry blonde, and much the prettier of the two, though Lan doubted that she was aware of the fact. With dusk fading and the stars beginning to come out, the group trooped into the kitchen for dinner, as cheerful an affair as any meal at the Collegium. Tuck's brothers and sisters bombarded him with questions about the Collegium. Lan kept quiet and listened. Tonight's meal was rabbit, pie, mashed turnips with sweet butter, scones, clotted cream, and plenty of jam. There was more than enough for everyone. Seconds and even third helpings were the rule in the Chester household. Everyone worked hard and had the healthiest of appetites. There was one other member of the family that Lan had not yet met, to whom he was introduced before dinner. This was Granny Chester, Pa Chester's mother. Though very old, she was not at all frail. It was she who still spun most of the wool knitted into stockings and winter garments for the family. She did a great deal of the knitting itself. She taught the girls to sew, weave, and embroider, taught the boys, too, if anyone could catch them often enough to make them sit still for the lessons. Tuck was one of the few boys at the Collegium who had the skills to help out with the sewing and mending, and he made no bones about the fact that he greatly enjoyed being the only rooster in the hen house. Lan bowed over Granny's hand like a very courtier. She snatched it away from him and gave him a playful rap on the knuckles, but dimpled with pleasure like the girl she once was. Snow-white hair peeked from under her cap in flossy curls, her blue eyes, surrounded by a maze of fine lines and wrinkles, twinkled at him. After dinner, the family cleared away the plates, and everyone helped to wash up. 
Lan took his turn drying the heavy pots. They pushed the table aside and brought in the cushions and easy chairs. The huge kitchen did double duty as a sitting room in winter, for there was no reason to heat two rooms when one would suffice. The sitting room was kept shuttered and closed off from the rest of the house until spring, when it would be opened up and used as a retreat from the heat of the kitchen. Granny Chester got pride of place right next to the fire in the chimney corner. The girls brought out knitting or fine sewing, the boys carving or more knitting. Even Tuck dashed upstairs and brought down a basket with a half-finished pair of stockings, evidently left from the last time he was here. Seeing what they were up to, Lan rummaged in his packs, which were in a corner of the kitchen, and got out a book. He cleared his throat, and the others looked up at him, some with curiosity, but Tuck with a glint of anticipation. I thought maybe some of you might like to hear a tale or two before bed? He half asked. He needn't have been so tentative. His suggestion was met with an enthusiasm that would have charmed a practiced bard. The book he had brought with him was, in fact, one of the ones that the bardic trainees were taught from. As with all songs, many things were left out of the great songs that were famous all throughout Valdemar. This book and the others that Lan had brought with him filled in the blank spaces of many of these famous songs. I know you've all heard the bards sing Burden's Ride, but there's more to the story than that, he began, opening the book to the first page. And here is how Burden's story really began. As they all listened raptly, knitting needles clicked and knives whittled tiny slivers, and the fire crackled and popped, making a comfortable domestic background to the story. When at last he finished telling them for the first time how Burden settled down at the Collegium, minus a leg but plus his own true love, to live to a respected and ripe old age, teaching the trainees what it meant to be a real message writer— they all sighed with pleasure. I do believe that's the finest I've ever heard anyone read, young Lavin, Pa Chester said, speaking for them all. And a fine thing it is to hear the whole of a tale. Aye to that, Granny Chester agreed with satisfaction. Me own ma used to call me Curious Kit because I was always asking what else happened, and she could never tell me. Well... I have enough tales in my books with happy endings to read one every night I'm here, if you like, Lan offered, tickled by their response. From the clamor that followed this offer, it was very clear that everyone did, indeed, like. Ma Chester produced a round of warm cider and chestnuts to roast. Fierce betting ensued as to which chestnut would pop first. When the last nut was a memory and the last sip of cider was gone, Granny ordered them all to bed. Lan was not at all averse to bed. It had been a long day. He and Tuck fetched their packs from the corner of the kitchen and headed up the stairs with the rest. The bedrooms were chilly, even the ones arranged around the central chimney, but hot bricks had been placed in the beds right after dinner. Lan shared Tuck's bedroom, taking a trundle that rolled out from beneath Tuck's bed. Well? Tuck asked after they had both burrowed under their warm blankets and the candle was blown out. Think you're going to be able to stand my family for a fortnight? Huh. I think it's more whether they're going to be able to stand me. This is going to be great, Tuck, and thanks again for asking me here. Happy to, Tuck muttered, pleasure in his voice. You know. But Lan never did find out what Tuck was going to say, because at that point... He was ambushed by sleep. Fourteen. The collegium was uncharacteristically silent, the hallways dim. The one or two trainees who had remained here over the holiday had already been adopted by those who had families here and were spending the day with those families. Without fires burning, the building itself was cold but it did not have the forlorn sense of abandonment that Lan had expected. Instead, the feeling as he walked down the hallway to his room was of a rest before activity resumed, as if the collegium were taking a welcome breather until the trainees returned in force. 
His arrival had been anticipated, however, and despite the fact that this was a full holiday, someone had been in his room, built up the fire, and brushed and laid out his formal greys for him. There was even a brand new pair of boots to go with them, something he had not expected, adding the perfect touch of completeness to the uniform. The fire had been going long enough to warm up his room completely. He banked it to await his return before going to the bathroom and cleaning up. He had gotten up before dawn in order to get to the collegium before noon. He wanted to arrive on his parents' doorstep just before the servants put out the array of finger foods that would sustain the guests until the great feast just after dark. He would stay through the feast, then leave and spend the night at the collegium before returning to the Chester farm in the morning. Fully scrubbed, carefully turned out, he surveyed himself in the full-length mirror at the end of the hall. He straightened unconsciously and was astonished at his own reflection. A sober-faced stranger stared back at him, clad in a form-fitting, silver-trimmed uniform that lent him a personality somehow more impressive than his own. Time to stop admiring yourself and get out here, Kalira laughed. If you want to make a properly timed arrival, that is. Lan grinned at his reflection and went to fetch his cloak. This time he took the gate opposite the one that led the way he and Tuck had used to leave the week before. With a cheerful wave to the guard, he and Kalira stepped out onto the street outside the walls. Although there were many impressive mansions here as well, these were of the newer sort, and from the look of things, they were all full to bursting with guests, probably relatives come in from outlying areas, for midwinter festival at court was a time of great festivity, fetes and balls, for seeing and being seen, and went on for the full fortnight. Every window held a candle, and garlands of greenery festooned the doors and lower windows. These homes had gates of wrought iron rather than the solid wooden gates of the older homes, and as Lan and Kalira rode past, they saw hordes of happily shrieking children at play in the snow-filled gardens. He hoped that on the other side of the palaces, the ancient walls of the great houses were echoing with as much laughter. Things grew quiet again as they entered another section of shops and workshops, mostly workshops with shops attached. A variety of craftspeople worked here. Chandlers, booksellers who rebound their wares in fine covers, craftsmen of strictly ornamental objects. There wasn't a sign of anyone in this part of the city. Even the most ambitious shopkeeper knew better than to try to compete with Midwinter Feast. Only where there were taverns and inns was there any sign of where people had gone. Ah, but a turn of the street later found folk gathered around street entertainers in a tiny park filled with lanterns, and the sound of music and dancing echoed through the empty shops. A few enterprising vendors had set up temporary stalls with hot drinks and pastries, and there was no doubt that a good time was being had by all. Another turn and a different sort of music met Lan's ears as the cheerful dance tunes faded. The sound of hymns from one of the temples, a chorus swelled many-fold by the folk crowded inside its walls. Turn again, and he was in the quarter he knew well, passing Leeside Park where even now a group of brightly clad young folk trotted their horses, and another group skated and slid on the frozen ice of the central pond. With houses full to bursting with relatives, most of whom insisted on treating adolescents like infants at this holiday season, this lot would probably stay in the park as long as they could get away with it. Vendors of hot food and drink with semi-permanent stalls lined one side of the pond, and at the other side was a warming shed where skaters surrounded an open fire, perched on encircling benches. None of them gave him more than a curious glance, and he didn't stop to examine them very closely, although he thought he recognized several from the school. He was no longer a part of their world, nor they of his. If he did recognize either former acquaintance or foe, he really would be at a loss for what to say to them. I'd like to see Owen, though, he told Kalira as they turned away from the park and into his parents' street. Maybe not right now, but sometime soon. He was a better friend to you than either of you expected, Kalira replied.
I think you should. Here the houses were festooned with more greenery than their little gardens ever saw in the height of summer. Even the lamp posts were twined with garlands of evergreen and hung with bunches of mistletoe. From the tiny yards behind the houses rose the sounds of more children playing, not with the same boisterous abandon as the ones out in the park or the streets, but still having a good time from the sound of the laughter. Kalira's bridal bells chimed cheerfully, echoing up and down the street, and the sound drew children out of the yards to come see what made it. Lan sat up straighter as round eyes peered at him and took in the familiar sight of a companion, but the unfamiliar uniform. He heard murmurs of speculation and suppressed a smile. But then, as he drew nearer to his own house, the offspring of his own relatives piled out of the yard, and one of them finally recognized him. A cousin, a very young one, stared at him with mouth and eyes going equally round, then suddenly burst back into the house through the front door, squealing at the top of her lungs. Mama, Mama, it's Cousin Lan, and he's a Captain Harold! That brought a veritable flood of relatives out into the cold, giving Lan exactly the hoped-for opportunity for a dramatic arrival. Kalira went into a parade gate called a pavan, a kind of slow-motion trot with feet raised as high as possible, as Lan sat very straight and still in the saddle. As his mother and father pushed their way through the rest, Kalira came to a graceful halt. With a flourish of his cape, Lan swung out of the saddle and tied his reins over the pommel. With a brief but very low bow of her head, Kalira whirled on her heels and returned up the street at a now brisk canter. Lan turned and faced his parents and the rest of the family, who were all from the oldest to the youngest, staring as open-mouthed as the first to recognize him. Lavin, his father blurted. Your horse! Companion, father, he said gently. It wouldn't be proper nor polite for her to stand about in the yard with no shelter and no comforts. We've no place for her here, so she'll be back for me later. His father stared at him as if he'd spoken hard Dornan. His mother looked at him as if he was a stranger. He had never seen them look at him that way before. Or had he? Hadn't they been odd with him when they'd come to visit him at the House of Healing? And was that fear, he saw, faintly, before they forced smiles of welcome onto their faces? They didn't give him a chance to examine them any closer. Well, let's not all stand about in the cold any longer, his father said, clapping him on the back. Come along inside, everyone, and let's get back to our festival. Lan was carried away on a tide of relations, in through the front door where he was relieved of his cloak, revealing the true splendor of his formal greys, and on to the sitting room where his younger cousins, terribly impressed, made him sit down and plied him with plates of food they carried off from the sideboards just to present to him. He couldn't have moved if he'd wanted to. He had no idea where the rest of those his age were at the moment, though he shrewdly suspected they were at the park. The adults had commanded the parlor, and at this point they were probably bombarding his parents with questions of their own. He wondered what they were telling everyone, given that his father hadn't even thought that there was a difference between a horse and a companion. It was the children who saved him from further awkwardness, they were dying to hear about what being a heraldic trainee was like, and inundated him with questions. Was his companion really smart enough to come get him? Did she talk like a human? How could she speak in thoughts? Where did he live? Was the collegium really in the same place as the palace? Had he met anyone important? He'd met the king's own? Had he ever seen the king? The answer to each question only gave birth to a dozen more, which prevented him from having to make conversation with the adults. That was just as well, for they kept drifting over from the parlor in little clumps to listen as he spoke to the children. He could feel their eyes on him all the time. If the children treated him as one of their own who had returned from a far country with incredible tales, the adults watched him as if he had changed into some new and strange creature, utterly unlike a human. He had become, unwittingly, the main source of entertainment for the afternoon. 
Although the adults didn't stoop to asking him any questions themselves, they certainly didn't hesitate to listen while he answered the children. He tried to concentrate on them rather than anything else. They were certainly excited and happy to see him and pelt him with their questions, and after all, it certainly was the first time that any of them had gotten close enough to a trainee, much less a herald, to ask all the questions that they wanted to. It was only after darkness had fallen and a servant had gone around discreetly lighting the candles that his mother appeared in the parlor, clapping her hands to get their attention. Nelda was not dressed in her absolute finest, which she reserved for important meetings, festivals, and parties involving guild functionaries. Instead, she wore something much more casual, a simple-cut gown of soft brown wool, bound around with a hanging girdle embroidered not by her own hands, but by Macy. It had been last year's midwinter present. Her hair was done in a single loose braid down her back, and Lan thought she looked much better and softer than when she wore her best. Enough questions for now, little ones, she called just a shade too heartily. It's time for the feast. Since Lan would certainly be around after the feast to continue the question, the children abandoned him for the pleasures of the table. The children ate apart from the adults in the kitchen the parlor, or anywhere else that small tables could be set up for them. The adults had the dining room to themselves, and Lan could tell at a glance that there had been some last-minute reshuffling of the seating arrangements. He was escorted to the seat of honor that Sam usually took, at his father's right. Two of the cousins who hadn't spoken to each other for years had somehow gotten placed side by side, and his brother Sam had been positioned between two very pretty, but matrimonially speaking, completely unsuitable country relatives. Neither of these seeding accidents would ever have happened if his mother had been paying attention, so evidently his arrival had flustered her. Or, not his arrival, but his appearance. She had probably expected that he would appear on foot in his rather forgettable trainee uniform. Clearly, his parents had not bothered to tell anyone of his new status. As usual, the adults would have dismissed him from their minds as entirely unimportant. His theatrical arrival had completely thrown all of her expectations into the dust. That wasn't entirely unsatisfactory, although he would much rather have been where Sam was. It would have been rather nice to have both his pretty cousins making calf eyes at him over their cups. As it was, he was between his grandmother who had displaced him from his own room and his father. Well, at least he wouldn't be required to make conversation. Grandmother was as deaf as a rock, and his father clearly was reluctant to make conversation with him. Grandmother evidently considered his new clothing to be some sort of clever invention of his mother's. She looked him up and down, then announced loudly, I'm glad you managed to get this boy into something presentable, Nelda. He finally looks like a chitwood and not like a rag picker's son. Then she applied herself to her food, blissfully unaware of the nervous giggles from the foot of the table or Nelda's embarrassed blush. The chief ornament of the feast was a remarkable dish composed of a brace of deboned quails stuffed into a deboned pheasant, stuffed into a deboned capon, stuffed into a deboned duck, stuffed into a deboned goose. It must have been cooking all day, but at least it ensured that there was plenty of bird to go around without burdening the table with five different platters. The rest of the table groaned beneath the huge variety of dishes thought necessary to the midwinter feast. Mashed, roasted, or candied root vegetables, bowls of five different bean concoctions, mashed peas, stewed greens, four kinds of bread, two kinds of rolls, plain butter and butter creamed with honey, gravies, jellies, stewed fruit, pickles, pitchers of cream, small ale, wine, cider... Lan knew that they wouldn't eat it all, but at least what wasn't eaten would be carried with great ceremony to the nearest temple of Kurnos, to be distributed to the hungry before it even had a chance to cool. Grandmother would lead the procession, pushed in her canopied, wheeled chair, just as she had back in Alderscroft, with Nelda on her right and Macy on her left. Those female relatives who cared would accompany them, 
The priest would pronounce a solemn blessing on the creators of the dishes who were so generous as to share them, paying special attention to the matriarch of the clan. Grandmother loved every moment of it. It was her opportunity to be the queen of the family. At least everyone got a midwinter feast that way, for the poor were waiting right there in the temple to be fed. So, Lavin, one of the unsuitable cousins piped up from farther down the table, fluttering her eyes at him. Are there many pretty girls being trained as heralds? Lan was torn between saying the expected, none as pretty as you, and the indifferent, I hadn't noticed. He compromised on, most of the time we're all being worked so hard that we're too tired to tell the girls from the boys, and the rest of the time we're trying to catch up on sleep. Oh, come now, a particularly obnoxious uncle said in a patronizing tone of voice. There can't be that much to learn. What does a herald do, anyway, but ride about and look important? Maybe settle an occasional feud between farmers? Lan took a very deep breath before answering to remind himself to keep his temper, ignoring the frantic look on his mother's face. Well, as it happens, I get up about a candle mark before dawn, unless I happen to be one of the people who has morning chores to do, and in that case, I get up two candle marks before dawn. There's breakfast, then I put my room ready for inspection. Then I have classes in history, geography, and field investigation. Then hard riding exercises. Then maybe afternoon chores, then lunch. Then more afternoon chores, a study. Then weapons work. Then mathematics and accounting. Then a class in court etiquette and how to handle situations involving the nobles. Then a special class. Right now I'm doing a short class on how to take care of injuries or illness in an emergency until a healer can get there. Then perhaps evening chores. After that is dinner, then archery practice or a free candle mark, then study until bed. He got some satisfaction in seeing his uncle's eyes bulge a little more with every class, he added. Later I'll be getting lessons in how to use my gift— how to invoke truth spell, another short class about bards. I'll learn how to survive in the wilderness with no supplies and no tools. I'll learn how to rescue people from drowning, handle a rowboat in a sailboat, how to organize fighting a forest fire or a house fire, how to organize local people into a militia and train them to defend themselves, and how to be a judge. That's just what I know about. I'm sure there are a lot more classes I don't know about yet. Oh his uncle said weakly. Well, what else could he say? Lan took great satisfaction in having managed to put the man in the wrong without ever being in the least impolite. It was the first time in his memory that anyone had ever been able to shut the man up. No one else seemed to be able to think of anything to say to him, which was just as well. There were a few awkward moments of silence, then another cousin asked the discomfited uncle about a matter of trade in a slightly shrill and nervous voice. The uncle loudly proclaimed his opinion, and conversation resumed, flowing around Lan without touching him. He ate his meal in silence, wishing that he'd stayed with the Chesters instead. Maybe there wouldn't have been any quail stuffed inside pheasant stuffed, etc., but he would have been a lot more comfortable. Finally, the interminable meal came to an end with the requisite toasts. When it was Lan's turn, he decided to actually make one instead of passing, as he usually did on the rare occasions when the opportunity arose. After all, I'm in a place of honor. Why shouldn't I? His father was just beginning to stand when Lan pushed his chair decisively back and rose to his feet, glass held high. His father sat back down hurriedly, and a silence descended on the table with a thud. Lan stared at the wine the color of old embers glowing in the heart of his glass. I would like to toast my family, he said, taking an absolutely malicious pleasure in choosing words heavily weighted with irony and loaded with a definite double meaning. For without your actions, I would not be where I am and what I am at this moment. Macy looked puzzled. Sam went pale, as did his father. His mother flushed. But what could they do or say? For all they knew, he was being entirely sincere, although surely they knew he meant what he had said in every possible interpretation. The rest of his relatives looked askance at each other for a moment, 
as if wondering just how they should react to this. It was his grandmother who broke the impasse. He'd spoken loudly enough for her to make out what he'd said. Properly done, boy, she declared. Here, here, and drank her own glass down. That broke the spell holding the rest, and they followed the old woman's example. With a faint smile, Lan took a sip from his glass and sat down, feeling that he'd gotten ample revenge for the uncomfortable meal he'd just endured. The feast ended just after that, and the women descended on the kitchen to each take possession of a dish for the procession to the temple. The children enveloped Lan and rushed him back to the sitting room, and the men retired to the parlor for wine and discussions of their own. Lan had no doubt that he would be the main topic of conversation, though more likely for his borderline insolence to his uncle than for the toast, which his father and brother were likely to avoid discussing. This time the youngsters Lan's age and older joined the children, although they would not normally have done so. In past years, the older ones, if they did not escape to some other venue such as moonlight skating, sledding, or sleigh riding, generally would gather in two groups, the boys to discuss girls and the girls to discuss boys. Once again, he was going to provide the entertainment for the entire lot of them. He didn't much mind, since Kalira would arrive for him in a candle mark or two. There wasn't that much more of this for him to endure. It turned out not to be an ordeal after all. The relatives of his own age were just as curious and full of admiration as the little ones. It was an entirely new experience for Lan to be admired by anyone in his family. He relaxed and answered questions cheerfully and frankly. The world of the heraldic trainee was entirely new to everyone here. Well, it had been unknown to him as well until he was chosen, and for the most part the members of the Chitward family had never had anything to do with heralds. Why should they? Any disputes were settled within the guild courts. No one broke any laws, so they never had occasion to more than note a herald passing at a distance. Read about them in a tale or hear about them in a ballad. If any of them had ever daydreamed about being chosen, they had probably dismissed the idea with the typical practicality of a merchant family. I wonder if any of them will start to dream about it now, he thought as he answered another question and watched how the eyes of even the oldest children were shining. The ladies returned from the temple with Grandmother loudly proclaiming her pleasure in the ceremony. That signaled a round of activity, putting the youngest children to bed, collecting all the scattered members of the families of those who lived nearby, farewells and polite thanks from the ones who were going home tonight. As Lan stood back out of the way, he heard Kalira with relief. I'm nearly there, ready to go. Your timing is perfection, he told her. Let me go say goodbye to mother and father and I'll meet you outside. He waited while another of the Chitwood cousins, burdened with a baby and a toddler, paid their respects to his parents before going out the door. He edged past them as they pushed their toddler toward the door and approached his parents with his cloak in his arms. It's time for me to leave too, he told them as they turned toward him. It's been quite an exceptional feast this year. That, he thought, was diplomatic enough. I suspect everyone is going to be talking about this one for a long time. We thought we'd save you as a sort of surprise, his mother said, in a tone that told him that she hadn't thought any such thing. She hadn't thought about him at all, as he had suspected. Or if she had, she had dismissed his presence as required but negligible. But her expression softened a little as she looked at him. Her hazel eyes took on a glint of pride. In him. I was certainly that, he smiled very slightly. From the way the youngsters acted, I was better entertainment than the puppet show Uncle Laris had three years ago. Well, the puppet show was only there for a candle mark, his father pointed out, with at last a hint of humor and a faint smile. They had you captive for the entire afternoon and evening. I hope you weren't too bored with them. He shrugged. I didn't mind. It's a good thing for them to find out what we are, what we're like. Maybe it destroys some of the mystery, but... It also removes ignorance. He didn't say anything about the obnoxious relative. He didn't have to. But now I really do have to go. 
His parents embraced him, his father heartily, his mother awkwardly. At that moment, he made up his mind that next year he would decline the invitation, even if he had to make up a reason why he couldn't come, even if the Chesters didn't invite him back. Maybe when he was finally a herald, he'd start coming for the family gatherings occasionally, but not right now. He drew back from them and nodded formally. You'd better get back to your guests, he said. I'll show myself out. Without waiting for their response, he turned and headed for the door. But just before he reached it, his sister Macy squeezed between two of the adults crowding a doorway and rushed up to him. Here, she said, pressing a small, thin package into his hand. I made this for you. As she waited expectantly, he unwrapped it. Her gift was one of the most beautiful pieces of embroidery he had ever seen her create. It was very much a miniature tapestry, a perfect copy of the crest of Valdemar, with every star in the background picked out in silver, every link in the Wind Rider's broken chains delineated completely. Good gods, I should think you'd go blind doing work like this, he exclaimed, much to Macy's satisfaction. She dimpled with pleasure as he kissed her cheek. Macy, it's gorgeous. As soon as I get my hands on a needle and thread, I'll put it right on the shoulder of my cloak, where everyone will see it. Thank you so much. If it's all right, I'd like some hair from your companion's mane and tail eventually, she said. I want to make some woven jewellery. Have her come out and pull some right now, Kalira interrupted. As much as she likes, as long as she doesn't snatch me bald. Kalira's outside, and she says to come and get some, he told her, and was rewarded with her wide eyes and enchanted smile. She didn't even stop to get a cloak. She followed him right outside and gasped in delight to see Kalira standing at the door, shining in the lamplight. Is he really all right? she asked the companion, much to Lan's amusement. Kalira snorted and bobbed her head, and Macy carefully approached her. With great delicacy and care, Macy separated out individual hairs to pull, gathering them carefully into a thin, silvery hank. Long before Lan had thought she would be satisfied, she patted Kalira's neck and said, Thank you, thank you so much, and stepped back. I'll save the hair from her curry comb for you, Lan promised, tucking the embroidered patch into a pocket and mounting and I'll remind you. Will you? Thank you, Lan. Can I come visit you? She was the only person who had shown any real interest in visiting him, and even if it was more to see Kalira than to see him, Lan was touched. Surely. Give me some warning so I can make time in my classes, but absolutely. He found himself warming unexpectedly to her and looking forward to her visit. I will. Thank you again. I've got to go in. I'm about to freeze. She flashed him another smile and darted back inside the door. A trifle bemused by this unanticipated epilogue to the feast, he and Kalira turned away from the door and started up the street toward the park. I hope your midwinter feast was more fun than mine, he said to her, breathing in air that wasn't overheated and too heavily scented for the first time that evening. I wish yours had been as enjoyable as mine she replied with sympathy. Never mind, we'll be back with Took tomorrow, and you'll have... Her head came up, startled, as people suddenly emerged from both sides of the street to block their way. Deliberately. Kalira paused, but Lan felt her gathering herself for a leap or a run, or both. A woman with an angry, tear-streaked face stepped forward, her clothing was mourning of the deepest, most complete black to the least button and bit of embroidery, and very rich. She looked up at him as if at a monster. Are you Lavin Chitwood? she asked in a harsh voice. He nodded. Yes, lady, I am. She stepped forward again and seized Kalira's reins. You murdered my son! She snarled as Kalira shied and tried to dance away from her. She held on with the strength of the demented. Murderer, she continued savagely.
I know not how, but you killed my boy, my tyrant, and I will have justice, no matter what the guard may say. Lan sat frozen with shock. Kalira's wide eyes and twitching muscles seemed to indicate that she was, too. Torn between fear and guilt, his heart pounded and his head began to ache. Apparently, the people with her had not anticipated this sort of confrontation, or perhaps they had not anticipated that Lan would turn out to be a heraldic trainee. A tall man with Tyron's square jaw and blonde hair, wearing clothing that was a match with the woman's, stepped out of the crowd and took her elbow. Leave it, Gisette, he hissed at her. You're overwrought. Can't you see that this is a companion? A companion with a murderer? she sneered. This is just a trick. His family thinks they can fool everyone by tricking him out with a uniform and a white horse, but they can't fool me. Her eyes showed the whites all around, and she shook Kalira's reins furiously. I know better, liar, slanderer, murderer, murderer! The man looked both at her and at Lan doubtfully, not sure whether to believe her. Lan felt as if he was going to have to double over from the pain behind his eyes, and that terrible red mist began to creep over his vision. He knew, he knew what was coming, and he wouldn't be able to stop it. But that seemed to shake Kalira out of her shocked trance. I think not, she said crisply, and with a toss of her head, somehow slipped out of the bridle entirely. She ducked her head and whirled, leaving the woman with the empty bridle in her hands, and before Lan had any idea of what she was doing, she was pounding back down the way they had come, leaving the Jelnak entourage uselessly blocking the street. The surprise of her action jolted Lan out of his paralysis, and as he lurched forward he seized her mane to steady himself. As soon as he had gotten a double handful, she changed direction, quick as a cat, dashing down an unfamiliar street. His stomach spasmed, and his head pounded, but the mist faded as she changed direction again. This time she raced down a broad street meant for huge cargo wagons, which was as empty now as an avenue through a cemetery. Her hooves rang on the cobblestones, but there were no noises of anyone following, and when she came to a dead end, she slowed and finally stopped. Hush and hold still, she ordered. There was an odd sort of snap in his head, a single stab of pain from one temple to the other. Then his headache was gone completely, and with it the cramps and heaving of his gut. There, she sighed gustily. And don't you even dare think that crazed woman might be right. You are not a murderer, and if you ask me, it's pretty easy to tell where Tyron learned how to be a sadistic manipulator. Lan, who'd had his mouth open to say something of the sort, shut it. And no buts out of you either, Kalira continued, shaking her head angrily. Miserable woman, I wish I'd had something to leave on her shoes. The unsubtle image that accompanied that was enough to get a feeble chuckle out of him. She snickered. Never mind. We'll see what that family has to say when the guard comes tomorrow to charge her with stealing my bridle. She'll have a hard time convincing anyone that I'm not a companion then. She turned and proceeded at a walk back to a cross street. I hope they lock her up as a madwoman. It would serve her right. Now... Let's go home. She picked up her pace to a trot and took a long and complicated route back to the palace. It was after midnight when they entered the palace gate, and although Lan wanted to take off her tack and groom her himself, she ordered him to bed. We're leaving in the morning so that you don't have to have anything to do with those wretched people, she told him. You'll need all your sleep. He wrapped his cloak tightly around him and trudged up the pathways to the collegium. He was quite, quite certain he wasn't going to get that sleep. By now the fire in his room would have burned out even though he had banked it, and the room would be icy, and he couldn't rid himself of the certainty that Tyron's mother was right. But when he opened his door, warmth met him. And there was a mug with a note on it from Eleanor, ordering him to drink what was in the mug or suffer unspecified consequences. 
Evidently, Kalira had been having some choice words with someone. He was too tired, mentally, emotionally, and physically, to argue with anyone. He hung up the formal greys, drank the mug, and crawled into his bed. And the next thing he knew, it was morning. Fifteen. Accompanied by two guardsmen on horseback, Paul rode Saturan down into the quarter where the Jelnak household had their imposing home. Lan was well on his way to the Chester farm by now, but before he had left, Paul had gotten an earful from Kalira via her sire. He had a clear and precise picture of what had really happened. As Kalira had said so venomously, companions did not have the luxury of forgetfulness. As a consequence of last night's debacle, Paul had called an emergency meeting among interested parties that included himself, the Seneschal, Captain Telemane, and King's own Jeddon, thus covering all authorities. To his great relief, even the captain was full of righteous indignation at the Jelnak's high-handed assumption of authority, after the guard had already made it clear that the case was closed. As a consequence, Telemane had been only too ready to assign him a pair of escorts to reinforce his authority. Harold Jeddon had been ready to go himself along with Paul, and would have, had his presence not been required by the king. As for the Seneschal, even Greeley agreed that the Jelnex had to be dealt with, and swiftly. If one powerful family flaunted the law and the authorities and got away with it, others might well decide to make their own laws as well. When that started, it could end with feuds and blood in the street. The one good thing that had come out of this disgraceful episode was that Kalira had amply demonstrated her ability to control Lan's fire-starting gift. In fact, she had more than controlled it, but explaining that as well as the how of it would have only confused the non-heralds. Paul had promised Jeddon that he would give him an explanation later, but hadn't specified a time. Knowing Jeddon, though, he could expect to be interrupted at almost any time with a demand for information. Paul, are you there yet? Are you busy? As he had expected, it was Jeddon right on cue. Paul suppressed a smile in spite of how angry he was with the Jelnax. Not even halfway. Everyone and his horse seems to be out on the street this morning. I suppose we can blame all the midwinter fairs outside the walls for that. It's not enough any more to go to the one nearest you. Evidently the current fashion is to see all of them and clog the streets in doing so. I take it you have a moment for that explanation? Please. Jeddon had one powerful advantage as a mind-speaker. He had Roland for a companion, who could boost his powers to an unmeasured extent. He could, if he chose, probably reach any herald within the borders of the entire country of Valdemar at need. According to Kalira, Lavin's gift has only two modes, completely inactive and full force. Whether that was because of the way his gift was forced, or for some other reason she doesn't know. And at the moment he can't consciously call it up. It only manifests when he's threatened, and it's linked to his emotions. The angrier or more frightened he is, the quicker it rouses, and the stronger it is. Paul waited courteously for a donkey cart to cross in front of him as Jeddin digested this. So his gift obviously manifested last night and Kalira knew that if she let anything leak, the Jelnax would know that Lavin had started the fires that killed those wretched boys. So she had to help him keep it clamped down, and that was why she ended the confrontation by slipping her bridle and running. Ah, very wise of her. Jeddon had evidently been puzzled about that. It was unlike even a trainee to abandon a confrontation when calling for help would have brought reinforcements within a reasonable time, and running could confirm doubts or accelerate a dubious situation. But Jeddon now thought of the obvious ramifications of Kalira's actions. If Kalira was helping him keep his power damned, he must have been in agony. He was, and when she got him safe, she took care of that too. She bridged all that pent-up force into herself all at once, 
like a bolt of lightning. It was the only way to clear it quickly. He felt Jedin's involuntary wince of pain. She did what? I don't want to think about that too hard. Neither did he. She only told me that companions are just made to deal with things like that. She didn't seem to have taken any harm from it. Thank the gods they are. Well, I'm satisfied to learn the whys and wherefores of his gift, and what Kalira can do with it. If she can handle what happened last night, she can handle him whatever happens. Thank you for the explanation. With the king's own satisfied, the king would shortly be informed of what had transpired, and that would lend Paul the full authority to say and do whatever was required in the next candlemark or so. He wasn't going to do anything to bend or even stretch the law, but he was going to assume a great deal of authority. All things considered, he hoped he would be able to dump the really unpleasant duties on Gisette Jelnak's own family members. He was certainly going to try, at any rate. The midwinter fairs started the day after the midwinter feast and ran for the next seven days. Most folk who could afford to took the day after midwinter feast as an additional holiday from work, which was probably wise given the amount of food and drink that was consumed the day before. It was supposed to be the children's day. This was when they got their presents, usually waiting on a table for them in the morning. Perhaps the entire custom of giving the children their gifts now instead of at the end of the fortnight, when the adults exchanged presents, was to keep them quiet while their elders recovered from their overindulgence. At any rate, Paul could count on the entire Jelnak clan being at home, which was why he had not wanted to delay his confrontation. The house in question was hard to miss. Instead of being decked in green garlands, it was swathed, windows and doors and the gate in front, in sad swags of black mourning. Paul's mouth twisted, and he felt as if he had bitten something sour. Given what they and everyone else involved surely now knew that Tyron had been like, such over-ostentatious mourning was in questionable taste. He rode to the gate, waited for one of his escort to open it, and rode into the minuscule front court. The guard who had dismounted led his horse to the front door, and while Paul waited, still mounted on Saturan, the guard pounded three times on the door with the pommel of his sword. It was shockingly loud. It was meant to be. The door flew open, and an angry manservant stood there. Clearly, he had been about to deliver a scathing dismissal to whoever it was that had pounded so rudely on the door, but when he saw not one but two guards and a herald, he was so overcome with shock that he just stood there, hand half-raised, mouth hanging open. Is this the house of the master silversmith, Jelnak? the guard asked sternly. The manservant nodded dumbly. And is he the husband of the lady Gisette Jelnak? the guard continued, frowning. Y yes sir said the manservant at last. W would you care to come in? I would not, the guard snapped. There is a serious charge of theft and endangerment to be laid, and you will summon them here this instant. If they will not appear of their own accord instantly, the charges of evading the king's justice and resisting the king's officer will be added to those already accumulated and leave the door open. By now, there were eyes at every window in the neighborhood, and likely ears pressed to cracks in the fence. There are, Saturon confirmed. I do believe we are more entertaining at this moment than the prospect of going to the fair. Good. Paul was counting on public humiliation to force the rest of the family to deal sharply and decisively with Gisette, who, according to Kalira, was the ringleader last night. The manservant fled, and in a surprisingly short time, returned with a man and a woman clothed head to toe in black. The man pushed to the front, and Paul could tell from his expression that he was going to try to bluster and bluff first. There must be some mistake, he began. There is no mistake, Paul said, using the authoritative voice, a skill all bards and most heralds mastered. 
Last night, in the presence of many of your household, you and your wife unlawfully detained and accused a heraldic trainee, one Lavin Chitwood. You endangered his safety, threatened him, and stole the formal bridal of his companion, said object made of blue leather and adorned with silver fittings and silver bridal bells, engraved with his companion's name, said object being worth twenty crowns. I should think that as a master silversmith you would recognize this article I have just described. Do you deny this? I should warn you that if you do deny this, I have the authority to have the truth from you by means of the truth spell. The blood drained from Master Jelnak's face. He knew now he wasn't going to be able to bully or bluff his way out of the situation. He also knew that now every neighbor knew what his household had been up to last night. Cast your spell, Harold, Gisette said shrilly, pushing past her husband despite his efforts to keep her out of the way and quiet. That creature you claim as a trainee murdered my son and slandered him after his death. Nothing you can say will make me believe otherwise. I demand justice. The blood of my son demands justice. You, lady, have already gotten justice for your son. Paul told her angrily. Whether you believe it or not, it's no odds. Your son tortured and abused dozens of smaller, younger children for his own pleasure, forced them to act as his servants and even steal for him. The only person to be blamed for his death is Tyron Jelnak. Had he not been the kind of sadistic bully he was, he would be alive now. And you, he concluded again in the voice, seeing that Gisette was about to launch into a tirade. You will be silent. The use of the voice, directed at her and only at her, and with all the force of Paul's minor gift of empathic projection behind it, struck her dumb. Now he turned to Master Jelnak. I am sorry that your son's death has so clearly deranged your wife's mind he continued crisply, and given that it is obvious that she is not thinking clearly or able to act rationally, the Crown may be willing to drop the charges, provided the bridal is returned, and that you are able to demonstrate your ability to keep your wife under control until her clarity of thought returns. I must say that I am very much surprised and disappointed that she was able to sway all of you to believe in her delusions. But now that you know the truth, I trust you will treat her fantasy as it deserves to be treated, and ignore it. Master Jelnak had seemingly also lost his power of speech, but he did not. He swallowed once or twice, then half turned and whispered something to the manservant, who vanished. Saturan stamped decisively. I must warn you that if you fail to keep this afflicted lady from acting on her delusions, she will have to be confined by the crown, he continued, and of course the charges will be reinstated. I believe you know better than I what such a reinstatement would mean to your reputation and career. If it had been possible for Master Jelnak to grow any paler, he would have. Paul knew very well what would happen. With even a charge of theft laid against him, Jelnak would lose his position as guildmaster. Jelnak clamped his hand on his wife's wrist and pulled her behind him. We'll see to it that she is watched over and gets proper treatment, he said fervently. I'll talk to the healers myself. See to it that you do, Paul replied, remaining stony-faced as the manservant reappeared with the bridle. With a wave of his hand, he directed the guard at the door to accept it. Then he backed up Saturan a pace, turned him, and led the way out of the courtyard into the street. The mounted guard followed, then the last guard mounted his horse and took up the rear. Master Jelnak watched them leave silently, afraid to make any show that might be interpreted as disrespect until they were out of the court. Only then did he close the door very, very gently. There wasn't a sound in the street. If it hadn't been for all the watchers, Paul could have believed that there wasn't a soul about. The hooves of the two guards' horses clicked on the stones. Saturans made that distinctive chiming sound that only companions produced. 
I would have said that you were too hard on him, except that he should have figured out last night that Lan really was a trainee, Satteron remarked. I mean, really, a silver-worked bridle, the sound of Calera's hoofs. You can't counterfeit those. If he'd had any sense, he would have been at the herald's gate with the bridle in his hands, begging for forgiveness within a candle mark of Lan's return. Paul sniffed. The only reason I wasn't harder on them is because I don't want to push things too far. They would be within their right to demand that Lan undergo truth spell, and then the cat would be out of the bag. Satteron put his ears back. Huh? I hadn't thought of that. That would be messy. Paul wished he'd dared to take the woman into custody there and then, and turn her over to the healers, in protective custody, of course, with a guard on her. He couldn't explain why, but he neither trusted her nor felt he could depend on her husband to keep her out of mischief. She was clever and entirely used to getting her own way. That was a bad combination. But he'd done all he could for the moment. Keeping Lan away from family celebrations was the only other thing he could think of to do. That won't be difficult, Satteron retorted. I think it would be harder to force him to go. The Chesters had made a second and much more palatable feast for Lan. He was greeted as enthusiastically as if he had been gone for a month, and when he walked into the cottage a dozen delicious odors hit his nose and nearly bowled him over. It was clear from the preparations that they were not going to feed him with leftovers. He was doubly, triply glad now that on the way here he'd stopped to use the midwinter gift of money his mother had sent to his room at the Collegium this morning, another guilt offering, perhaps, to buy gifts for everyone in the Chester household, from Granny on down. There was a midwinter fair in full swing outside the gate he'd left by, and he'd taken great care in selecting things he thought would please. He presented them now, straight from the packs, in part to let their pleasure help erase the bitter memory of last night. I've got a few things for you all to thank you for opening your home to me, he said as he passed them out, casually hoping that they would not think themselves obliged to respond in kind. I hope you like them. Granny, these looked useful to me for stitching in the winter, he continued, handing Granny a set of gloves with cut-off fingers that left the last joint uncovered, made of shira wool. He'd observed her rubbing her knuckles and wrists as if they ached, and he wondered if something like this would help. She tried them on, looking puzzled at first, and then delighted as the warmth penetrated her hands without impeding her dexterity. And I know that these will help you, Ma. This time what he handed out were another sort of gloves, or rather mittens, with leather palms, the kind that some smiths who worked very small pieces used to handle hot metal. She saw what they were intended for immediately. Oh, just the thing for handling hot pans and things from the oven, she exclaimed happily. Yet another set of gloves for Podchester came out of the pack, this time work gloves thickly padded on the back, with rough leather palms triple stitched to prevent tools from slipping. These had been quite new to Lan, and from the admiration with which Pa regarded them, they were new to him. Why didn't someone think of this before? he asked rhetorically, passing them to Ma and Granny to see. Brilliant! These are just brilliant! For the girls, Lan had brought various trinkets. A box of brightly colored or pearly shells from Lake Evendim to be made into ornaments and jewelry, a box of glass beads for the same purpose, a bunch of ribbons and a hank of lace. Those were for the three oldest and for the two youngest girls, doll heads of wax over porcelain, to replace the battered featureless heads of two of their own dolls. Both little girls immediately rushed to their room to pick out the dolls to have the transplant. Glass and stone marbles in a pouch for the youngest boy, and new pocket knives for Tuck's three older brothers, each of whom solemnly presented him with a groat in exchange, in order that the knife not be a gift for it was held that the gift of a knife would cut the friendship. And last of all, for Tuck, not a pocket knife, but a real dagger.
Lan knew good steel when he saw it, and this dagger had been the outstanding example in a collection of lackluster second-hand blades. Tuck took it with his mouth dropping open, and almost forgot to get a groat to give him in return. You'll probably get your whites long before I do, and I want you to have something to remind you that I'm still getting belabored by the weapons master, Lan joked. Tuck's radiant smile told him he'd picked the right present. Well, now let's cup this by a good meal, Ma Chester said heartily. Tis only a stewed bird, that nasty old hen that pecked at the girls one too many times, but I reckon revenge will make her tasty. Lan couldn't believe that the hen had ever been old, for the meat fell off the bones and all the fixins that Ma had made to go with her were just as good. Lan ate with a much heartier appetite than he had yesterday, and when the dishes were cleared away and cleaned, he and Tuck went out for a ride before milking. Pa had promised to teach him how to milk. It looked like a very soothing sort of occupation, saying that no learning was ever wasted, and he might need to know how to sometime. So was your midwinter face really horrid? Tuck asked sympathetically. It wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. I surprised my parents with the formal grace. Most of the family didn't know what to think of me, but the younglings thought I was the best entertainment they'd ever had. With a sigh, he urged Kalira into a canter, hoping that Tuck wouldn't ask any further questions. He didn't want to talk about the Jelnax or to set Jelnax accusations. There was just enough truth in what she'd said to make him sick with guilt. No matter what, there was one thing that was irrefutable. If he had not lost control of his power, no one would be dead. It might have been an accident, but it was still because of him that it had happened. Tuck didn't ask any more questions. Instead, he turned the conversation to what Lan wanted to do in the next few days. Well, the first thing I want is a good gallop, Lan replied. What? So the wind can play a tune whistling through your ears? Tuck teased, and without warning he set off in the lead. The one thing he didn't have to worry about was that either companion would step in a hole and break a leg. They seemed to know exactly what lay under the snow and never put a foot wrong. Kalira stretched out her neck and went into her top speed. Lan tucked his head down and held on for dear life, his heart pounding with excitement. It was wonderful, and just as wonderful, he had to concentrate on the mechanics of riding and couldn't think of anything else. He wanted it to last forever. It couldn't, of course, but if he'd had his way, it would have. When they finally returned to the farmhouse, Tuck filled up the silence with cheerful chatter of his own, mostly about past winters and the prodigies that had occurred. If we're really lucky, we'll get snowed in and get a couple more days of holiday, he said, as they brought their companions into the barn for a thorough grooming. And I think you'll not, young jackanapes, said Pa Chester from the back of the barn, where he was readying the stalls for the cows. Never have heard of a snow so heavy young companions couldn't get through, so don't be thinking you can cousin more free days that way. Oh, Pa, Tuck moaned. And none of that, neither. If there be a blizzard, I'll be calling on you both to give me the truth of what your companions have to say about it. Pa Chester came out of the stall and winked. Now I'm thinking you'd best get these fine ladies taken care of for the night, eh? Yes, Pa, they both said obediently, and made sure that both of the ladies were groomed to the sheen of silver and well provided for. Now, Lan! Pa called as the cows filed into the barn all on their own. It was a wonder to Lan that they could be trusted to come in out of the pasture all by themselves when milking time came, and each would go into her own stall and not that of another. Pa beckoned from the stall of a fine brown cow with a white blaze on her nose. Come ye here! Obediently, Lan gave Kalira a pat and went to the stall where Pa Chester waited. This un be brownie! The farmer gave his charge a fond pat. Lan had already noticed that the names of the cattle did not show much imagination, but then it didn't seem likely that a cow would ever demonstrate enough personality to require an imaginative name. Now set ye down on this stool and I'll show ye the trick of it, 
Brownie's a good girl, she won't be kicking the pail over nor trying to slap your face with her tail. Be gentle with her and she'll be patient with ye. Pa Chester directed Lan to put his hands atop the farmer's so he could feel how the milk should be coaxed from the udder with firm, steady, pulling strokes. Then he let Lan take over and after a couple of fumbles, Lan found that he was milking just as well as Pa had. He leaned his forehead against Brownie's warm flank, breathing in the scent of fresh straw and warm milk, and watched the white streams hiss into the pail. It was somehow a very soothing experience, though by the time he'd filled the pail and Brownie had nothing more to give, he discovered that his hands were tired and a little sore. He brought the pail to Pa Chester, who took it with a grin after a quick glance inside to measure the level by eye. Good lad, you've a natural hand for it, I see. Fingers sore? Lan nodded, flexing them. That's expected. Takes practice, just like anything else. Think you can do another? Lan took a glance around and saw that Tuck had already joined his brothers at the chore, so he nodded, and Pa Chester gave him a new, clean pail and carried off the full one to the dairy house. Lan got his stool from Brownie's stall and wondered which cow he should try next. Take Swan, she's gentle but watch her tail, Tuck called. Lan looked around at the nameplates until he found one for Swan with a white cow munching hay in the stall beneath it. He approached the heifer, making some soothing noises he'd heard the others make, and when she looked around at him with mild, curious brown eyes, he put one hand on her haunches and ran it along her side. He put his stool down beside her and got into position. Just as he got his hands on her udder, something warned him to turn his head aside, and as he did, he caught a blow in the back of his head that stung. Hey, he said indignantly, as the cow turned her head guilelessly to look at him again. What was that about? Warm your hands up, she hates cold hands, one of the other boys said. Well, how would you like cold hands on you there? I don't have a there. Lan retorted, but he saw the point, and stuck his hands in his armpits until they were warmed up. This time, when he tried his luck, Swan sighed and let down her milk for him. He milked one more cow before his hands refused to cooperate any more, but by then most of the milking was finished anyway. He went into the dairy and washed up, then helped to pour the pans for rising. Pa and Ma insisted on a scrupulously clean dairy. Dinner was concocted from the leftovers of the noon meal, but the food was no less tasty for coming around the second time. After dinner, one of the older boys showed Lan how to carve using the old pocket knife that Lan's gift had replaced, and he spent the remainder of the evening whittling on what he hoped would be a reasonable boat for Tuck's youngest brother. This time Tuck took the turn at reading, and did a tolerable job at it. Granny kept holding up her warm hands to admire her fingerless gloves, which tickled him considerably, and before everyone went off to bed, Ma produced an apple pie and a wedge of cheese for a treat. When Lan and Tuck went up to bed, though, Lan kept staring into the darkness, thinking about Gisette Jelnak, unable to sleep. Stop thinking so loud, Tuck whispered finally. You're keeping me awake. Am I really? Lan whispered back, startled. Well, not thinking loud. I'm not that good a mind speaker. But you are keeping me awake. What's wrong? Was it something that happened back in Haven? Tuck's acuity startled Lan. He hadn't expected that sort of insight from his friend. You might as well tell me. If I don't get it out of you myself, Calera will tell Dasari and Dasari will tell me. Isn't there anything secret to them? Lan replied, both irritated and touched by his concern. No, get used to it, Tuck replied promptly. Now spit it out so we can both get some sleep. Slowly, reluctantly, Lan told him what had happened when he and Kalira had been waylaid by the Jelnax, and for the first time he told someone besides Paul just what had happened that night in the school. What's bothering me is that she's right. I am responsible. Huh? Tuck didn't immediately launch into assurance, which in a curious way comforted him more than that assurance would have. He wasn't going to give Lan a comforting answer just because he was Lan's friend. All right, I can see your point. 
and you are responsible. I mean, if they'd been picking on someone other than you, nothing would have happened. But that doesn't mean that the old bag is right either. You're not a murderer. How am I not? He began, then stopped. Because I didn't intend to kill them? Right, and maybe that seems like an era... era... Tuck searched for the word he wanted. Irrelevant, Lan suggested. Right, that kind of difference. But it's not. It's a big difference. Tuck sounded quite sure of himself, and a moment later Lan found out why. I've had first-level judgment, and in the law there's a big difference. There's premeditated murder, and that's where the guy plans it out and goes and does it in cold blood, on purpose. Then there's simple murder, where maybe the guy gets into a fight with someone and instead of backing off, gets a weapon out and kills the other guy. Now that didn't happen with you, because you've never got a chance to defend yourself, and you were ganged up on. That's the law, so you aren't a murderer. Tuck was so sure of himself that Lan began to believe him. So what am I? he asked, uncertainly. I'm working that out. Give a fellow a moment. I haven't even gotten a test on this yet. Tuck replied a little crossly. Now, what's next? Silence in the darkness, then... Ah, got it. There's manslaughter, where a guy kills someone by accident, but that isn't you either, because it has to be someone helpless. And that toad tyrant wasn't helpless, you were. So what that leaves is accidental death in self-defense. Solid self-satisfaction filled Tuck's voice. That's the one that fits you, all right. You were the helpless one. You got ganged up on. They wouldn't let you go. And they were going to hurt you a lot. You couldn't help it if your gift got away from you. Heck, fire, you didn't even know what it was, and you hadn't got any training in it. How could you do anything with it? And how could anybody expect you to? I don't know. Lan was still troubled, but Tuck wasn't listening to him. He was plowing straight ahead as if this was just another classroom exercise. Yeah, that's it. And the law says not guilty. That's the law. You can't hold somebody responsible for what happens when they're pushed to the edge and things get out of hand. Now Tuck seemed to recollect that Lan was the subject of this exercise, and his voice took on a coaxing tone. Honest, Lan. I'm positive on this one. Cross my heart. I told you, Calera seconded. Now you've heard it from me, from Paul, and from Tuck. Would you like me to ask Roland's opinion? I already know that Jeddon would agree with Tuck, and for that matter, so does the king. Lan gulped. The king? The king knew about him? But when it all came down to it, it was Tuck, honest, clear-minded, transparent Tuck who convinced him. Tuck couldn't lie if he wanted to. It was as if a permanent truth spell was working on him. And Tuck was convinced of his innocence. I think I'm still going to feel horrid, he ventured. Well, you'd be a miserable dog if you didn't, Tuck retorted. And I wouldn't be your friend anymore. But you don't have to feel guilty. So let's get some sleep. Morning comes early around here. All right, he replied. Thanks, Tuck. No problem, Tuck mumbled, already half asleep. Lan yawned, closed his eyes, and after a few moments more of thought followed Tuck's example. 16. When everyone got back to the collegium and back to lessons, no one said a word to Lan about his encounter at midwinter. Lan breathed a great deal easier when it looked as if no one had heard a word about it. He really didn't want to say more to anyone than he had to. If the entire collegium and circle chose to ignore what had happened, he was perfectly happy to go along with that. As classes resumed, he found himself absorbed more and more into the life of the collegium. Tuck's circle of friends accepted him without question. He often ran into Eleanor on walks or visiting her father. She had taken a great interest in him, probably because of her specialty. He reckoned that to a mind healer he must be fascinating, given all of the horrible things that had happened to him. She was a nice girl, though, and didn't make it obvious, and she was good company. 
Of all the places where he had lived, he felt most at home and happiest here. Even if he didn't always enjoy his classes, there were none he disliked, and most he found fascinating. And above all things, there was Kalira. She was more wonderful every day. He often thought that he could happily live in a desert as long as she was with him. The third week after midwinter, he returned to his room to find a message waiting for him from his sister Macy. She wanted to pay him that promised visit. Since the day after the next one was where he usually had a free afternoon, he dashed off a quick reply to that effect and made sure that he still did have that time free. Not only did he have it, but Tuck did as well, and his friend volunteered to wait with him at the gate for Macy's arrival. So the two of them waded through fresh snow up to their knees on the appointed afternoon, with more snow gently falling all around them. It was a particularly pretty, fluffy snow, falling through air that felt deceptively warm, covering bushes and coating the limbs of the trees. Daylight, filtered through the clouds and falling snow, seemed to come from everywhere, gentle, soft, and pure. As they passed the palace proper, courtiers and highborn were spread throughout the gardens, with the more high-spirited engaging in snow fights while the rest admired the scenery. Their handsome cloaks and coats of every possible hue, ornamented with fur and embroidery, made a fine show in the falling snow. The younger women, the queen's handmaidens, dressed in various shades of blue ornamented with white fur and silver embroidery, watched and whispered among themselves as their suitors and would-be suitors showed off by pitching snowballs at targets and, occasionally, each other. Ha! Tuck said, amused. They wouldn't think it was such fun if they couldn't duck back into the nice warm palace and have servants rush up to them with dry clothes. Probably not. Lan agreed. But you know there's no harm in them enjoying it either. Nothing better than a good snowstorm when you've got a nice fire in front of you. And who was it wanted to get us snowbound back home? Dunno, Tuck replied, trying to look innocent and failing utterly. They passed the formal gardens and the kitchen gardens, where the vegetable and herb beds, protected under mounds of straw, now had a smooth, insulating blanket of undisturbed snow on them that brought them up to the boys' waists. No one would dare plunder the kitchen gardens for snow or snowballs, not even during the hottest battle. The cooks and their helpers would have served a fricassee of the culprit's ears for dinner afterward. A scraper pulled by a team of horses was clearing the road to the gate just as the boys got there, so the last part of their journey was on a cleared paving. The gate guard was warming his feet at Brazier when they arrived and greeted them cordially. Sister, eh? the guard said when they explained their errand. Older or younger? A young man, well-muscled and good-natured, not terribly handsome, but not ugly either. He obviously was not averse to a bit of flirting with a trainee's sister. Younger, Lan replied, and the guard feigned disappointment, shaking his head so that snow that had accumulated on his fur cap fell around him in little clumps. And you've none older, he persisted, grinning hopefully. No chance there might be two sisters coming instead of one. He doesn't, but I do, Tuck spoke up. Two older sisters, very pretty, or so I'm told, and very friendly. And I might see my way clear to introducing them if you'd look the other way when I come in late some night. The guard laughed and shook his head reprovingly at Tuck. No use asking me to do that, he chuckled. The ones they pick for night watch are all older fellows with daughters of their own, probably daughters the same age as your sisters. They don't take kindly to lads who want to sneak out of town for a bit of fun and overstay their curfew. Tuck sighed gustily. Just my luck he complained aloud. I think I've finally got a use for the girls, and it turns out they still don't do me any good. Lan interrupted any further complaints. There she is now, he exclaimed, waving as he recognized Macy in her brown wool cloak, edged with fox fur, driving up the road in a hired pony cart painted red. She handled the reins quite neatly, but then back at Alderscroft, she had done a great deal of the marketing in her own little two-wheeled cart when their mother was too busy or too deep in a project to go. She waved back, but didn't urge the pony to go any faster. Then again, she might already have discovered that it was difficult to get a hired beast out of a fast walk.
Both pony and cart were plain and reliable, and exactly the sort of conveyance that Lan would have expected her to pick for herself. You didn't tell me she was pretty, Tuck exclaimed, his green eyes as round as gooseberries, just before she got within earshot. Lan didn't bother with the obvious answer that it hadn't occurred to him. It also hadn't occurred to him that Tuck might be smitten with his sister. He certainly hadn't had that reaction with any of Tuck's siblings. What a thought, Tuck taking a fancy to Macy. I wonder if she's likely to fancy him back. Wouldn't that be one in Mother's eye? I reckon she's got her mind set on wedding Macy off to some guildmaster's son or even a highborn. Smitten or not, Tuck had recovered completely by the time Macy brought the cart to a halt in front of the gate and got out to let the guard inspect her cart and its contents. Tuck introduced himself, jaunty as ever, without waiting for Lan to do the honors. Oh, you're the trainee he was visiting, Macy said in recognition, tucking her dark auburn curls under her hood. That was awfully nice of you. I wish I had someone to go stay with over the holidays. It got quite horrible at times, with all the children getting into fights over toys, Granny complaining and passing judgment on everything and everybody, and Mother wanting me to run errands for everybody, and never mind what I was already doing. She sighed. I want a holiday like we used to have, without cramming more relations into the house than it can hold. Sounds right miserable, Tuck sympathized. Instead of getting back in the cart when the guard finished his inspection and waved her inside the palace walls, she led the pony forward. Mother had another guild meeting at the house, and Cook baked an indecent number of honey cakes for it, she said to both boys as Tuck and Lan walked on either side of her. There were piles of leftovers, so I thought you and your friends might as well get the benefit of Mother trying to impress the other guild members. Lan caught the not-so-faint hint of exasperation in Macy's voice with surprise. Evidently, his sister was getting tired of their mother's obvious attempts at social climbing. I wish she'd go back to designing and stitching and spend less time, or should I say, waste less time, toadying to anyone with any influence, Macy concluded. I'm tired of having to dress up and interrupt my work to help hand around trays. I'm tired of interrupting my work to go run errands. I can understand that, Lan said soothingly. Maybe what you ought to do is spend more time at the guild hall with the other apprentices instead. If you aren't there at hand in the house, if you're actually in a lesson with another guild member, she can't drag you into helping when you should be learning. It would be dreadfully bad manners to take you away from a lesson with someone that might be her peer or superior. And if there's one thing Mother won't do... It's display bad manners. That's a good idea, Macy mused, brushing aside her hair with one hand as she led the placid pony with the other. I mean, when we were back at Aldersgroft, there wasn't anyone else to learn from but her, and nowhere else to work but at home, and that's not the case here. Lan smiled. You might even learn something she can't teach you. She doesn't know every technique, after all. I've never seen her knit a great deal, for instance. Macy laughed and changed the subject. She doesn't know fancy braiding. I learned that all by myself, which reminds me, here. She reached into a pocket of her coat and pulled out a shining white seamless band. Here, this is for you, she said. I made it from Kalira's hair. That's what I wanted it for. Lan took it. The intricate braiding amazed him, and he literally could not see where the ends of each horsehair were. It looked to be about the size for a bracelet, and he slipped it on over his wrist, smiling to feel Kalira's hair lying smoothly against his skin. See? Mother doesn't know how to do that. Macy was quite pleased with herself. I made a set for myself, and everyone who sees it wants one. Lan laughed. Don't think you can make a business out of this, he warned. We can't have you denuding our companions of hair just so silly women can wear jewelry made from it. Macy laughed, too. I don't intend to make it from companion hair. I'm going to see if I can't braid it from horse hair and silk yarn. I don't think everyone should have companion hair. It's too special for that. Maybe fine silver wire, Tuck suggested speculatively. Wire that fine would cost you, though. True, but it's a good suggestion. Macy beamed on him, and Tuck basked in her approval. I could practice on copper at first. 
The maids would probably appreciate my practice pieces. How much of the Collegium do you want to see? Lan asked as they neared the stables for the ordinary horses. We can leave the pony and cart here and come get them when you're ready to go home. All of it, was Macy's reply. So show her all of it they did, from one end to the other, stopping at Lan's room to leave the laundry basket of honey cakes she'd brought him, for she really had not exaggerated the amount of leftovers. There would certainly be a merry little party in their section of the students' quarters tonight. Macy was suitably impressed, and their friends were in turn quite taken with her. Lan lost no opportunity to display her handiwork, and she left with several skeins of companion hair, each neatly labeled, and the commission to make more bracelets like Lan's. The companions were just as taken with the notion as their chosen, and quite insisted that she get more than she needed, even though it meant pulling perfect hairs afresh. Can I see Healers and Bardic, too? Macy asked when their tour was over. Lan scratched his head. I don't know anyone in Bardic, but there's someone in Healers who could probably show us around, if she isn't busy, he said. Let's go find out. Tuck was not willing to let Macy do without his escort as well, so he came along as a willing third as they hiked across the grounds to Healers Collegium. When they reached the building and stepped inside, Macy looked around with great interest. In the interest of cleanliness over anything else, the floors and walls were tiled in pale green ceramic, and the lighting was all accomplished with glass-chimneyed oil lamps. Healers was a bit different from Harold's Collegium in that there were not as many structured classes as such. Instead, the trainees did a great deal of study on their own and worked directly with the teachers, one at a time in each specialty, until they found the one they were best suited to. As a consequence, there were not many classrooms, but there were a number of rooms in which animals suffering from various injuries and illnesses were housed. In the earliest stages of their training, trainee healers were rarely allowed to work on human patients, instead tending to animals brought to the Collegium by their owners. This aspect of the Collegium made it very popular with farmers and pet owners, and there was never a lack of subjects for them to learn their craft on. Even wild animals were sometimes brought here for tending. Somehow, instead of resembling a crazed blend of barnyard and zoo, there was very little evidence of what these rooms were for out in the hallway. Peace and quiet reigned, with only the occasional call, bark, or whistle to show that the place was full of birds and animals. And as far as scent went, the stalls and cages were kept so scrupulously clean, as were the patients, that the only aroma was that of the clean straw used for their bedding, overlaid with the scent of herbs used to repel vermin. Lan motioned for Tuck and Macy to stay near the entrance, while he asked several teachers or trainees if any of them knew where Eleanor was. As luck would have it, she was not far off at that very moment, and since the teacher in question was going in her direction anyway, he promised to tell her of Lan's arrival. Lan thanked him profusely as he bustled off. They didn't wait long. Lan spotted Eleanor at the end of the hallway, hurrying toward them with a bright and expectant expression, and he waved at her. As she neared and saw he wasn't alone, for some reason she faltered, and her face lost some of its brightness. Eleanor, Lan called. You know my friend Tuck, and this is my sister Macy. Macy wanted to get a tour of healers. Do you have time to give us one, or could you find us someone who can? Your sister? was Eleanor's reply. Not Tuck's. I thought Tuck was the one with all the sisters. It was a curious question, or so it seemed to Lan, but since it didn't seem to signify anything, he assumed it was just curiosity. No, he answered, grinning. Macy's mine. She just looks more like mother than I do. Which is a blessing, Macy retorted, poking him in the arm teasingly, since you'd make an ugly girl. Eleanor brightened back up again, and Lan decided that it was only shyness that had made her expression change. As it happens, I have just enough time to show you about, and I would be happy to, she said, and proceeded to give them a whirlwind tour. Macy was fascinated, although she blanched a bit at the room where people were actually cutting into a dog to remove a growth, and backed out of the one where a wound had gone bad and was being cleaned out. Lan didn't blame her. 
It was a wonder to him how gentle Eleanor managed to observe all of this with equanimity. I can't show you where the older trainees treat people, of course, she said apologetically. That would be rude to the people. They aren't on display, after all. Well, I wouldn't want strangers who weren't even healers parading into my room if I were ill either. Macy smiled. Thank you very much for showing us around. You are quite welcome, Eleanor said, gracing them with a dazzling smile of her own. It's nice to meet some of Lan's family. Lan traded a glance with Macy. She grimaced. Some of Lan's family who don't want to treat him like a freak, that is, Macy replied. I can't believe how well he kept his temper at the feast. Eleanor raised her eyebrows in a way that suggested she agreed with Macy, but didn't say anything. Eleanor had to be about her own duties, so she left them at the door and hurried back to whatever she had to do. Macy walked between Lan and Tuck into a garden so quiet that every tiny creak of a snow-laden branch was clearly audible. Snow was still falling, and the fading light warned that Macy would have to start back soon if she wanted to be home by dark. She kept giving Lan the oddest looks out of the corner of her eyes as they walked toward the stables to get her pony and cart. How long have you known Eleanor? She asked finally. She was one of the first people I met while I was still hurt, he said, wondering why she asked. Her father is Harold Paul, the one who's my, I guess you'd call him a mentor. Ah, she said, as if that explained far more than just the content of his words. Then she turned to Tuck and began plying him with questions until Lan completely forgot her curious behavior by the time they had reached the stables. The tack room of the companion's stable was perhaps not the best place for Lan's first lesson in using his gift, but it was the only one that would work at all. It was absolutely too cold to try to teach Lan outside, for Paul didn't have the strength to teach him and keep them both warm at the same time. The first consideration in this set of lessons was that Kalira had to be with him, which ruled out most of the rooms in the Collegium. He'd asked for a tiled room in healers, but there wasn't one available. That left the tack room, the only heated place in the stables that wasn't also too near stored straw and other flammable substances. Paul wished that it was spring when these lessons could have been held safely outdoors, but this was too urgent to wait until spring. Just to be on the safe side, though, he had a pail of water nearby. Not that a pail of water is going to make much difference if he really loses control. Paul told himself sternly to dismiss the idea. Kalira had already demonstrated that she could control Lan's power. If he let himself doubt that she could, he could undermine her ability to continue to do so. So he sat down at a small table across from his pupil and put himself in the calmest and most confident state of mind he could conjure. Lan looked up at him and smiled faintly and reached out to touch Kalira, who stood at his elbow. This is the usual first step for a fire starter, Paul said, placing a small piece of oil-soaked lint in the middle of a saucer in front of Lan. Needless to say, in your case, the reason we're starting small is not because you need to increase your power. Here he raised an ironic eyebrow at Lan, who flushed but because you need to increase your control. Or rather, you and Kalira need to work together so that you two can accomplish something besides blasting. So, light this gently. You'll probably get a reaction headache, Lan, unless Kalira has managed to work out how to keep that from happening too. Kalira gave Paul a distinctly superior look, which made Paul wonder just what she had been concocting. Companions had this addiction to secrecy sometimes, and took a distinct delight in coming out of nowhere with a surprise for their chosen. What is she up to? he asked Saturon, who stood just behind him, watching the proceedings. I have no idea, his companion replied. You know, children, when they're planning something, the last person they tell is a parent. Lan bit his lip and stared at the bit of lint apprehensively. I expect you're going to have to get worked up about something, Paul told him. It's going to be a while before you can access the power of your gift without getting emotionally... Overwrought, Lan supplied unhappily. 
Well, yes. But just remember that when you two do get it under control, it's going to be easier to access, reliable, and very useful. Maybe it wasn't such a bad thing that Lan was unhappy about his gift, seeing that it was so linked with emotions. Try it, he urged. The only way things are going to get better for you is to get everything under control. And the only way to get control is to practice, the boy sighed, but nodded. Right, he closed his eyes. Paul was enough of an empath to feel the unhappiness that Lan was conjuring out of his memories. The tension increased moment by moment, and Paul's stomach tightened in response. Time crawled by, and Paul's shoulders and neck began to knot up as well. He felt sweat trickling down his back, nervous sweat, since it certainly wasn't that warm in the tack room. Soon it was at the point where he began to worry that Kalira's confidence was overconfidence, that the plate would explode in his face in a moment. Lan's face reflected anger, fear, and unhappiness, and Paul had to force himself to remain where he was, looking calm and confident in case Lan looked up. He felt as if his head was about to burst. Then it happened. With a tiny sigh, the bit of fluff in front of him blossomed into a lovely flame that unfolded like a flower to feed on the lint and the oil. Lan's shoulders slumped and his eyes opened. The anger drained from his face, then the fear, and he looked at the little flame with wonder. I, we did it, he said with great surprise, and my head doesn't hurt. I should hope not, Kalira said smugly for the benefit of both the heralds. I've been working on that. If I hadn't been, you'd have been waking up with a reaction headache every time you had a bad dream. She tossed her head proudly and arched her neck, waiting for Paul to congratulate her. Aha, you clever girl, you. You found the key. It's to take care of the problem before it's a problem. Although Lan still looked baffled, Paul understood immediately. You're draining off energy as he produces it. And leaving just enough for him to use. Right now I'm directing it too, but if you let him link in and show him what to do, all I'll have to do is manage the draining. Kalira had lost a bit of the smugness, but she was still very proud of herself, as well she should be. It was the best possible solution for now, although poor Lan would have to weather a great many emotional ups and downs in order to access his power. How are you doing? Paul asked. Lan chewed on his lip and looked anxiously at his mentor, but slowly the anxiety was fading. My stomach's upset, but I guess I'm all right, he admitted. A cup of tea from Eleanor will take care of that, Kalira soothed, though to Paul's experienced ear she also sounded just a trifle impatient with her chosen. She knew they could do this now, and she wanted him to keep trying. Lan didn't but he knew that if he wasn't able to learn to control this ability, it would control him. It already had twice, after all, and he knew the consequences of that. While he thought, the bit of lint flared and went out, leaving a tiny pile of ashes. Let's do it again, he said at last. Good lad, Paul replied, and replaced the bit of lint on the saucer. Now try again. This time it seemed to be a little easier. It certainly didn't take as long. Paul ran him through the exercise a few more times before changing the focus. Right, let's take a break here, or at least a break for you. Paul smiled at Lan's look of relief. Kalira will link you into me, and you'll see how this is done. Why can't Kalira show me? Lan wanted to know. If she can control my power, why can't she show me how to do it myself? Because I'm not handling the power the way that you and Paul will, Kalira replied. I'm doing something only a companion can do. We're born in energy and live in it all the time. That's why we're white. This kind of energy bleaches every live thing that it contacts after a time. It is, Lan asked, intrigued. Even Paul was intrigued. This was new information to him. Usually companions revealed very little about themselves. 
he hadn't realized that they were so intimately involved with the force behind the gifts. And Dad, you can't die us either, she chuckled. We bleach right out in a few days. Annoying of you, Paul put in. It would be so much more helpful to heralds who are trying to gather information unobtrusively if you could just become an ordinary chestnut color once in a while. Learn from adversity, Harold. We won't do everything for you. Kalira was still highly amused, and Paul sensed that Ceteron was too. But her sire was willing to put up with only so much insolence from his offspring. Respect your seniors, companion, the stallion chided. At this point in his life, Paul has accomplished more than you have ever dreamed of doing. Let's get on with this. Sir? She replied promptly, obedient but with a hint of amusement still. Paul felt Kalira form the link between himself and his pupil. This way Lan was not directly in his mind, nor was he in Lan's. This was a much better way of dealing with the task. He didn't want Lan privy to his uncensored thoughts, and he certainly didn't want to experience the poor lad's uncensored emotions. He shifted his concentration to the lint, not that he had to concentrate a great deal. What he did have to do was slow things down so that Lan could see exactly what happened. It wasn't spectacular. Basically, it was very similar to using the fetching gift at a very tiny scale. Although he no longer had to think about how he did this, he vibrated the materials until the heat they generated ignited them. He moved infinitesimal bits of oil and lint so that they rubbed against each other, creating heat by friction until the lint burst into flame. When the lint flamed, he looked up at Lan and saw the trainee's eyes narrowed, his brow furrowed with concentration, but his mouth forming a slight O oh, of surprise. So that's what's happening, he said, looking up into Paul's eyes. Basically, yes, just very, very quickly. And in your case, it's... He tried to think of an analogy. Hmm, like an avalanche instead of a single aimed stone. You just pour out power and everything in its path goes up in flames. Things that are very flammable burn immediately. Things that are around or near fire have flames jump to them, channeled by the power. Lan winced, but nodded. Paul was deliberately reminding him of what had happened, because he also wanted these sessions to desensitize Lan to what had happened by accident. Because one day, he might have to do it on purpose. He couldn't keep wincing away from creating a major fire. He had to be able to create it when and where it was needed, even offensively. Paul was privy to information known only to the king, the king's own, and a few other carefully selected members of the council. What no other herald teacher in the Collegium knew was that the situation on the border with Kars was getting more serious with every passing day. They were taking advantage of the milder southern climate to increase their probes along the border. If there was a war, ready or not, Lan might be needed. Trained or not, he may be needed. It was a sobering thought, and one that kept Paul lying wakeful at nights. If, no, when war came, more trainees than Lavin would be thrown into whites, all unready, and sent out to the south. More young healers would follow, and young volunteers to the guard. Best to end it quickly, and for that, it might be necessary to unleash Lavin Chitwood's power, unchecked, unhindered in all its ferocity. So, do you think that if Kalira controls the amount of energy you get, you can replicate what I just did? Paul asked. Lan drummed his fingers restlessly, his eyes looking off at some far distant point while he sorted things through his own mind. Not yet, he decided. Can you show me again? Three or four more times, I mean? Certainly. Paul was actually relieved to hear Lan's caution. Kalira, if you would be so kind, link and hold the link for four repetitions of the exercise. Certainly, Paul, Kalira said cheerfully. She insinuated the link with great skill and delicacy. Paul spared a moment to admire her touch. Four times he ignited tiny balls of lint, going so slowly that it was possible to see a minute coal form at the heart of the ball before the flame rose. 
Four times Lan watched with his eyes closed in concentration. The third and fourth time the furrows in his brow eased, and he nodded slightly when the lint caught fire. After the fourth iteration, he looked up and smiled. I can do it, Harold, he said with confidence. Let me try again, doing it right. Paul placed another lint ball on the altar of sacrifice, and Lan stared at it. In three heartbeats, as Lan's smile increased to a grin, it was nothing but ash. Paul was flatly astonished. He had never had any pupil with one of the odder gifts catch on so quickly before. On the other hand, their problem was usually in accessing their power, not in controlling it. Only young Malkin has had the same problem as Lan. It occurred to him, and Malkin is not ready to control it. Poor Malkin had been so overwhelmed by his foresight that Harold Evan had finally decided to shut it down altogether. It was a temporary measure, but until the child was older and stronger, there was no way he could understand what he was seeing and why he was seeing it, so he could control it. I am not risking a child's sanity, Evan had said flatly. Nothing is worth that. He'd gotten no argument from anyone on that score. Paul lined up lint balls, directing Lan to ignite them in a specific sequence. After a bit of fumbling, Lan did just that. He made the piles of lint bigger, then smaller. Finally, he took the bucket of water, extinguished the tack room fire, and had Lan relight it with the remainder of the lint as kindling. In order to get the now wet wood going properly, Lan had to concentrate his force on the fire until the water had evaporated and the wood could burn. Enough. Paul ordered when that exercise was over. Lan was pale but triumphant. He looked eager to keep going, but Paul knew weariness when he saw it. That's enough for the first day, Lavin. Quite enough. We'll start on real targets and more distant targets tomorrow. How are you feeling? Tired, and my stomach's in knots, Lan said truthfully. I don't like having to get angry like this, but but I don't think I have to get quite as angry now as I did when we started. That's good. Paul hoped he was right. Go on back up to the collegium and your classes. I'll clean up and I'll see you here tomorrow. Lan turned to go, and Paul called after him. No practicing on your own? Promise me. I promise. Lan called back over his shoulder. No fear. I wish that was the only thing we had to worry about, Chosen, Saturon said soberly. Paul sighed. The sooner we can say he's fully trained, the more likely he is to be sent out. He shook his head. Gods, now I know how the weapons master feels. I always did, said Saturon, and left it at that. Seventeen. Paul paused for a moment with one hand on the latch of his room and the other massaging his own shoulder. The hallway was cold and his room would be warm, but he was very nearly too tired even to open his own door. It had been a long day, a very, very long day. Why he should have been selected to be on the elite committee of those who knew what was going on with Kars? Bother. He knew why. Lavin Chitwood, or Fire Starter, as the king had begun to call him, was the reason why good old, dependable Harold Paul should suddenly be counted among the important minds of this land. The boy was shaping up to be a very important player in the coming war, and Paul was his teacher, his mentor, and his friend. Paul's companion was the sire to Lavin's companion, giving him yet another source of insight into Lavin's young mind. If Paul and Saturon knew what was coming, they could prepare the boy to face it. Paul was dancing on the edge of his energy, though. He was forced to juggle teaching, tutoring Lavin, and meetings with the select council along with whatever incidental tasks came up. He wasn't young anymore, and his body reminded him of that sad fact rather frequently these days. So, for that matter, did Saturan, who nagged him about slowing down at least once a day. Not that there was anything Paul could do about it. His body, mind, and spirit were not his to command. 
At last he opened the door of his room and stared in bewilderment to see his daughter Eleanor in her mother's chair by the fire, waiting patiently for him with a tray full of covered dishes beside her. Eleanor, what are you? He stopped himself in mid-sentence and shook his head in mingled disbelief and dismay. He couldn't have forgotten the weekly dinner they always shared, could he? It's not. I thought it was. Yes, father, you've lost track of time again, Eleanor sighed. When you didn't come to heal us, I knew you'd forgotten what day it was. I also thought that you'd probably forget you were supposed to have dinner at all, so I had one of the servants bring dinner here. The fire crackled cheerfully as Paul shook his head at his own forgetfulness and took his chair across from hers. I'm glad you did. I'm so tired I probably would have just opted for some fruit and cheese. Assuming you remembered to eat anything before you went to sleep. Eleanor began uncovering the platters and fixed a plate of food for him. I won't ask why they're running you out like this, but I hope it ends soon. He didn't say anything. He couldn't. He knew very well that the secret meetings wouldn't end until the entire kingdom knew that Valdemar was at war with Kars, and then it wouldn't just be meetings that she would be worrying about. The only thing he could do was something he already had done. He'd extracted a promise from Theron that Eleanor would never have both parents on the front lines of the fighting at the same time. This was not to say that they wouldn't both be down near the border, but they would never be near the fighting simultaneously. Eleanor had ordered a wonderful meal, and he gave it its due attention, although he didn't neglect conversation to do so. He told her what he could of the doings of Circle and Collegium, and she shared stories of the interesting or the funny from her end of the grounds. But when they reached the dessert, Eleanor brought up a subject he had not been anticipating. So, has Lavin found a sweetheart among the trainees? She asked, so casually that Paul didn't believe for a moment that she felt casual about the subject. Oh, gods, no he thought, with a sinking heart. There was only one thing that could prompt a question like that. Eleanor was smitten with the boy. Oh, gods, grant that it isn't serious yet. His tired mind, which had been sinking into a state of comfortable relaxation, suddenly lurched into frantic activity again. He knew from his experiences with her older sisters that the last person a girl confides her romantic hopes to is her father. Somehow, some way, he had to dissuade her from setting those hopes on Lavin Firestarter, assuming it wasn't already too late. But what to say? He's not going to. You're more like to see that fire iron take a sweetheart, Paul settled on with a yawn to cover his anxiety. Above all, the one thing he must not do was appear opposed to her infatuation. Nothing watered and fed the young plant of love like parental opposition. Oh, come now, father. You are never going to convince me he's Shage, she replied with a laugh that faded as he didn't reply. Is he? she faltered. It was so tempting to let her believe that, but she was a healer, and she would be able to figure the truth of that out for herself without too much difficulty. No, he's not Shage. Paul replied and interrupted her sigh of relief with, But he might just as well be. Any girl who pins her hopes on him as a sweetheart is going to have her heart broken. He's already life-bonded. He hoped that Eleanor would leave things at that, but no. She looked at him sharply as the fire flared beside her. I thought you said he didn't have a sweetheart. Oh, she's not in the trainees. Her brow wrinkled with puzzlement and annoyance. But he hasn't seen anyone but his sister. And now her expression turned to one of horror. He can't be life-bonded to his sister. She jumped to her feet. Paul rose and grabbed both her elbows, holding her fast, so that she had to look into his eyes. Eleanor, listen to me. Lavin is life-bonded to Kalira. There is absolutely no doubt of it. Kalira? She stood very, very still and he let go of her arms. Kalira, his companion. Paul sat down heavily, and she copied him unconsciously.
He nodded, watching her closely. Kalira, his companion. There is no room in his life or his heart for any other female except as a friend. Firelight created changing shadows over her face, a face whose expressions changed as quickly as the shadows. But that's not possible, she said aloud, hardly seeming to be aware that she was speaking. That can't be possible. It is possible, and it is the truth, Paul said bluntly, now hoping to hammer his point home with repetition. But Kalira, she turned her eyes toward her father entreatingly, a companion isn't human. A companion can't be. She flushed a bright crimson. A companion can't. She isn't human. He decided to be as obtuse and diplomatic as possible. It doesn't matter. Not when they're life bonded. They are bound to each other in a way that nothing can change. But Eleanor wasn't going to take the hint. A companion isn't a woman. Kalira can't be what I... Uh, a woman can be? Eleanor, it doesn't matter. Listen to me. I know. I'm not speculating. I know. It does not matter. He leaned forward and took her hands before she could withdraw them, using every voice trick and gift he had mastered in all his years as a herald to make her listen and believe. He will never love a human as anything other than a friend. Don't lose your heart to him, because you'll only end up breaking it over this, and it won't be his fault that you do. I'll comfort you, but I won't sympathize with you. Her expression gradually settled to one of dazed confusion. He let her hands go then, and she put her right to her temple. I just... it doesn't... she faltered. Then she rose slowly. I think I'd better go get some rest. I think you should too, he replied soothingly, putting his arm around her as he escorted her to the door. He kept his own feelings behind hard shields. The last thing she needed was to sense his aching heart. She already had her own to deal with. It's been a long day for both of us. Thank you for dinner. I enjoyed it very much, and your company. She came to herself long enough to give him a wan smile and a kiss on the cheek. Thanks, father. I love you too. He closed the door behind her and leaned against it, waiting until she was long gone from the building, well on her way to Healer's Collegium, and as preoccupied as she was, unlikely to sense his emotions. He let his shields down and metaphorically leaned on Satyron's shoulder, his heart surely as sore as Eleanor's was. My poor baby. Even if it was only infatuation, it hurt, and she'd never had her heart wounded before. Just now, all she knew was grief. She didn't know that grief can heal, or that some can be greater than others. First love was no less real than mature love, and first heartbreak hurt worse. He buried his head in his hands, and hot tears of sorrow only a parent can know for the hurts of his child slipped through his fingers. There is nothing harder than being a father or mother, Satyran said, with an understanding deeper than the words could ever reach. Yes, he replied and with that one word said all that could be said. Lan always thought that this was the saddest part of the year, the time when it seemed that winter would never end. The excitement of midwinter was over, hard-packed snow blanketed the ground, and an unending sea of gray cloud blanketed the sky. The cold was relentless, leaking in around the door and window frames, sending unexpected chills down the back. You couldn't escape it, except in bed, and you knew that when you woke up again you'd be battling it from the time you turned back the covers. Lan hated this time of year. There was nothing to look forward to. The days dragged on with soul-deadening sameness until at last spring arrived, and it was impossible to believe in spring when the ground was frozen rock hard. That was not so much the case this year, although he often felt he teetered on the edge of failure. 
He had progressed beyond merely igniting a few lowly bits of lint, and in the collegium, at least, his gift was no longer a secret. They were starting to call him Lavin Firestarter, a name that pleased him and made him feel queasy at the same time. He didn't in the least mind shedding his surname, but he wished that this new one was less sinister. Many things made him uneasy and uncertain about this new role that fate had cast him in. Harold's did so much more than he had ever dreamed they did. Not that Harold's had crossed his mind so much before all of this, but it had never occurred to him that they were more than the mouthpieces of the king. That was what was occupying his mind as he trudged back from his last class, which was a combined lesson for him and some of the final year students. They were doing archery practice. He, however, had taken his gift into the realm of the practical. The scenario was simple enough. The archers were firing at moving targets. He was trying to incinerate the arrows before they hit those targets. The archers were not launching their arrows singly anymore, but in volleys as they would in combat. So it wasn't just one arrow he had to get, but many. He was exhausted. Today he'd had to take a long walk with Kalira after the lesson to cool down the terrible anger he'd had to raise. It made him feel sick, but something about the cloaked anxiety of his mentor Harold Paul told him that there was a reason, a good one, for the relentless pace being set for him. That in itself worried him. Something was going on, something that no one was talking about openly. And yet, he seemed to be the only one of the trainees that was aware of the subcurrent. Everyone else went to classes, to meals, gossiped, complained, and went on with their lives just as they always had. The regular class load was bad enough without this added, unacknowledged pressure. Heralds did so much. With the bards, they passed on news, but theirs concentrated on the edicts of law and government. They made certain that everyone actually understood new laws and decrees. They acted as judges and juries, but also investigated crime or suspected crime. They went for help when needed, for nothing in the kingdom could travel as fast as a herald and companion. They organized and trained local militia. They led militia when something more than simple home defense was needed. They carried secret messages. They acted as spies and very rarely as assassins. Some, with very specific gifts, such as his, worked with the guard and the army. They were posted as diplomats or as adjuncts to diplomats. They had to know geography and history, not only of Valdemar, but of the lands around it. Mathematics, orienteering and navigation, rudimentary artifice, sleight of hand, literature, manners, the whys and wherefores of many religions, these and many more disparate classes filled his days and nights with study. No one person could do and be all these things, but that was why everyone had at least rudimentary lessons in them. How could you know what you were good at if you didn't at least try it? But oh, the burden of all those classes! He thanked the gods for a mentor like Harold Paul, who understood as no one else could exactly how much stress he could bear without cracking. A few days ago, Paul had gotten together with all of his teachers and laid down certain guidelines, which included the order that no one, absolutely no one, was to assign him after-class work for the evening after a gift practice. That had given him some breathing space, sorely needed. He'd also arranged that Lan got a tray in his room on those evenings rather than eating with the rest of the collegium. His nerves were just too raw to bear the company of even his closest friends so soon after the lessons. Oh, my dear, you'll feel better after a hot meal, Kalira said cheerfully. And you have all of the evening for yourself. I wish it was warm again, he fretted. He still was not much of a reader unless he read aloud to an audience. That was as much because he had discovered a pleasure in acting things out for others, which would probably thoroughly horrify his mother if she knew, for she would be certain that he was going to have a second career as a mountebank. There was far less pleasure in reading alone. You need something active to do, Kalira acknowledged, but something other than writing. You're getting quite enough of that, I think. I never get enough of you, Kalira, he said obliquely. But you've had quite enough of riding in Companion's Field, I know, 
she laughed. Get something to eat, warm up, and see if you can find something to read. And if you can't, maybe there are enough of your friends free to play some tarot. Being warm surely sounded attractive right now. He was always warm enough when he was using his gift, but as soon as he stopped, all the energy ran out of him, and his feet and hands grew cold and numb in no time, no matter how many gloves and socks he wore. At least Kalira kept him from having reaction headaches now. He stamped his boots clear of snow at the door, but little trails of melted water showed that not all of his fellow trainees had remembered to do so. There was a trainee down at the other end of the hall with a mop and bucket, remedying the situation until a servant could do a proper job. The warmth of his room didn't penetrate to the chill core of him until he had taken off his cloak and boots and settled down to his tray at the fire. And it wasn't until he'd finished eating that he saw the small white square of a note on the floor just inside his door. There was a bit of a boot print on one corner, so he must have trod right over it when he came in. He got out of his chair and picked it up, unfolding it. The paper was soft, erased and reused many times, since paper was too expensive to be wasted in the Chitwood household. Lan, I want to go skating in the moonlight, it read, and Mother won't let me unless I've got an escort. Sam said he's too busy. Have you got the evening free? Besides, I want to talk with you in private. If you can, come straight to the house. Macy. Well, if that wasn't exactly what he'd been hoping for. He liked to skate and hadn't gone out skating in ages, not since back in Alderscroft. His skates should still be in the storage box in his room along with a few other belongings. Very good, Kalira enthused, looking over his shoulder. It's only just dusk. We should get there in plenty of time for a couple of candle marks of skating, and you can bring your skates back here with you after. That will give you something active to do. I'll go notch up one of the grooms, and I'll meet you at the door. Yes, and he probably could organize some of the others for games on the ice once he started skating at the Collegium. Broom ball was always fun. Skates weren't that hard to come by. You could always make a pair of wooden runners if you didn't have the ready money to buy steel ones. He thought with pleasure of being able to show Tuck how to skate, if he didn't already know how. Feeling much more cheerful and ready to go, he pulled a heavy knitted garment, shapeless but warm over his shirt and canvas tunic, shoved his feet into his boots and threw his cloak on over all. He left his tray outside the door to be picked up later and headed back out again, pulling on his gloves as he walked. The trainee with the mop was nowhere in sight, but the floor was dry and clean again. He met the cold at the door with determination that brightened when he saw Kalira waiting for him. What do you suppose Macy wants to talk about? Kalira asked as they passed the guard who waved at them as they went by. I'm not sure, he replied. It was so quiet out here. He was getting used to the constant buzz of the Collegium, and even in Alderscroft in the middle of winter there were noises from the forest and barns. Here in the heart of Haven, where he had least expected it, he found silence. The homes of the wealthy enclosed behind their walls only showed that they were inhabited by the shadows moving in the curtained, lighted windows. Even the sound of Kalira's hooves was muffled by the packed snow and he was reluctant to break the silence by speaking. She's not the only one who wants to talk in private, though, Lan continued. I want to talk to her about Eleanor. The young healer had been acting very peculiar to his way of thinking. One moment she was friendly and her normal self, the next withdrawn and watching him with the most peculiar expression. Tuck was no help. He was completely infatuated with Macy and kept turning the conversation back to Lan's sister. And he hadn't been able to talk to Macy alone because whenever she visited the Collegium, Tuck was with them every step of the way. Hmm, not a bad idea. I haven't been with you enough to see how she's acting, Kalira admitted. Macy is probably the best one to ask. I hope Eleanor isn't worried because there's something wrong with her father. Saturn doesn't tell me much. That could be the case. Paul's been looking strained and rather seedy lately, he replied, now concerned himself. 
I hadn't thought of that. You don't think he's sick, do you? Not sick, but overworked, and certainly there is something that has him very concerned, enough to prey on him night and day. That got Lan's attention. I wonder what's on his mind. I hope it isn't me. I mean, I hope I'm not getting horribly behind or something. Something to do with the kingdom, not you, Chosen. Calera assured him immediately. They've put him on the Privy Council. I'm not sure why, but he's spending a great deal of time in meetings. She looked back at him over her shoulder and cocked her ears at him. Ah, Lan said, relieved, and dismissed Paul from his concern. If it was kingdom business, there was nothing he could do about it. The uncomfortable silence in the residential district gave way to sound as he and Kalira entered the first street of shops. But here they ran into a slight problem. A furniture shop was taking a delivery, a very bulky delivery, and the street was blocked. A wagon loaded with massive carved furniture pulled by four oxen had backed up to the storefront, probably because the wagon was too large to fit into the alley behind it. The wagon and its team completely crossed the street. Nothing bigger than a cat was going to get by for a while. They stopped, and Lan eyed the blockage. Bother, Kalira said cheerfully. Well, no matter. I know a way around. But we'll have to go through a rather rotten district. Rotten or not, they're not stupid enough to bother a trainee, Lan replied. Are they? I mean, most people know we could call for help. I was just pointing it out, because you'll probably see a lot of unpleasant things. Kalira sighed. You won't like it. It was one thing to be poor in a little village like yours. It's entirely another to be poor in a city. Even Haven has its share of thieves, beggars and ne'er-do-wells. But as a herald, there's going to be a lot of things I won't like. I might as well get used to it. And if there's something going on that people should know about, then we can call for help. That seemed perfectly reasonable to him, and Kalira evidently agreed, for she shook her head and cut down a side street. The problem with Haven was that once you got off the main thoroughfares, you couldn't necessarily get from one place in the city to another very easily. It was designed that way, to confuse invaders and force them to divide their numbers, thus rendering them more vulnerable to the defenders. Valdemar was long past the time when anyone needed to think about invaders taking Haven, but the main part of the city could not be changed at this late date. Shops and houses were backed not by alleys, but by continuous walls. The only way to get into an alley was through the building. This would be another unpleasant surprise for an invader, and another opportunity to trap small parties of invaders and finish them off. Lan had no idea of how to get through this maze, but Kalira did, so he relaxed and let her pick out the way. Within a very short period of time, he was in an entirely new sector, a farmer's market. It was empty now, the stalls holding nothing more than a few wilted cabbage leaves or chicken feathers, but the faint scents and the arrangement told him what it was. Kalira picked her way through it daintily and exited the area through an alley on the other side. This was another residential district, but a poorer one than Lan had seen before. No silence here. Babies squalled, adults quarreled, drunks sang, children played or fought, all at the tops of their lungs. There was light, but it was from oil torches fueled with something that smoked and had an unpleasant smell. There was no glass in the windows to keep out the cold, just shutters, most of them with rags stuffed into the cracks. Another sound broke through the general babble, the sound of a serious fight. Ahead, two gangs of boys clashed, fists and feet flying and landing with muffled thuds. They screamed at each other at the tops of their collective lungs, adding to the din. Shutters all up and down the street flew open. People leaned out of the windows, gawking, then shouting to the boys and each other, some laying bets on the outcome. Another detour, I think. Kalira said promptly. She increased her pace to a trot and made a quick turn into yet another side street. He could see, as the noise died away, that this was a dead end, culminating in a cul-de-sac with one of the oil torches at the end. 
No worries, Kalira said cheerfully. We just nip down this alley and come back out on another street. She suited her actions to her words and made a quick turn into a dark alley. The only light came from the street behind them, and Lan looked nervously back over his shoulder. It was as dark as the inside of a black bag in this alley, and suddenly Lan was no longer so confident that as a heraldic trainee, his safety was a certainty. The alley was awfully long, and why couldn't he see light at the other end? Then it was obvious why, as Kalira suddenly stopped, ears up in surprise and radiating annoyance. This alley was a dead end as well, with a wooden barricade built across it, a few arms' lengths from Kalira's nose. This isn't supposed to be here, she said in indignant surprise, when a faint sound behind and the flare of light above alerted both of them. Kalira spun on her heels. Two light baskets now hung from chains coming from second-story windows on either side of the alley, and between them and the exit was a group of villainous-looking men with bows, arrows already knocked to the strings. Six? Eight? Too many. Gods! Lan sat frozen with shock, unable to do more than stare as they aimed and let fly. Kalira was not so paralyzed. She darted to one side, writhing to avoid the falling arrows, quick as a falcon and lithe as a mink. She reared up on her hind legs and twisted her forequarters to the side to present the smallest possible target. Somehow Lan managed to hang on, bending over her neck and clinging to her with both hands tangled tightly into her mane. And somehow he managed to remain untouched by the half-dozen arrows. Kalira was not so lucky. With a shock they both felt, a bolt struck her hindquarters, driving in deeply in a lance of pain they shared. She shied sideways and screamed, and Lan screamed with her. It felt as if a red-hot sword drove into his hip and out the other side. But her pain and danger woke the serpent asleep inside him and roused it in a single instant to action. Red rage rose within, uncoiling with terrible swiftness and giving birth to the fire. The next volley of arrows burst into flame in midair. Arrowheads clattered to the frozen ground beside him, and a drift of ash flew away through the flames. The volley after that never left the bows. The arrows knocked to bowstrings flared once. For a moment, Arrow shapes of ash holding for a heartbeat before crumbling in their fingers. The arrowheads dropped to the ground as the bows ignited. With startled shouts, the men flung their weapons away. His sight was filmed with red, and he prepared to strike a third time. Lan, hold them. Just hold them. Don't kill them, please. Kalira's mind voice penetrated the rage as nothing else had. With a wrenching effort, he held and redirected his strike. As they turned to flee, they were barred by a wall of flame that rose between them and the end of the alley. A second wall penned them away from Lan and Kalira. Lan held the anger in with all his strength as it tried to escape him and take its rightful prey. It didn't feel like a serpent anymore. It felt like a dragon, mindless and raging and very, very hungry. Trapped, they lost their heads and their cohesion as a group. They abandoned anything like sense and climbed over each other in a panic, trying desperately to find an escape. When the mounted guardsmen pounded up to the rescue, led by a herald, they were jabbering and begging for mercy from within their cage of flame. The flames licked at them hungrily. Kalira helped Lan to hold on to control and keep back the fires. Lan wasn't really thinking now. He was consumed by the fires within and without, and only Kalira's aid allowed him to hold on to sanity and control. Lan sat in his saddle as rigid as a statue until the moment that help arrived. He didn't even realize they were there until a strange mind voice called to him. He was too intent on what lay within the fire to pay attention to what was outside it. It was so tempting. The fires beckoned so seductively. And it was such a struggle to keep himself from burning those evil creatures to a crisp. Nor was that all. 
He had to fight to keep the fires where they were, confined within the walls of the alley. If he lost concentration for a moment, they would escape, leap to the wooden building on either side of the alley, incinerating the innocent people inside. Thanks to Kalira, the dragon had been confined, but it was not tame and never would be. If he lost his hold on it for even a moment, all would be lost. His body was so tense he couldn't move a single muscle, and although his head was clear, it was full of the rage and the fire. Lavin, a woman's voice called. Trini, Lavin, you can let them go now. With a start, Lan came back to himself. It's all right, Lavin. Let them go, that's right. We'll take them now. We're here to help you. With an effort, he let the fires die, and with them his anger. Good, Lavin. Excellent. Thank you. The guards had come down off their mounts and were rounding up the men who had ambushed them. The herald rode forward as Lan slumped over the pommel of his saddle, then slid down off Kalira to take his weight from her wounded hindquarters. I'm Harold Sharisa, said the newcomer, dismounting quickly and going at once to Kalira, who shivered and shook with pain and reaction. Lan could only hold her head and shake himself. Tears poured down his face as he cradled her against his chest. Hold on, little one, this is going to hurt. The herald took hold of the shaft of the crossbow bolt and gave a quick pull. Kalira's body convulsed with the pain when the bolt came free, and she gave a low moan, a moan that Lan echoed as he endured her agony with her. The herald took them both in charge, binding a crude dressing on Kalira's wound, taking Lan up behind her, and getting them both away before the guard had even finished trussing up the ambushers. The streets passed in a kind of blur. All that Lan could think of was Kalira. He was frantic now, wanting to urge Harold Sharisa to greater speed, then wanting to beg her to hold back to a mere crawl. If he could have carried Kalira, he would have. Easy on, lad, Sharisa murmured from time to time. Easy on. She hurts, but she's not in any danger. But watching Kalira limping painfully behind him, feeling her agony with every step she took, did nothing to convince Lan of that. Halfway to the Collegium, Pull and Satyron came pounding up, shaking him out of his days of fear and hurt. He stared dumbly at Paul and was vaguely astonished at the unfettered anger he saw in his mentor's face. But Paul only looked him over quickly, then he and Satyron moved to Kalira's side. Sharisa's companion took his place on Kalira's opposite side, and Paul buckled Kalira into a peculiar harness he had brought with him, fastening the other two into it as well. In a moment, Lan saw what they were about. The two stallions were much larger than Kalira, and they were able to take most of the weight off her hindquarters. The relief to Kalira was so great that Lan burst into tears of gratitude. Now they were able to move more quickly, and soon Kalira was in the hands of real healers in her own stall in the stables. Lan hovered anxiously outside the stall, still full of fear, although he felt everything that Kalira felt, and knew for himself that they were easing her pain and knitting her wound closed with their healing magic. He couldn't see what they were doing, though, and he couldn't be right with her, and that was horrid. Finally, they all cleared away, and he dashed into the stall to fling himself down on the straw next to her and cry as he had not since he was an infant. His thoughts were a tangle of guilt and anger. Guilt because if he hadn't gone into the city, this never would have happened. And anger at those who had dared to harm her. His throat and stomach were one long knot, his cheeks raw, his eyes burning, and still the tears fell. This is all my fault, he sobbed into her neck. You should never have chosen me. If you hadn't, you'd be all right. Shh, lad, said Paul, dropping to his knees beside them. Lan had been so hysterical he hadn't even heard Paul approach. He put his arm around Lan's shoulders, dropping the load of blankets he'd brought with him. If she'd chosen someone else, she might well be on the southern border fighting Kaas at this moment. She knows that Harold's and companions can't escape danger, don't you, little girl? Kalira raised her head with an effort and looked up at them both. I just 
wish that danger didn't hurt so much, she said ruefully, and nuzzled Lan. I couldn't, wouldn't have anyone but you chosen, ever. Before that could bring a new spate of self-accusation, Paul shook his shoulder a little. I thought you'd probably want to stay with her tonight, so I brought up some bedding for you, and a hot brick. If you get cold, there'll be a couple more bricks on the hearth over in the tack room. Now let's get a bed made up for you before you fall on your nose. Making up a bed in the straw took what was left of Lan's energy and all his concentration. When Paul left them, blowing out the lantern at the end of the stall as he went, it was all Lan could do to get into his crude bed and curl up with one hand resting on Kalira's foreleg. She was already asleep, and he lay there, listening to her breathing, to the mice rustling in the straw, to the occasional stamp of a hoof in one of the other stalls. He thought he would never be able to sleep, no matter how tired he was. But it was very dark in the stable, and as warmth crept into him from the hot brick he lay curled around, he felt his knotted muscles relaxing from sheer exhaustion. And finally, his eyes closed all by themselves, and he, too, slipped into sleep. Eighteen. Paul's breath hung in clouds before his face. The icy air was as still as death, and the silence that hung over the gathered crowd made it seem that everyone in the great square had been turned into ice statues. Not in fifty years, perhaps even a hundred, had a king of Valdemar held an open judgment like this, with everyone in haven that could fit crowded into the great square in front of the city hall. More folk still hung out of the windows or stood on the balconies of the buildings surrounding the great square. Theron sat in stony silence on a temporary platform draped in white. The king's own on his right, armed to the teeth, his bodyguard of heralds around him, also armed, and all their companions ranged in front of the platform. They could have been a grim snow sculpture. There wasn't a hint of a smile on any face in that grouping. The only touch of color other than white was in the form of one set of formal greys, greys worn by Lavin Firestarter, who stood at Theron's left hand. The poor boy's face was as snowy as Theron's royal whites, but he was holding up gallantly. Paul was very, very proud of him. He was not the one waiting to be sentenced, but you wouldn't have known that from his face. In a clear space below the platform, surrounded by a half-circle of palace guards in their special midnight blue uniforms, stood the accused, or perhaps better to say the condemned, for their guilt was clear and they waited only for a chance to speak before Theron passed judgment on them. It was not likely that the seven hired thugs who'd accepted the job for murdering Lavin would say much. Caught in the act, their guilt was beyond question. But the wife of the head of the silversmith's guild, Gisette Jelnak, was definitely going to speak her piece. She practically shook with rage and outrage, and her face was as pale as Lan's, looking bloodless against the black of her gown. She twisted a handkerchief in her hands, the action suggesting that even now she longed to twine it around Lan's throat and strangle him with it. Of all her family, only her husband was here, and he stood apart as if in a vain attempt to disassociate himself from her. He stood within the half-circle of guards, but not himself under arrest. There was not one single member of the Silversmiths' Guild here in attendance. In fact, they were notable in their absence. Paul did not doubt for a moment that by the end of the day there would be a new guildmaster in that house. He was warned. If he couldn't keep Gisette from doing something foolish, he should have turned her into the guard, and this would never have become a public matter. And he had to know. Hired assassins don't come cheaply, especially ones who are thorough enough to track targets' movements and friends, forge notes and arrange to block streets with wagons and fighting gangs. Where did that money come from if not the household coffers? 
Surely he didn't think she was spending that much money on household expenses. Hoarfrost rimmed every surface of the buildings around the square, muting the colors. The sky above, a flat gray, promised nothing and added nothing. It seemed that all the elements had agreed to contribute to the atmosphere of rejection that Theron had concocted. Theron stood and slowly scanned the entire gathering, the force of his personality ensuring that every single individual in the square would be willing to swear later that the king had locked eyes with him personally. Theron took a deep breath, and his voice rolled over the silent crowd. We are here to pass judgment, he said, each word weighted carefully. You are here to bear witness that justice has been done. These seven men, he gestured slightly at the hired thugs, were captured in the act of attempting murder of one of Valdemar's heraldic trainees. This boy, Lavin Chitwood, called Firestarter. Paul's swift intake of breath was echoed by many others. This was the first time that Lan's gift had been acknowledged publicly, and those who knew that he had been one of the boys involved in the guild school fire would now be putting two and two together. This was no accident on Theron's part, but what was he going to accomplish with this information? These seven men stand convicted of that crime and of the crime of attempted murder and injury of one of Valdemar's companions, the companion Calera, bound to Lavin Firestarter. Another and more general gasp, for most people the very notion that someone would deliberately harm a companion was shocking. To actually see the men who had done such a thing was an outrage to their sensibilities. Have you men anything to say for yourself before we pass judgment upon you? Theron stared down at them, his look one of utter disgust. Paul didn't really expect them to say anything at all, but to his surprise one of them stepped forward. We wasn't to hurt the horse, I mean, companion, the grizzled, mustached man said defiantly. And we was just doing the job we'd been hired to. By her, and he pointed at Gisette Jelnak. The crowd murmured. There had been rumors flying all through Haven since the attack two days ago, but until now none of that had been confirmed. Paul noticed with satisfaction that, if anything, the general sense of outrage had increased. Theron's expression did not change by a hair. We are aware of that, he said distantly. Nevertheless, regardless of who hired you or why, you intended to murder, you attempted to murder. The fact that this attempt was on one of our trainees and resulted in the injury of one of our companions only compounds the felony. You stand condemned out of your own mouths under truth spell and duly witnessed. Is that all you have to say? The man wilted a little and shook his head, stepping back a pace. Theron hardened his expression. Very well. Your crime is punishable by death. Here he paused while the condemned looked sick and the crowd radiated approval. But we have another fate in mind for you, one that will serve Valdemar, you will proceed under guard to the Carsite border. You will remain under guard in heavy chains when you are not performing your duty, in light chains when you are. You will be outfitted in a special red uniform, patterned with a broad black cross on front and back, to make you visible and prevent you from being mistaken for bards. You will serve the healers in whatever capacity they deem fit, including and especially the extraction of the wounded from the battlefield during battles. He raised an eyebrow at them, for the first time changing his expression from one of condemnation to irony. This will be your duty for the rest of your lives, 
however long or short that may be. And I do not recommend an attempt at escape. You would not evade my guards and heralds for long, and should you think to find mercy at the hands of the Carsites, think again. They burn our people in Kars, and you would never be able to pass yourselves off as believers in their one god. He gestured to the guards surrounding the miscreants, who took the seven away to their fates, to the subdued approval of the crowd. Now his attention turned to Gisette. The guards brought her forward at this gesture. Paul knew what was going through the minds of many who could not see her face. How could this wealthy, pampered, delicate woman have done what she was accused of? She stared up at the king in defiance. Then her gaze went to Lan, and her expression turned to one of pure hate. Lan trembled, and would have shrunk back if the king had not put a hand on his elbow. Of all of those present, only Paul and King's own Jeddon could know how much it cost the boy just to stand there impassively. It was damnably unfair to put him through this. But worse was yet to come. You, Gisette Jelnak, stand accused and convicted of hiring men to murder heraldic trainee Lavin Firestarter. Out of your own mouth you were condemned under truth spell. Have you anything to say for yourself? Gisette shook off the restraining hand of one of her guards and stepped forward entirely unrepentant. That creature next to you is a murderer, she shrilled, and Paul was not the only person to wince at her tone. He killed my son. Put him under truth spell if you Dare, I only sought justice for my poor boy when your justice was denied me. More murmurs from the crowd, uncertainty this time. There had been rumors of this also, and Theron had decided to deal with them in public once and for all. He couldn't deny that Lan had, in the sight of witnesses, brought up fire to protect himself and Kalira. People were already thinking back to the merchant's school fire. He couldn't have confidence in the heralds undermined. So Lan would have to take the blows and bear them for his sake, and for the sake of every herald in the kingdom. I intend to, Theron said flatly. Now, in the sight of all these witnesses, so that there can be no question of the depth of your obsession and insane hatred, he stepped back. Jeddon stepped forward as Lan swallowed hard and waited. A moment later, Lan was surrounded by a faint blue glow, clearly visible against the universal white of the platform, the draping, and the white uniforms. Very few people, even those living in the capital, had actually seen a truth spell in action, and from the front to the rear they craned their necks, peering up at the platform in avid curiosity. Jeddon wasted no time. After a few preliminaries to establish that Lan was indeed Lavin Chitward, and that he had attended the merchant's school as stated, he went straight to the heart of the matter. Describe the situation between the younger pupils and the older, Jeddon ordered. In a strained voice, Lan related everything that Paul already knew about the behavior of the sixth form, as the crowd listened closely, and began to radiate disapproval not of Lan, but of the gang of bullies who had so dominated every other pupil in the school. Gisette Jelnak, however, stirred angrily. Lies! she shrieked when Lan was finished. All lies! Now the seneschal's herald stepped forward and offered Theron a sheaf of papers. This is testimony from forty other pupils of the merchant's school, all taken under truth spell and witnessed, that corroborate and add to the statements of Lavin Chitwood, he said, for the benefit of the crowd. These include statements from the boys who survived the fire and styled themselves sixth formers, and were the followers of the Jelnak boy. 
Lies! Gisette shrieked again. Theron glared at her, rapidly losing patience, a feat in itself, for Theron's patience was nothing short of monumental. Woman, you will be silent unless permission is granted you to speak, he thundered. If you cannot be silent, you will be gagged. Do you understand this? Angrily, she stared up at the king as if she were the rightful ruler and not he. Then she nodded once, sharply, with extreme reluctance. Lan was not out from under the burden yet, and Jedin returned to him. Describe from the moment that you were accosted in the classroom after dismissal precisely what occurred on the day of the fire. Shaking so that his distress must be visible even to the farthest corner of the great square, Lan complied, leaving out nothing. He faltered when trying to describe how his gift suddenly erupted and broke free of his control. Rather than coach him, Jedin asked very specific questions that enabled him to give details that would satisfy even the most skeptical that, untrained as he was, and not even knowing what it was that had happened, there was nothing he could have done to stop what had happened once it got started. The blue glow of the truth spell never wavered through all of this. Finally, Jedin asked the most important question of all. Did you intend for anyone to be hurt? He asked, almost gently. Lan shook his head. What did you want? Jedin persisted. I just wanted them to leave me alone, Lan cried, his voice breaking. All I ever wanted was to be left alone. It was obvious that not only his voice was cracking, but his nerves, and Jedin dismissed the truth spell, nodded once to the king, and stepped back into his proper place. But Gisette could no longer control herself. You see, you see, he murdered my boy in cold blood. I demand. Silence, Theron shouted, making everyone jump. Guards, gag the prisoner. The guards, looking pleased for the first time this afternoon, obeyed him with alacrity. Gisette struggled, but uselessly. In a moment she was silenced, and glared all around her with eyes so wide that the whites showed all around. Another murmur rose from the crowd, this one of approval. I'd have given the bitch the back of my hand a candle marker gone. One man behind Paul muttered to his neighbor. Trainee Lavin, called Firestarter, has demonstrated to the satisfaction of the entire guard and collegium that his gift is now under control, said the Lord Marshal over the comments of the crowd. Under attack, he eliminated the weapons of his attackers and confined them without harming them. Very good, Theron responded with utmost gravity. This, of course, was to settle any remaining unease concerning Lan's gift. And there is no doubt that the companion Kalira's choice is a true one. No doubt whatsoever, sire, Jedin supplied. And everyone knows that a companion does not choose the unworthy. Despite what poor Lan was going through, Paul had to admire the way that Theron had orchestrated these proceedings. Every possible doubt that could arise had been set up like a target and neatly knocked down. Only one possible thing remained, an analogy to what had occurred at the school that even the dullest could understand. Theron stood up and glared down at the Jelnak woman. Unrepentant to the last, she glared back up at him. Woman! Your child willfully and intentionally went about that school throwing stones aimed to hurt, he rumbled as the crowd stilled the better to hear his words. He triggered an avalanche with his stones when he aimed at trainee Lavin. The fact that the avalanche killed him is his own fault and no one else's, not the fault of Lavin or even of the avalanche itself. Those who take delight in causing harm would do well to heed his example and fate.
Paul nodded with satisfaction. Theron must have been working on those exact words for the better part of a day. He could not have chosen a better simile, or one more memorable and graphic. As for you, Theron continued, we have thought long and hard about your punishment. You are very clearly obsessed, for the warning you had and the evidence you have heard was not sufficient. Just as clearly you are no longer able to consider your actions rationally. We do not execute the insane in this land. It is obvious that your family can exert no control over you, and thus cannot be trusted with your custody. Our healers have enough to do, and we will not burden them with the duty of taking care of you. We do not want you in our prison, providing an added burden for our guards. Prison is not the place for one such as you. Fortunately, and due entirely to the consideration of the combined priesthoods of this land, a solution has been found. He gestured, and a robed figure in cream-colored wool came forward from behind the platform. Paul craned his neck along with everyone else. This was as much a surprise to him as to the rest of those here. It was a woman, but he didn't recognize the robes of her order. This is Priestess Feishan, of the cloistered order of Kurnos Sequestered, Theron announced, and Paul saw his lips curve ever so slightly as Gisette's eyes widened in recognition. I see that you know the order. For the benefit of others, Feishan's sect normally accepts only the most ardent in their faith for their way is one of the most complete seclusion. In fact, each votary is sealed into her cell for the entirety of her life, receiving her needs and nourishment through a slit in the wall and daylight through a slit window. They know when they are sealed into those cells that they will exit their cells only at death. However, given the circumstances, Priestess Feishan has graciously offered the hospitality of one of her cells, so that you may have the opportunity, through diligent prayer and contemplation, to be cured of your madness, and then, through more prayer and contemplation for as long as you may live, expiate your sin." Like her willing votaries, you will leave your cell only when you are dead. Gisette began to flail wildly. The guards took hold of her and restrained her as Priestess Feishan gazed at her with sorrow, thinly veiling profound disgust. My guards will escort her to the cloister, good lady, Theron said. They will see to it that she behaves herself until the last brick is in place. That is most appreciated, Majesty, Feishan replied and bowed deeply. She beckoned to the guards who followed her away from the platform. The crowd divided to let them pass, with the occasional brave soul hissing or otherwise expressing his or her feelings at the unfortunate Gisette. Master Jelnak himself took the opportunity to escape, slinking off to one side and rapidly getting lost among the milling people nearest the platform. But Theron held up his hand, taking back the attention of the crowd. This matter is closed, he said forcefully, and let all of you know I, Theron, King of Valdemar will hear no more accusations against this boy. Understand that he is the single most valuable herald in this land, not even second to Jedin, King's own. Well, that raised some eyebrows, not the least of which were Paul's. This wasn't part of the original script, either. What had happened since he'd last talked to the king? We need this boy's gift as we have never needed another, Theron continued, actually putting his arm around Lan's shoulders. 
Poor Lan looked as if he was about to faint. Fate, or the gods themselves, have brought him to us at a time of desperate need. People of Valdemar, we are at war. The word passed through the crowd like wildfire. War. Expected for months, yes, but not truly anticipated. Now that it was at hand, it sent a shock through everyone assembled. The land of Kaas is, even as I speak, attacking our border positions. Their bonfires are built and ready for the bodies of our priests, our heralds, our bards, and our citizens. Their demons range along the border, attacking our soldiers. Only Lavin Firestarter has the power to reach across that border to strike the sun priests who control those demons, and we thank all the gods that we have him now. He pulled Lan tight in a sudden embrace, and the crowd, shocked by his announcement, gave vent to a spontaneous cheer. But all that Paul could feel from Lan was pure terror. Lan escaped as soon as he could. It had only been Kalira's presence down behind the platform that had kept him from loosing that terrible gift of his right in the middle of all the cheering. He left Theron and the rest of the heralds as Theron continued his rousing speech about the war and dropped down to Kalira's side. She still wasn't ready to be ridden, although the healers had gone a long way toward getting her there. Together with Lan walking along beside her, they slipped away from the great square and headed back toward the Collegium. Despite Kalira's soothing presence, he was anything but calm. What am I going to do? He wailed silently at Kalira. The king said I'm... The king said what would best work to show the people that you aren't a useless danger, Chosen. Kalira interrupted. He knows you aren't anywhere near ready to be in the war yet. You've got a lot more time to train before you need to think about the war. Months, probably. Her certainty had the effect of lessening his terror a little. A lot could happen in a couple of months. Well, look what had happened already. In a couple of months, the war could be over. But if it wasn't... Kalira can't even think about killing someone, he confessed miserably. Not in cold blood, not at a distance, not like the king was saying, getting those sun priests. If someone was after you or me directly and I got mad, but not like that. Then don't, Kalira replied. There are plenty of ways to handle those sun priests. I imagine setting their robes afire would distract them fairly easily without killing them. And if they're too stupid or proud to drop down and roll in the snow, that's their problem. The image she sent along with her words of a fat fellow dancing wildly as frantic acolytes dealt with the flaming hem of his robe startled a weak laugh out of him. In fact, you could probably do as much, if not more, by setting fire to things and not papal, she continued. Hit the tents, the supplies, the weapon stocks. Drive their troops with the kind of firewall you used to hold the men in the alley. All you have to do is learn how to move them. All. Well, perhaps it was better than setting fire to people. He couldn't imagine himself in a war. He couldn't imagine what a war was like. When he and his friends had played at guards and bandits as children, the combats in their imagination had been very straightforward. It was all man to man, good against evil, no more than a few boys on either side. This war. Well, the good against evil part was clear enough, but the rest... A combat that went on and on, masses of men clashing. The moment he tried to imagine it, he found he couldn't. He couldn't see his place in that chaos either. What if he was a coward? Maybe that was why he couldn't imagine it. 
He was very glad that the great square was so near the palace, for he was able to get inside the walls long before anyone from that huge gathering could spot him. Right now, all he wanted was to hide. Kalira hesitated a moment as they neared the Collegium, but he waved her away. Go on, he urged. The others will want to hear what happened. I'll be all right. That wasn't true. The truth was that he wanted very much to be alone. He didn't want her to know just how close to the breaking point he was. She already had more than enough to worry about. He could tell that she was tired and that she ached all over and that she was even more worried about this war than he was. Worried for her friends and her sire. She didn't need any more stress. She was so exhausted that she didn't even argue with him or question him more closely. Instead, she headed straight for the stables, her head drooping. He sought sanctuary in his room, locking the door behind him. He scrunched himself into a corner of his bed and hugged his knees to his chest, resting his forehead on them. Give your enemy a face, Master Odo always said. If he is human, do not dehumanize him. Know him and know why he is your enemy. If your enemy is within you, understand what it is and why you are afraid. Put a face on your fear. When you understand it, and it is no longer vague and shapeless, you will find that your fear is no longer so formidable. That was what he said, anyway. But how could you make a war less formidable, and how could you face an all-too-concrete fear? He began to shake again, teeth chattering. How could he ever be what they wanted him to be? He was so afraid, so very afraid. Someone tapped lightly on his door. Lan, you know I know you're in there, Paul said patiently, his words for him alone. I can understand not wanting to be pestered by your friends right now, but I think maybe we can help each other. And when Lan didn't answer, Paul continued, I have to tell you, this war scares the way out of me. Harold Paul? Afraid? How could that be? But you couldn't lie mind to mind. Slowly, Lan uncurled himself, got off the bed, and went to the door. When he'd unlocked it, Paul didn't immediately come in. In fact, Lan was back in the same position on the bed when Paul pushed the door open, looked around, closed it behind him, and sat wearily on the side of the bed. I've got to make a confession to you, Lan. I've known this was coming, for some time. That's why I was put on the Privy Council. He looked up at Lan, then down at his hands. Because of you because I'm your mentor, if you want someone else now. No, Lan blurted, then blushed. No, he said more quietly. You were sworn to secrecy, I bet. Paul nodded. I was. I tried to give you some hints, but I couldn't really prepare you properly. Hellfires, I couldn't really prepare me properly. I was as stunned as you were when the king made that announcement. And I have to tell you, I am frightened witless, knowing I'm going to have to go to war. Why should you be scared? Lan asked bitterly. You've got loads more training than I do. Why? Paul's expression was as sour as Lan's. I'm more than old enough to be your father. I'm old, Lan. I don't move as fast, I don't have your endurance or your reflexes, and I don't have any gift that's powerful enough to protect me. My wife is probably going to be in the front lines as well, and do you know what the Carsites do with captured healers? If a healer cooperates, they put her in chains and force her to heal until she burns herself out. If she doesn't, they tie her to a stake and incinerate her on the spot, Lan hid his head against his knees. How could he have not thought of that? No matter what, at least he could protect himself and Kalira, and he didn't have anyone he loved facing the possibility of being burned alive. I'm sorry, he said in a whisper. I didn't think. 
Why should you? A candle mark ago, you didn't even know there was going to be a war. I've had more than a moon to brood on this. Paul didn't sound the least annoyed with Lan, and Lan finally looked up again. Paul was leaning back against the footboard of the bed, looking twenty years older than he had this morning. Anybody with any sense or imagination is going to be scared white at this prospect. Lan, you're not ready, but no one is going to be ready enough, or trained enough. The king isn't expecting you to do a fraction of what he claimed, and believe me, when we get out there, Anything you can do is going to be far more than we had before. Lan sucked at his lower lip. But if the king doesn't expect me to do all that, why did he say it in front of all those people? Paul chuckled sadly. You haven't gotten to the theory of propaganda in your studies, I suspect. In your case, he's given people something special to think about. A god's sent saviour. With you on our side, how can we lose? He's boosting their spirits, which will in turn boost the spirits of our fighters. And he didn't make all that up. With enough practice, you will be able to do all those things. Lan's eyes widened, but Paul wasn't done. What's more, he turned you from a dangerous unknown, the boy who lost control of his gift and contributed to a tragedy at the merchant's school, to the boy who was ready to sacrifice himself for the good of all Valdemar. Now people won't flinch when they see you in the street. They're more like to cheer for you. Lan flushed. That doesn't seem right, he faltered. It seems like lying. Paul sighed and shifted his weight so that the bed creaked a little. There I agree with you to a certain extent, but Theron and Jedden see it as protecting you. With this much notoriety, if any more of the Jelnaks were contemplating revenge, they won't dare try it, because with the entire city intent on your protection, nothing they tried would have a chance of succeeding. If they try to hire more thugs in Haven— the thugs themselves will turn them in. If they bring in outsiders, the outsiders will be of a certain type, and the local thugs will spot them, know why they are here, and turn them in. Lan put his head back and stared up at the ceiling. Put a face on your enemy. What, what's the Carsite army going to be like? Paul sighed and stretched out his legs, crossing them at the ankles. Despite what you might think, they aren't all fanatics. In fact, most of them aren't much different than our people. Most of the line troops will be farmers or herders or crafters. Their regular army will be in the minority, the sun priests, a smaller minority than that. What they are is terrified of us. They think that heralds are demons, that the companions are demons, and that if they are captured, they'll be sacrificed to our demon gods, slowly and painfully. That gives them a rather powerful incentive to fight. Lan brought his head down and saw that Paul was watching him, wearing an expression full of irony. Of course you realize that if you can do even a little of what we think you can— they are only going to be more convinced that heralds are demons, Paul continued, raising an eyebrow. I suppose, Lan rubbed his nose with the back of his hand. Master Odo was right. Somehow an army of farmers like Tuck's family wasn't nearly as terrifying as the faceless, mindless, implacable army he'd pictured in his mind. Paul, I don't know that I can kill anyone. I already have so many nightmares about the school. So don't, Paul replied. I haven't heard anyone suggesting that you should. So Kalira was right. Kalira said, maybe I should make firewalls or burn up their supplies and tents or something. Very good ideas. What's more, you are the only one who can dictate what you will and won't do. No one really knows what you can do here at the Collegium, and they'll know still less on the front lines. You 
Tell the generals what you can do or what you're willing to do, and they'll fit that into their plans. Paul actually smiled at Lan's surprise. You didn't know that things worked like that? No. I thought that, that people would just order me to do things, he stammered. Paul shook his head. You can't order someone with a gift. How can you enforce orders on something that no one can weigh or measure? Our people have decades of knowing how to adapt battle tactics to include some new ability, but they also know how to adapt if the person with that ability is too tired to work or doesn't have the strength that they thought as well. If Paul had intended to bring his fears down to a more reasonable level, he was succeeding. Lan was still afraid, but he didn't feel like crawling into a ball somewhere dark and shaking anymore. In fact, now there was room for another bubble of guilt and anxiety to rise to the surface of his thoughts. Madame Jelnak, he paused, as Paul cast a penetrating glance at him. If I asked the king, do you think he'd find a different place for her to go? He shuddered, thinking of the situation that Theron had described. I mean, walled up in a cave for the rest of her life, that's horrid. She's not sane, but... To his surprise, Paul chuckled again. Don't feel too sorry for her, he replied. I know something about that particular cloistered order. Not everyone who goes there is an ascetic. Sometimes it's well-born women who are recluses by nature and want to be away from the distraction of the world to concentrate on religious scholasticism, meditation and prayer. It's no cave that Gisette Jelnak is going to be walled into. It's a very comfortable little apartment, with its own little bathing room and all. She can have anything her family wants her to have in there. She'll just never get out, and it all becomes the property of the Order after she's gone. He chuckled again. In fact, I have no doubt that the Order is going to charge her family a princely amount for her keep and comfort, given that she's a prisoner and it serves them all right. Are you sure? Lan asked, his conscience considerably eased, now that his mental picture of a dank, barren, shadow-filled cell had been replaced by a very different vision. So sure that I'll take you there to see for yourself if you need to be convinced, Paul told him. He stood up. Thank you, Lan. Me? Lan said, surprised. For what? Talking to you helped me to put a face on the enemy. Remember what Master Odo always tells us. He touched his eyebrow with two fingers in a little salute. I think that we'll put off practice for today. I don't think that either of us want to be the center of a circle of gawkers just now. Lan nodded and belatedly remembered his manners. He scooted off the bed and went to open the door for his mentor. If I were you, Paul finished, as he paused halfway out the door, I'd go out to Kalira. I think she needs you quite a bit right now. I will, Lan promised, and before Paul was more than halfway down the hall, he had gotten his cloak and was out the door, heading for the stables at a trot. 19. The departure of a mere ten trainees should not have made that much difference in the way that the Collegium Halls felt, but it did. Ten rooms empty, and the place had a hollower sound to it, the sense that something was missing, or amiss. Paul told himself that he was being overly dramatic, but from the nervous way his pupils were acting, they felt the same. Laughter sounded forced or strained, voices were hushed, and jokes were far, far fewer. Ten trainees had been hustled into whites months before they were due to graduate and sent off to the South. They would finish their training the old-fashioned way, paired with a mentor with the same gift expected to act as his or her backup. It was the way that heralds had been trained in Vaniel's time, revived in the current crisis, and no one liked it. Weapons master Odo, who'd had some choice words for those who'd thought of it, liked it least of all. If it hadn't been that the trainees themselves had been willing, even eager, to go, the whole plan might well have collapsed at that moment. But the trainees themselves talked the weapons master around, 
and so they went. What disturbed Paul more than their leave-taking was that by the end of that same week, twelve companions had presented themselves to be tacked up and had gone out to make their choices. Twelve. Were they choosing replacements for those who would soon die in this war? He didn't have the courage to ask Satyron. All too soon another set of two young trainees would follow the first set, and by spring, if not sooner, he and Lan would follow the same path. He shook off his worries and headed for the field where Lan was waiting for him. Satyron stood at the fence, watching him approach with ears perked forward. He climbed the fence and used it as a help to get onto Satyron's bare back. His companion carried him deep into the field, to a spot where straw sheaves set up as targets by Master Odo were just barely visible. Paul slid down from Satyron's back. Lan smiled at his mentor, but his smile could not disguise the fact that he had dark shadows around his eyes, and that he was too thin. He had been working like one possessed, as if by working himself to exhaustion he could drive away the demons that haunted his dreams. I can understand that, Paul thought, reflecting on his own dreams. Odo's ready he said, gesturing at the distant specks, well to the side of the straw targets. Get the straw bales first, then see if you can surround the practice ground at this distance. Lan nodded. He was long past merely flaming volleys of arrows. If that was all that was wanted, he could deal with archers from dawn to dusk. Now he was learning to reach distant targets, to create and hold walls of flame much longer and higher than the ones he'd used to pen in his attackers in the alley. Every day his control grew finer, his reach farther. Paul had always known that Lan's gift was powerful, but until now he'd had no way to judge how powerful it would be when he had learned to use it to its fullest. Now he knew and sometimes he shuddered to think about it. One day, perhaps one day soon, they would not call him Lavin Firestarter anymore. No, no, it would be another name entirely. Lavin Firestorm. It wouldn't happen here, though. The kind of raw emotion it would take to fuel a firestorm couldn't be generated by the memories of old angers, though these days it only took a glance at the scar on Kalira's hip to produce as impressive a firewall as was needed. The first firestorm would probably come in a moment of desperate need on the front lines. And when it did, Paul resolutely turned his thoughts away from that path. Troubles enough dogged their footsteps without thinking too hard about that. Lan shaded his eyes with one hand, the other on Kalira's neck, and frowned fiercely. Paul watched the targets. What Lan was working on now was the control that would permit him to ignite the targets instantaneously, with no smoke or heat to warn of what was happening. Lan nodded, as if he was counting, and his frown grew fiercer. Then, one, two, three, four. Deceptively tiny fire blossoms engulfed the far-off targets, and the specks that were Master Odo and his hand-picked trainee volunteers leaped back. A moment later, the breeze brought the faint sounds of their voices, high-pitched exclamations that told Paul the trial had succeeded. Frenzied activity around the burning targets ensued, until the fires were out. Then the distant figures gathered together in the center of the practice ground, very much like a beleaguered group of fighters trying to protect themselves and each other. Lan's face twisted into a mask of anger. His free hand clenched at his side. He glared at the distant grouping. He'd brought up sheltering walls of flame before, but not at anywhere near this distance. For a moment, as Lan's face grew red with strain, Paul thought he would not be able to manage it this time either. But then, a speck, a gleam of yellow against the white snow, warned him that Lan had managed something, at any rate. Slowly enough that Paul could follow the track, a wavering line of flame encircled the group at a healthy distance. It remained no more than knee-high for a few heartbeats, then finally roared upward a scarlet and golden waterfall in reverse. The flames reached to the height of a house, 
then stopped. Lan held them long enough to be certain that he could hold them for a candle mark at least, then with a gasp, let it all go. The fire went out as if snuffed by a giant hand, and the distant helpers broke up their group and milled curiously about, examining the melted lines where the flames had been. That was a good trick, making flames burn on top of snow until the snow was melted enough to get the fuel beneath. Paul still didn't know how Lan managed it. Good job, he enthused, clapping Lan on the back. Go report to Master Odo for details, then go take yourself a short rest. I will, the boy replied, looking more drained than before, pulling himself up onto Kalira's back. I need it. And get something to eat, too, Paul shouted after him as he and his companion trotted off. You're too thin! He walked back with Saturon, watching from a distance as Lan discussed his actions with Odo and Odo's assistants, then rode to the door of the Collegium where he dismounted and went inside. Paul purposely hadn't accompanied him. He wanted the boy to learn to do things without being shepherded. When they got to the front, he'd have to think for himself. He left Saturon at the gate with a pat on his neck and went back into the Collegium to report on Lan's progress. Once inside, young Tuck hurried past him, with his arms full of books and dark circles under his eyes. Paul intercepted him. Isn't this supposed to be your free time? he asked. Tuck grimaced. If I'm going to go with you and Lan, I've got to get a better handle on my car site, he replied, and hurried off. Paul sighed. He's working himself as hard as Lan is. God's above. What are we doing to these children? Tuck was determined to be with Lan when he was sent out, and had lost all of his lazy habits in an effort to cram as much as he could into every candle mark, so that when Lan was sent south, he too would be deemed ready. That would give Paul not one, but two trainees to keep track of. On the other hand, Tuck would supply a second hand at keeping Lan settled and in control of himself. Paul knew that very well. So how could he discourage the boy? The best he could do for Tuck was the same he was doing for Lan, try to make sure he ate and slept enough. It could have been worse for both of them. There were plenty of children in impoverished families who would have thought their current situation the equivalent of a holiday. So many of the trainees were driving themselves just as hard that Paul hardly knew whether to admire them or despair. Of all of them, however, only Lan had ever been the target of an enemy determined to slay him. They had no idea what they were going to face. It's a wonder Odo isn't a drunkard. I don't know how he manages to train these children to go out and get hurt or killed year after year. Of course, that was the case with all of the teachers, but only Odo had that fact shoved in his face day after day. And yet, the trainees were better equipped and better warned for what they would face than all those fresh-faced, eager volunteers for the guard and the army. From cities and towns, from farms and fields, from every imaginable background, they formed up little companies and marched themselves to the capital. New cadres arrived in Haven daily to camp in the meadows outside the walls, train for a few weeks under the stern eyes of guard sergeants, and march on with newly assigned officers from the seasoned troops. They trained as they traveled and, presumably, would be fit for combat when they arrived at the border. But even at that, they wouldn't get much more than a moon's worth of battle training before they took up their arms in earnest. Paul was thankful he didn't have charge over them. He'd never be able to sleep at night. You don't sleep that well as it is, Saturon observed correctly. You carry enough burdens of your own. Speaking of which, are you going to another privy council meeting? If so, they're in the king's quarters, not the lesser council chamber. Trust Saturon to stay on top of things for him. Yes, I am, and thank you, he replied gratefully, and instead of turning left when he passed the door marking the entrance to the palace, he turned right and penetrated deep into the heart of the palace. The closer he drew to the seat of power, the more guards he passed, until he reached the door of the royal suite itself.
Instead of the usual two guards, there were six. Theron was taking no chances with the safety of himself or his family. Paul nodded to the two guards actually on either side of the door itself, recognizing both of them. One of them opened the door for him, and Paul stepped right into the midst of the ongoing meeting. They all stopped long enough to greet him, then returned to the discussion at hand, the contributions of those first ten trainees who'd been rushed into service. Paul took a seat next to the fire and listened. Jeddin was the one making the report. Roland was fully capable of mind-speaking to any companion in the country, no matter how far apart they were, so it was Roland who relayed these reports to his chosen. It was fairly clear why Theron had chosen to hold the meeting in his private quarters. Warmth and comfort. Even the lesser council chamber was drafty and chill, and the seats around the council table were hard and unyielding. Granted, this did tend to lead to shorter council sessions, which in itself wasn't a bad thing, but why endure discomfort when you didn't have a reason to? Not that anyone was lolling about by any means, but there were not going to be any long, drawn-out arguments from this lot. Like Paul, everyone here had so much to do that they resented a single wasted moment. The gist of Jeddin's report was that the newly promoted youngsters were doing as well or better than they had been expected to. All of them had gifts that were particularly useful in a battlefield situation. Of the ten, six were strong mind speakers and acted as communications liaisons all along the front. Two were farseers and essentially functioned as scouts, spying on the movements of enemy troops. One, an animal mind speaker, was able to use the birds of the region for the same purpose. The last had one of those quirky gifts that did not, at first, seem particularly useful until one saw it in action. This youngster had very short-term foresight, the sort of thing that led his friends to ban him from games of chance. His range was no more than a candle mark, and he did not actually see anything so much as get a sense of what would happen, given the present conditions. But that made him incredibly useful during battles. He could tell those in command where they could expect to see a push by enemy forces far enough in advance of the actual occurrence to bring forces of their own to meet the opposition. This, of course, did not guarantee victory by any means, but at least it helped to prevent defeats. All ten youngsters had fit themselves in quickly, enabling their mentors to spend most of their time in service rather than in supervision. When Jeddin was finished, Theron's pointed look prodded Paul to speak. Lavin is able to hit specific targets at a distance of twenty furlongs, and I have no reason to think that farther distance is going to make any difference in his ability to burn them. As long as he can see something, he can hit it. He can bring up firewalls to surround troops and hold them for a full candle mark, or move them and hold them for a quarter candle mark. His only limitation is how long he can sustain anger. Paul took a deep breath and answered the unspoken question in every face. He's as ready as you want, I think. Only practice is going to make him more than he is now. He isn't going to get the kind of practice he needs on bales of straw, Theron said bluntly. If his only limitation is sustaining his anger, then to provoke his abilities to the fullest he needs to be on the front lines. The first time he sees what the Carsites are doing to our people. Paul dared to raise a hand, cutting the king off. I respect that you have to think of the large of you, Your Majesty, he replied, feeling slightly sick. But please remember that this is a boy not yet old enough to be accepted as a volunteer in the guard. I never forget it, Theron said, softening his eagle look a trifle. But there are plenty of young volunteers his age that are lying about their years and going to the front anyway. I know that we aren't catching more than half of them and sending them home. Under other circumstances, Lavin might have been one of them. Knowing Lan's former aspirations, Paul could only nod agreement. Poor Lan might well have considered volunteering and going to fight the lesser evil, given a choice between the guard and further torment at the merchant's school. So the only question is... 
How soon can you go? Theron asked. You'll be his mentor, of course. Not until his friend Tuck is also ready. Paul seized on that as a delaying tactic. I want Tuck's help. He needs his friends to keep him steady. Hmm, I can see that. We don't want an emotional youngster with that particular gift feeling friendless. Theron nodded. Jedden, have a word with the other boys' teachers. Has he any other friends? Paul's daughter, Jedden volunteered. Young healer, well in advance of the rest of the trainees her age, ready to go into full greens from what I hear. Mind healer. Which we will have need of there, and she can see to it that he stays sane. Good. See if she wants to volunteer as well, Theron decreed. Paul blanched, but held his peace. There was always the chance that Eleanor would not volunteer. With a chance to follow Lan, you're fooling yourself, old man. He felt even sicker now. But they'll be protected. They're all too valuable to let anything happen to them. They'll be as safe or safer than if they were here. Paul, Theron added, with a hint of sympathy. Lavin Firestarter may be the one person who can turn this war for us. When his sun priests start incinerating, the son of the sun may think better of prosecuting this idiocy and pull back behind the border again. Lan is all right burning inanimate objects, but he has serious mental difficulties— Paul began. Jedden interrupted him. I have good reason to think he'll lose those reservations when he actually sees fighting, the King's Own said grimly. What kind of good reason? Is it that bad out there? Paul wondered. He'd heard vague rumors of things the Carsite sun priests were doing. Were those rumors based in fact? He didn't get any time to contemplate that. Theron was already going on. Given that your daughter will be with you, do you still want to have your wife return to Healer's Collegium when you leave? He asked. Or would you rather have the three of you together? Let me think about it. He temporized. And let me see if I can get a message to her. I don't think that I want to make a decision about this without asking her opinion first. That may be the wisest thing you've ever said, Saturon observed. Hush. That's a reasonable request, the king agreed. Jedin, put it on your agenda. We can schedule your departure as soon as we know what your lady thinks. Roland is going to think he's nothing but a messenger service. This time Saturon was actually snickering. Paul let him. There was little enough these days to be amused about. The discussion turned to other trainees older than Lan who might be candidates for assignment to the border, but none of them were as ready as the ones who had already left, or as necessary as Lavin. Paul listened, but didn't often need to give his opinion, and he was relieved when no one, not even the king, thought that there were any more trainees who should be hurried into whites. Ten, twelve, if you counted Lan and Tuck, were enough. Good gods, twelve, and twelve companions went out. All we're doing is replacing trainees. Somehow that made him feel much better. In Healer's Collegium, and to a lesser extent Bardic, this same discussion was taking place. If Paul closed his eyes, he could sense the flood of resources, the redirection of attention to the south. This war did not yet command the entirety of Valdemar, but it soon would and it would continue to devour lives and resources until it ended. However it ended. Valdemar would be perfectly willing to end the war with the withdrawal of Carsite troops back across their own border. Kars, however, would not stop short of destroying Valdemar, unless the war became so expensive that their religious and secular leader, the self-styled Son of the Sun, called a retreat. This particular son of the sun was so firmly on the sun throne that it would take a great deal before his rule was shaken. 
and not until then would he give way. This was a holy crusade in their eyes, and they had been planning it for most of Paul's life. I believe that will be all for now, the king decreed, and Paul pulled himself out of his own thoughts to rise and bow himself out with the rest. Had spring already begun down there? He longed for spring with all of his being, and yet dreaded it. Spring would allow the freer movement of troops. With spring, the slaughter would begin in earnest. This has been hanging over our heads all our lives, Saturon observed sadly, as Paul reached his own quarters and went inside. And now that it's here, even for me, it doesn't seem quite real. Ah, old friend, it will be real enough, all too soon, he replied. Be grateful for the respite. He knew that he was. He would have to tell the youngsters that they were going soon, and then he would savor every single moment of every day until word came from Ilya. And that, he feared, would be very, very soon. So we're both going! Tuck said happily, sprawled over Lan's bed while Lan occupied a pile of cushions in front of the fire, soaking up heat like a cat. I was afraid they'd leave me behind. I almost wish they would, Lan replied. At Tuck's stricken look, he added hastily, Not because I don't want you along, but Tuck, this isn't a lark or a training exercise. I know that, Tuck said scornfully, interrupting him. But you're my best friend, and I don't want you to go off anywhere without me along. Besides, Ma would skin me if I wasn't there. She'd want to know we were together so we could watch each other's backs. He lolled his head over to the side of the bed and gave Lan what he probably thought was a reproving glare. Privately, Lan still thought that Tuck had no idea of what they were getting into, but he didn't say anything more. He was touched and comforted, knowing that Tuck would be there for no other reason but that they were friends. Bless him. Tuck would be facing their enemy not with a formidable gift at his disposal, but with nothing more than a bow and arrows and mind speech. Surely Tuck had more to fear from this conflict than Lan did. I don't know why Eleanor is coming along, though, Tuck continued, frowning at his fingernails. She can't even fight, and she's not a regular healer. He shrugged. Maybe it's to take care of people who've seen too much fighting. I don't know why she's coming either, Lan admitted. A draft touched his neck, and he put another log on the fire. And I hate to sound like I don't like her, but I don't think this is the right thing for her to be doing, and I wish they'd let her stay here. Tuck made a face. War is no place for girls, he intoned, self-importantly. She's going to take one look and beg to go home. Of that, Lan was far from as sure as Tuck. I think you're wrong there, he countered. I think she's more likely to try and do too much and hurt herself trying. She hasn't got all the practice that the older healers have, so she'd know how to pace herself. He sighed. It doesn't matter anyway. They said she should go and she's going to. The real reason that he wished Eleanor wasn't coming along was very personal. He didn't understand her or the way she was acting around him. Kalira only said she'll outgrow it when he asked his companion's opinion, but wouldn't tell him what Eleanor was supposed to outgrow. For a while, Eleanor would be fine, just like always, a regular friend. A little bossy, maybe, but sometimes girls were like that. Then, for no reason at all, she'd go melancholy and calf-eyed, and if he pressed her to say something or explain what was wrong, she'd just go sullen. Or worst of all, a couple of times she'd gone bursting into tears and running away. And when he saw her again, she'd pretend it hadn't happened. He was afraid that she was under as much stress as he was. After all, her mother was already in the fighting. Her father was going there, and so were her friends though her odd behavior had predated the announcement of war. But she probably heard things from Harold Paul that no one else did. She probably knew there was going to be war way before the rest of us. He certainly hoped so. Selfishly, he didn't want to have to deal with anyone else's troubles, and he certainly didn't want to find himself burdened with a weepy girl on a long trip. Not that long, 
Calera corrected. Six to ten days at the most. We'll all share carrying Eleanor as the double rider, and you have no idea how fast and far we can go in a day. Six to ten days. Lan would never have believed anyone but Calera. Why, it took the average caravan a full month to go from Haven to the southern border. And that was on the main road, pushing hard with fit horses in the traces, not oxen, which would be a lot slower. He supposed he could put up with Eleanor for ten days anyway, and once they were at their assignment, she'd have too much to do to have time for bouts of self-pity or whatever it was. I know what you're going to be doing, but I wonder what they'll want with me, Tuck said, looking worried and self-conscious as the thought occurred to him. I mean, all I've got is mind speaking. You'll be with me, because it takes everything Kalira has to keep me from losing control. Lan told him. She won't have anything to spare to mind to speak anyone but me. You'll be my contact with whoever is giving orders, through the herald that's with him. We'll be behind the main front lines, somewhere high, I expect, where I can see what I need to hit or hurt. But anybody would do for that, Tuck began anxiously. Oh no, I don't want some stranger, Lan replied sharply. I don't want somebody who might grab my elbow or shout in my ear when I don't respond or anything else. You know what not to do around me. I guess, Tuck responded, with relief and the respect only someone who had seen Lan's latest practice sessions would possess. Lan was just grateful that his year mates gave him respect and not the poorly disguised fear that his own parents showed. Of his family... Once the secret that he was responsible for the merchant's school fire was out, and the fact that the king himself was Lan's personal protector, only Macy wanted anything to do with him. He'd even gotten a note of groveling apology from that loud-mouthed uncle who had so disparaged heralds at the midwinter feast. If it hadn't given him such a sour taste in his mouth, it would have been funny. It was very clear from the note that the stupid lout didn't mean a word of his apology. He just didn't want his nephew to casually incinerate him in a fit of pique. Macy, thank the gods, was still just as comfortable with him as ever, and he wished, in a way, that he could take her along as well. But if war was no place for Eleanor, it was doubly no place for Macy. I wish Macy could come, Tuck said in a wistful echo of his own thoughts. Tuck rolled over on his back and stared up at the ceiling. But she'd be lost out there and probably scared too. I think she'd be more annoyed than scared and frustrated that there wasn't anything she could do, Lan responded, out of his new respect for the little sister. Macy had not only done what he'd suggested and found new teachers at the guildhouse, she'd informed their mother in no uncertain terms that embroidery for fancy garments was a waste of time and resources under the present circumstances, and that for the duration she was going to be making banners and badges for guard units. And what was more, she was spending her free time making lint bandages for the healers and knitting socks and fingerless gloves for the archers, and her mother could just hold parties without her help. The end result was that their mother had been shamed into organizing the entire guild to do the same. The numbers of fingerless gloves streaming southward would probably ensure that every archer in the army had warm hands before too long. Macy would just drive us all crazy because she couldn't really do anything, Lan repeated confidently. But if this goes on for very long, I wouldn't bet on not seeing her. She's just as likely to get trained as a healer's assistant so she can follow us. Tuck brightened so much at that idea that Lan had to smother a smile. I hope your mother hasn't got some fat merchant picked out for Macy, because there's going to be a war of an entirely different kind in Haven if she tries to bully your sister into a wedding. Kalira observed, for once, without a trace of merriment at Tuck's expense. I was in doubt at first, but I think those two are remarkably well suited, and that's not the usual thing for a Harold. If they ever wed... It's usually another Harold, a bard or a hailer. Oh, why? Lan asked, curiously. Usually someone from one of the circles is the only person likely to understand how duty comes first, and understand how important our bond is. 
Now Kalira sounded oddly sad, and he wondered why. Perhaps she had just seen too many blighted romances. It wasn't at all unusual for brief courtships or even full-blown affairs to spring up between heralds or trainees and members of the highborn families. Heralds, after all, could be trusted to keep their mouths shut, which was more than could be said for the members of the highborn class. But in the overwhelming majority of the cases, those romantic interludes were doomed to end. Perhaps Kalira had just told him why. Macy likes you too, he blurted, and was rewarded by Tuck's crimson blush that spread over his ears and down the back of his neck. I think she's the best girl I've ever met, Tuck declared stoutly. She's not anywhere near as silly as my sister's. She's got a head on her shoulders, and she knows what she wants to do. And, whoa, she's my sister. I'm perfectly aware of her virtues. Lan laughed, glad to have something to laugh about at last. I think she's pretty fine myself, and I'll tell you something else, if you were worrying about it. Before she'd let Mother nag her into marrying some old guild goat, she'd run off barefoot in the snow, and within a day she'd probably have wangled herself not only boots, but a cloak and a travelling pack, and she'd be on her way to somewhere she thought she'd be properly appreciated. Like here, for instance. Tuck had no reply for that, other than an even deeper blush, but he looked relieved and grateful. Have you got kitchen duty? he asked instead. Lan shook his head. Paul told me that they were relieving anyone in line to be graduated early from all chores, so we can actually get some rest once in a while, in between practice and study. Whoo! Well, that's one good thing this war's done for us, Tuck exclaimed with pleasurable surprise. I guess it's true that inside every rotten thing there's a touch of sweet. Lan decided not to spoil things by replying that he would much rather have a county full of dirty dishes to wash and not have a war. I guess that's true, he agreed instead. So why not take advantage of our exalted status, hog a couple of hot baths, then drift into early dinner like members of the gentry? Sounds good to me. Tuck responded and stretched luxuriously. Take advantage of the bathing room while we still get to use it, eh? Good plan, Lan said, and hope that the bathing room is all that we miss. Twenty. They left at dawn while the sun barely peaked above the horizon, trying without success to burn through the same slate-gray clouds that had hidden the sky for the past week. Eleanor rode pillion behind her father, her belongings shared out among the three of them. Lan, Tuck, and Paul carried very little. They needed no supplies for the road, for they would spend their nights at inns, each journey carefully calculated to bring them to their day's destination three or four candle marks after sunset. They each carried only enough in the way of clothing to get them to the army. After that, they would be supplied as regularly as if they were at the collegium. Eleanor and her things were no burden to the three companions. Halfway between Haven and the border, they would meet up with Paul's wife, Healer Ilya, at one of their nightly stops. She and Paul would decide then if she would return with them to the army or go back to Haven. Lan privately hoped that her mother would persuade Eleanor to turn back and go with her to Healer's Collegium. It was cold, mortally cold, this morning. The snow had thawed and frozen so many times that now it was granular and crunchy. No one could have made snow figures or snowballs out of it even if they'd had the heart to. It wasn't only the Collegium that had lost young people to this war. It was the palace as well. The court had been decimated by the rush to volunteer until it was said in the halls of the Collegium that the only courtiers left were those who could not be spared, the lame and the old. Lan put all that behind him as they rode out of the south gate, one he had not yet used, and trotted through the silent city. A few early risers looked out of their windows when they heard the chiming hoofbeats of the companions. Those who spotted them or encountered them waved solemnly or gave little nods. Lan noted that Paul always returned these little gestures of respect, and did likewise. He felt very strange in his new whites, 
and he couldn't forget for a moment that he was wearing his new uniform. The whites were made of entirely different materials than the grays and were tailored to him. Trainee uniforms were comfortable enough, but full whites were little more than a second skin. Where the gray tunics were heavy canvas or wool, the field whites were butter-soft doe-skin. The winter shirts that went beneath the tunics were shira wool or rami and linen. The trainees made do with wool or plain linen. Trues were doe-skin again. Trainees got canvas. Hose beneath the trues were finely knitted linen or shira wool, where trainees got stockings of heavier wool or baggy woven linen. Only in the matter of boots did trainees and heralds fare alike. After due consideration and consultation with Master Odo, neither Lan nor Tuck wore swords, though both had daggers and bows. The weapons master deemed neither of them able enough with the longer blade to be effective with it, and Lan was just as glad. He felt awkward enough with the heavy dagger at his belt and the quiver on his back, and he was used to using both. It hadn't snowed for two weeks and the old snow piled along the sides of the street had gotten to a fairly grimy stage. Everything conspired to produce an aura of depression, from the thin, gray light to the dirty, weather-beaten snow to the cracked paint and chipped trim on houses and shops that wouldn't be repaired until spring. He was glad when they left the city at last and into the countryside, where at least things didn't look quite as tired and tatty. Once out of the city, the companions took up a very peculiar pace. Not a trot, not a fast walk, certainly not a canter. It was very like the lope of a wolf, the ground-eating stride that members of the canine family could keep up for candle marks at a time, or perhaps the long-legged stride that elk used to migrate. It was a comfortable pace for a rider, a smooth, rocking motion. There was an arrangement of straps on Kalira's saddle, now rolled up and tucked out of the way, that would allow Lan to strap himself in so that he could even sleep while she moved onward. He reckoned that he would have to be very tired before he tried that little trick, but Harold's had certainly used it before. Paul rode slightly ahead of Lan and Tuck. From time to time, Eleanor would look back at them and smile, but for the most part, she seemed engrossed in the scenery, what there was of it. The early part of the morning took them through a patchwork of fields inhabited by sheep or cattle, pawing through the snow to get to the grass beneath, or cultivated fields that waited for the plow beneath a thick blanket of white. Not an unblemished blanket, though. Tracks of animals, the occasional human and birds, marked the surface. Once Lan spotted the place where a fox had taken a rabbit or something about that size by the tracks and the churned-up spot. Another time the predator had clearly been a hawk, since the only footprints were those of the hare, and they ended in a splash of dark, old blood. By mid-morning they had passed their first village. Every person that was about gathered along the side of the road to wave them onward, faces solemn. All three of them returned the salutes this time. Only Eleanor didn't wave, and that was largely because she was too busy holding to her father's waist with both mittened hands. No one looked askance at a green-clad healer riding pillion behind a herald. Evidently, that was just as familiar a sight as that of the heralds themselves riding south. They were through the village quickly, and out into the countryside just as the first flurries began to fall. Through air, chill and quiet, without so much as a stirring of breeze, the tiny flakes dusted over the old snow and softened the edges of the bare branches. For a while it was a pleasure to ride beneath. He and Tuck actually started a game of trying to catch snowflakes on their tongues before they began to get truly hungry. By the time their stomachs were making embarrassing noises so that even Paul glanced back with a thin smile, they reached a village large enough to support an inn at last. The companions slowed to a walk just as Lan spotted the welcome sign hanging over a door and Paul pulled them all up beneath it. They didn't dismount, though, much to Eleanor's open dismay and Lan's secret disappointment. One of the inn servitors brought hot meat and berry pies wrapped in napkins and mugs of cider that steamed in the cold air. They ate in the saddle while the servant went back inside, though perhaps ate was too tame a word for the way they wolfed down the food. 
and exchanged empty mugs and napkins for packets of paper-wrapped sausage, bread and cheese when the servant returned. Paul saluted the man, tossed him a coin as a tip, and they were off again before a quarter of a candle mark had passed. The snow thickened as they ate, and soon after their departure it was no longer flurries, it was fat flakes. The air seemed a trifle warmer and held a distinct dampness. Snow curtained the road in front of them, and the companions slowed, although their pace was still faster than any horse would set. This is going to get thicker, Calera said at last, the first that she had actually spoken since they left the Collegium. Not a blizzard, but a thick snowfall. We won't be terribly slowed, but they'll have to get the road crews out before nightfall. It's going to take us longer to reach our inn than I thought, Paul called back over his shoulder. Are you all right with that, or would you rather we stopped at the first inn we find at about the time we expected to stop? The look of agony that Eleanor cast back over her shoulder decided Lan. Stop when we find an inn, please, he replied. It might not be as comfortable, but we're not used to riding for this long. Ah, right. The startled, then thoughtful look that Paul gave back to him suggested to Land that the senior herald had understood who we really was. His next move confirmed it as he directed them all to stop for a moment and get down to stretch their legs and take care of other pressing business. The snow was thick enough now to provide a modesty curtain for them all, which relieved Lan considerably. The cold made things awkward enough without the added factor of embarrassment in front of Eleanor. She's not doing too badly yet, Tuck observed as they washed their hands with snow. Not a peep out of her. Lan kept his doubts to himself and just nodded. He really hoped that the rigors of this journey would convince Eleanor to turn back around. Paul mounted Saturon and extended his hand to his daughter. He pulled Eleanor back up onto the pillion, and she tried not to wince. No, sweetling, don't sit astride, he told her, as she tried to get her leg over Saturon's rump. Sit side-saddle fashion. We aren't going to be going that fast. You'll be safe enough, and it's a different position for your legs. You'll be all right. The young healer obeyed him. Although this was a less stable position, it clearly gave her aching legs a lot of relief, given her expression. Paul looked back to see that the other two were mounted and waved them on. The snow was so thick now that Lan couldn't see more than a wagon's length to either side of the road or ahead. They might just as well have been moving along on a treadmill, going nowhere. It was an odd feeling. The snow itself, light and fluffy, took no effort for the companions to push through. Things might be different, though, if the wind began to blow. Wind would create drifts and pack the snow hard where it collected. He hoped they wouldn't get any before they stopped for the night. It could turn the last hours of the day into a waking nightmare, not to mention what it would be like for the poor companions. Thank you for thinking of me at last. Kalira teased. Perhaps I ought to stop thinking of things that can go wrong, he observed ironically as a light wind picked up and blew the falling flakes toward them. Isn't that like trying not to think of a blue cow? She replied and bowed her head into the wind. Better fasten your cloak tight while you can. Lan took her advice, making certain that every clasp on his cloak was fastened tightly and that his scarf was wrapped around his neck and tucked in, tying the strings of his hood tight around his face. Glancing to the side, he saw that Tuck was doing the same, so he must have been warned. Paul, the old hand at this, needed no warning. He must have buttoned himself up while waiting for them to come back from stretching their legs. The wind picked up noticeably, and as darkness fell, it was impossible to tell where the road was, much less where Paul and Tuck were. Lan just put his head down and closed his eyes, keeping one hand just holding the reins loosely, the other tucked inside his cloak. Wind-blown snow caked his cloak and hood, and after a few futile attempts to shake it off, he gave up and allowed it to collect. As the light faded into a thick, blue-tinged dusk and from dusk into full dark, there was no sign of anyone living along the road, although Lan knew that they must be passing by farms and even small villages. 
Candles and lanterns couldn't penetrate this weather. The only way we're going to find an inn is by running into it, he said anxiously. No worries. We know where we are, even if you can't see, Kalira replied. Tox keeping track of exactly where the farms are in case we have to go to ground as someone's guest. He just opened up his shields a bit without actually hearing anyone's thoughts. He can lead us straight to a farmhouse if need be. And Paul and Saturan have been this way a dozen times. It might seem like forever, but we'll be at an inn before they clear away the supper dishes and close the kitchen for the night. He certainly hoped so. With all his precautions, he was still getting awfully cold. The wind found its way under his cloak in so many places it was useless to try to identify them and close them off. And luncheon was wearing mightily thin. He worried off one snow-caked glove with the help of his teeth, biting into the ice-crusted fingertips to hold it while he slipped his hand out. He certainly couldn't see well enough to keep track of a loose glove, and as for holding on to it with his other benumbed hand, already clutching reins and pommel, that was out of the question. He fished his paper-wrapped package of bread and cheese out of his belt pouch, unwrapped it, managed to stow the paper in his pouch and wriggle his fingers back into his glove without dropping anything. The cheese and bread weren't cut. A small hand-sized loaf had one end cut out, a hollow made, and the cheese stuffed into it. That made less to drop, and it was easier for gloved hands to hold. He bit into it, getting drink as well as food in the form of the snow that coated every bite. The bread, cold, toughened, and chewy, made his jaws ache, but it eased the hunger pains in his gut, and he was glad to have it. There was one thing to be said for tough, chewy bread. It didn't crumble the way pastry would. He had no way of cleaning up a mess at the moment. Poor Kalira had nothing at all to sustain her, and he saved half of his bread for her, although it wasn't much more than a generous mouthful. He held it down near his knee and felt her turn her head and take it from him. With the bitless bridle that companions wore, she could chew in complete comfort. Thank you, love she said gratefully. That helps. He wondered how the others were faring. Eleanor at least had her father's broad back to shelter behind. She couldn't possibly be as cold as he, Tuck, and Paul were. And she had Paul right with her. For all he could sense, he and Kalira might have been completely on their own in this storm. The wind howled and sobbed among the trees on either side of the road. At least, he assumed there were trees on either side of the road, since wind usually didn't make those sort of noises sweeping by itself unintercepted across an empty plain. He thought he heard branches rattling above him, and hoped that none of them were weak enough to come down just as they were riding beneath. That would be bad, Kalira agreed. Her response didn't exactly comfort him. Soon, he told himself. She said it would be soon. If nothing else, we'll have something hot to eat and drink, a fire, and a flat place to sleep soon. But it was impossible to tell how fast or slow they were going, and there was nothing to give him any clue to the passing of time. If his life depended on it, he couldn't have told how long it had been since he'd eaten that bread. We're nearly there, Kalira told him as he wriggled his numbing toes in his boots to try to get them a little warmer. If we could see through this muck, we'd see the end windows from here. Wherever here was. But his heart warmed even if his feet didn't, and he sat up a little straighter in the saddle, which turned out to be a mistake as he immediately let in another cold draft under his cloak. Still, nearly there was accurate. Sooner than he'd thought, they were dismounting stiffly in front of a tiny inn, distinguished chiefly by the wooden wheat sheaf over the door. Their hostess herself, a round bundle of cloak, conducted them to the stables after helping Eleanor inside. The stables were nothing but a single, stoutly built shed, but the shed had thick walls made of mud brick and a thatched roof, and that freedom from the driving wind alone made it seem as warm as a cozy kitchen. With the help of the hostess, Paul and Tuck dragged in straw for bedding and hay for fodder, while Lan filled buckets of water from the pump and set up more buckets of grain, 
then stripped all three companions of their tack and rubbed them down. With straw knee-deep on the floor and blankets of wool patchwork thrown over them, the companions munched their way gratefully through their belated dinners, and the heralds followed the innkeeper back into the tiny inn. Tiny it might be, but it was a snug little place, nicely warmed by a good fire. Eleanor huddled beside it, but she wasn't just warming herself. She was tending a pot that bubbled over it. Ye be my only guests, Sir Harold, the innkeeper said to Paul as they both took off their cloaks and hung them on pegs cemented into the wall of the fireplace. This is not a big place, belike, her round face was anxious. Haven't a got guest room, only me own bed above. Girl can sleep with me, but... So long as you have enough straw for us, Paul replied, we'll make do on the floor and be grateful. Her anxious face lightened. No need of straw, got feather bed begging now for three. Peas pottage suit ya, or you'd rather I kill a chicken. Anything hot right now is far preferable even to a feast in a candle mark. Paul laughed. Come along, boys, let's give our hostess a hand. The inn was nothing more than a single room, really. There was no kitchen. All cooking was done on the hearth. The brick floor was spotlessly clean, though, with any vestige of dirt dug out with ruthless strokes of a straw broom and sent out the front door. With a bake oven built into the sides of the large fireplace, itself big enough to comfortably roast a small pig, and warming shelves built into the upper level, she had everything she needed for a kitchen. Shelves beside the fireplace held her dishes and pots. Water came from the pump outside. There was one table, rough-hewn and black with age, two benches and four little stools. The room was dominated by the barrels ranged along one wall, beer, soft cider, hard cider, and one small barrel of wine. This was not so much an inn as a village tavern, a place to eat a little and perhaps drink a great deal, but not a place intended to house travelers. Nevertheless, this round, brown little woman was equal to her unplanned task. They all settled on stools on the hearth, wanting to soak up as much heat as possible. She scurried up into the loft after serving them all hot bowls of peas porridge and warm buttered bread. While they ate, she lugged down a feather bed that preceded her and followed her on the ladder. She shoved the table to one side and piled the benches atop it, spread the feather bed on the floor, and added a couple of patchwork blankets identical to the ones she had supplied to the companions. Lan cradled his bowl in his lap, absorbing heat from it as he ate. He wasn't so much hungry now as just weary, and he basked in the heat like an old cat while he took slow bites of his bread, alternating with spoonfuls of pottage and sips of cider. When he finished the bowl, their hostess was at his elbow immediately. More? she asked, taking his bowl. He shook his head. Just sleep, he told her, handing her his cup as well. As the heat soaked into him, so did weariness. He stood up as she bustled over to the wall, filled a basin with water from a bucket, and began the washing up. He plodded the first few steps over to the feather bed, took the spot nearest the wall, wrapped one of the blankets around himself, and sank down into the mattress. For once, he didn't even dream of fire. The storm ended some time in the night, and finally the sun was not hidden behind a shroud of clouds when it rose. Paul roused them early and got them on the road with only a pause to wash up in the basin and eat a bit of bread and butter. Eleanor moved stiffly down the ladder from the loft, washed her hands and face, and remained standing while she ate. Are you saddle sore? Lan asked, feeling sorry for her in spite of the fact that he wished she hadn't come along. She made a face. Very, she said, looking and acting more like her old self. My legs hurt so much I don't even want to think about riding. But if you can do it, so can I. She looked so stubborn that he decided not to remind her that she could turn around and go back whenever she chose. She would be welcome in any village if she chose to give up, and the next herald or bard coming through could bring her back home when she was ready. Apparently she was not going to give up yet. Finish your breakfasts, 
Paul said shortly. We have a lot of distance to make up today. The door closed on his last word. He was impatient, the first time that Lan had ever seen him like that. I asked him if he wouldn't wait on getting some hot parish for ye, and he wouldn't have it, the plump innkeeper said worriedly, looking like a fretful sparrow. She was making up packets of bread and cheese, using the paper saved from yesterday to wrap them. Reckon he's saddling now. With that to warn him, Lan hastily finished his breakfast and put on his cloak, while Tuck helped the innkeeper get the feather bed back up into the loft. He went out into the brilliantly white world, squinting against the glare, and pushed his way through the snow, following Paul's track to the shed. You're done. Good, Paul said without looking around. We've got to get going. It'll be slow, pushing through until we get to where the storm ended or where the road crews have gotten. Right, was all Lan said. He picked up Kalira's saddle blanket, beat the snow out of it, and threw it over her back. Kalira was nose deep in her grain bucket, as were the other two, stuffing themselves with food that was much more concentrated nourishment than hay. It was a race to see whether the heralds would finish saddling before the companions finished eating, and in the end the companions waffled up the last grains, just as Paul pulled Saturon's girth tight. Tuck brought out the food packets and gave one each to Paul and Lan as they came around to the front with the companions. The innkeeper came with him, again a shapeless bundle in her frayed-edged brown wool cloak. They all mounted, and with a wince, Eleanor took her father's hand and mounted up behind him. Lady, thank you, Paul said, bending down and handing four road chits, the tokens used by traveling heralds, into her hand. A road chit entitled the innkeeper who got it to a remission of tax, a benefit more valuable than actual payment. I know that you were not at all prepared for overnight guests, and your hospitality and readiness to deal with us was truly, deeply appreciated. The innkeeper, who probably had not seen one road chit in her life, much less four, blushed modestly. Hey, now, was I supposed to turn you into the road again? "'Twas good of you to put up with sleeping on me floor and all.' Paul just smiled, reached down again and squeezed her hand. Then he and Saturon turned and began pushing through the snow, back to the road, with Tuck and Lan following. By mid-afternoon they came to the point where the new snow tapered off, and there was nothing much to contend with but a dusting that covered the older granulated stuff. Then they were able to pick up their pace again, pushing harder than they had the first day. But Paul stopped more often, too, once in mid-morning to let them eat their packets of food, once at noon for luncheon, and once again for another snack when they broke out of the snowfield. Each time Eleanor shifted positions on the pillion, and that seemed to help her. The next three days were identical, and as Eleanor grew more accustomed to day-long riding and the uncertain conditions of inns on the road, Lan gave up the idea that she was going to quit. At least for now, anyway. Maybe when she got to the fighting and saw what it was like, she might change her mind. The fourth day was special, and the reason why Paul was in such a hurry to make up the time lost. Healer Ilya... Eleanor's mother and Paul's wife was waiting for them at the inn where they would make their nightly stop. Paul's back was a study in tension. Saturon stretched his legs just a trifle more in each step, and his urgency communicated itself to the other two companions. Even Eleanor forgot her aches in anticipation of seeing her mother. For once, the reason for going south in the first place got pushed to the back of everyone's thoughts. The inn that they arrived at, well after darkness fell, could not have been more unlike their first stop. This was a huge place, three two-storied wings joined in the shape of a horseshoe with its own courtyard in the center. The stables formed the back side, and travelers entered the center court through a passage made in the center of the front wing. There were torches on either side of the passage and lanterns in the courtyard. Even at this late hour, people were coming and going. From the faint sound of music and the babble of voices, the inn was popular with the locals as well as travelers. Stable hands came to take the companions, asking their names and treating them just as they would be at the Collegium, which was to say like people and not like horses. 
Paul just gave Saturan a congratulatory pat and sent him on his way, following his stable hand without the latter even attempting to lead him with the reins. Saturan's told me about this place. We're going to be spoiled outrageously, Kalira told Lan with just a touch of greed. He laughed, relieved, and dismounted. She followed her sire, her attendant following her, with her ears up and a very light step on the cobblestones of the courtyard. With a thatched roof, stone walls, and shuttered windows, this inn looked as comfortable as a farmhouse, but built on a massive scale. A myriad of chimney pots poking up through the thatch promised warm and comfortable rooms. They were definitely expected. A servant met them before they even reached the door. Harold Paul, the young man said, a statement rather than a question. If you will all come with me, please. The servant led them past the common room filled with people eating and drinking, a bard entertaining at the far end beside a fireplace large enough to roast an entire ox. There wasn't an ox on the spit at the moment, only a boar, or rather, what was left of the boar. Most of him was either on plates or already inside patrons, and the mouth-watering aroma nearly drove Lan crazy. They had a bit of a distance to go, down a long corridor, then up a flight of stairs and around a corner. But the long walk was worth it. The servant ushered them into a warm and welcoming private parlor with more doors opening off of it. There was already a fire burning in the fireplace, a pitcher of drink and some food laid ready, and a woman in healer's greens rising from her seat by the fire so quickly she might have been stung. She flung herself into Paul's arms and Eleanor joined the embrace. Lan and Tuck exchanged an embarrassed glance and with one accord turned their attention to the fruit and bread on the table, turning their backs on the reunited family to give them at least the illusion of privacy. So far as Lan was concerned, a welcome interruption came before they finished picking over the light refreshments in the form of the arrival of dinner. Three servants arrived with trays. The remains of the snacks were whisked away. The family embrace broke up, and the table beside the fire quickly set up for a meal. Juicy slices of pork steamed on a heated platter, garnished with roasted onions and apples. A bowl of mashed turnips topped with butter and brown sugar, a loaf of hot bread, steaming peas, and a whole apple pie completed the repast, and Lan and Tuck had no hesitation in sitting right down and helping themselves. So, Ilya said, taking a seat between Paul and Eleanor, and meeting the eyes of each boy with a frank gaze. This is Lavin, and this is Tuck. I'm pleased to finally meet you, boys. Lan put his hand to his breast and gave her a little formal bow, which seemed to amuse her. Ilya was a stunning woman, although her effect was due as much to force of personality as to her looks. Her eyes were huge, dominating her face. Masses of dark brown hair surrounded it. She had thin lips, but Lan had the sense that when she wasn't worried, she smiled often and enthusiastically, as she was smiling now. A nose too long, perhaps, for beauty still suited her face and lent it strength. Never mind us, my lady, Tuck said after swallowing a huge mouthful of food. You just catch up with your family and pretend we aren't here. Right now, I'd rather have food than talking. That amused her as well. But she took him up on his advice and turned to her husband and daughter, exchanging tales of what had been going on with them while Lan and Tuck ate. Lan couldn't help noticing that while Paul and Eleanor, mostly Paul, Eleanor did more listening than talking, were full of gossip and stories about mutual acquaintances and friends, Ilya's tales concentrated on what life was like for a healer on the battlefield. Though she often couched her stories in such a way as to get a rueful chuckle at the end, the point of each was clear. Day-to-day -day life was full of hardship. Healers witnessed terrible things with virtually every passing candle mark, and the consequences of being captured were far worse than merely being hurt or killed by a stray arrow. So her mother doesn't want Eleanor to go to the front either, Lan thought. His interest piqued. Well, good.
He didn't much like what he heard, though, even given that Ilya might be exaggerating a trifle. Paul was right. The Karsites must have been planning this for the past couple of years. Valdemarin forces were only just keeping the enemy advanced to a crawl, but they were already into Valdemarin territory and showed no signs of stopping. Their fighters were well-trained, not unskilled or half-trained conscripts, and their officers were fanatics. That put a distinct chill up Lan's back. He had thought that he would be able to frighten the Karsites with a display of fire. Would he really have to actually hurt people? Or even kill them? No, I can't, he told himself firmly as a sick feeling rose in him. I can't do that. I'll find a way around it, or Paul will, or whoever is commanding the army. I can't hurt anyone. I've done too much of that already.